Good morning, dear colleagues. Good morning, dear colleagues. Today is December 12th and we are in our studio in St. Petersburg and this is 8.30 Russian time, Moscow and St. Petersburg time. And we announce our conference, the Organization of Surgical Care in COVID-19 pandemic to be open. And we're happy to give the floor to the Doctor of Medical Science, uh, Academician of Russian Academy of Sciences, Secretary General of Russian Society of Surgeons, Professor Fedorov. Please unmute yourself. Please unmute yourself. Good morning, dear colleagues. I'm extremely happy to welcome all of you here at such very interesting and a very relevant event. It is characterized not only by the very relevant title, but also a very significant international representation. <clears throat> this is the joint conference of Russian Society of Surgeons and AWRSC. This is long-standing friendship of two surgical communities and uh, we can just support it. I was asked to give the welcoming words the president of Russian Society of uh, Surgeons, Igor Zetivakhin, and also chief surgeon of Russian Federation, vice president of our society, Professor Revishvili, and this is my pleasure to do it. I would like to say a few words about the spectrum of issues that we are going to cover. <clears throat> Let me start from a very, very long story. Let me start from January, February 2020, when, uh, when uh, this pandemic actually was announced. We were discussing such exotic things what to do, what can happen next, what should be our plan, the strategy. For example, we discussed that we could refuse from laparoscopic and thoracic, uh, thoracic interventions because <clears throat> they are quite risky procedures. So we have been discussing that. We discussed um, different personal protection strategies for the surgeons and for the staff in the OR. We were discussing the need of hospitalizations of uh, infected patients, and also we're discussing boxes and uh, other things. Definitely we knew a lot for these nine months and w that was a very long journey, very long and very fruitful journey. So now let's see what are the learnings, what are the lessons we've taken from these nine, 10 months of tactics elements could be very important for us, especially under the COVID-19 pandemic. Thank you very much for your attention. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Andrei. And now we are happy to give the floor to the president uh, of uh, uh, the AWRSC and uh, the lead of Medical Research Center in Calcutta, Ramana Bala Subramanian. Dear the floor friends is and yours. colleagues from both India as well as the Russian Federation, I'm so delighted that we are seeing this day where surgeons on either side together representing nearly 2 billion people are trying to find ways of cooperating and working together in these difficult times. As we all know, COVID has taken a toll on our lifestyle, on our health, on the lives of our friends and sometimes near and dear and our patients. And it is only right that we try to pool our experiences and knowledge together and try to overcome it. I think the Indo-Russian partnership and friendship has a long way to go and we should encourage more interaction between our communities, especially involving the younger surgeons and trainees at all levels. I wish the conference all the very best and congratulate the organizers from both sides.
Thank you very much, Dr. Ramadan. Also, we would like to express gratitude for our sponsors for their very valuable support. Without them, this conference would not be possible. This is Hexa Company, the largest manufacturer of disposable medical products, the most important equipment in the year of pandemic. If a medical uh, developer of high quality equipment for mini invasive surgery, insufflators, irrigators, aspirators, and video cameras, and other products, for more than 16 years of working in the Russian market, FA Medica provided good quality and very high reliability of their products. Company has rep offices in many Russian cities and also very well uh, partnership affiliates. <clears throat> Techon, which is a part of Johnson & Johnson, this is more than 80 years of the world history and trust of surgeons and continuous desire to improve surgical treatment, improve outcomes, to improve the quality of life of our patients. Convatec, specialist supplier in all surgical branches, very well known in the market for more than 40 years, has 11 production sites and very big headcount, more than 8,000 headcount. The product of Convatect is supplied to more than 100 markets and definitely gets positive feedback from the users. Air Farm, this is one of the most reputable manufacturers of various medicines and drugs, which has become the most important component in the treatment, including oncological diseases in pandemic. Karl Storz, most important manufacturer in endoscopic surgical devices, so human medicine and veterinary medicine and industry and the scopes video system from Karl Storz. More than 70 years they associated with the tradition, high tech and best quality. Mirivara is a supplier in the high quality operating tablets, functional beds and many other irreplaceable products. Companies focus on the improvement on the surgical outcomes. The company that was established in 1901 and now this is legendary brand started from beds that improved sanitary conditions in the hospitals and that was a breakthrough solution. Merivara has huge experience in um, managing operational products and is ready to support at any stages started from the uh, INC up to the technical maintenance and other services. Medi headquarters which is in Germany is one of the leading world manufacturers of medical devices that facilitate the success of treatment of multiple diseases. So the topic of our first session would be discussion of the routine surgical care in COVID-19 pandemic. In this session, our experts will cover a very different options of organization and optimization of different types of elective surgeries. And we're happy to give the floor to first speaker, Dr. Natkishot Dukhipati from Hyderabad, resuming elective surgery in the time of COVID-19, a safe and comprehensive strategy. Dr. Natkisho, uh, the expert in the laparoscopic surgery, who is the lead of Left Life Clinic in Hyderabad. The floor is yours. You're welcome. Good morning. Zdrasuvistje. I'm Dr. Nandikishor, um, a bariatric surgeon from Hyderabad, India. Uh, very glad to be a part of this virtual conference organized by the Russian Society of Surgeons and AWRSC. Today, I'm going to be speaking on healthcare strategies in resuming elective surgery in the COVID era. Without further ado, I would start my presentation. Allow me to share my screen. So, resuming elective surgery during COVID-19, uh, a safe and comprehensive strategy. So, we're already, we're, most of us have already started doing these elective surgeries. So we're just reiterating and then probably fortifying with a little bit more information than what we had before. So first and foremost, uh, what we should do when we are starting our elective surgeries is that break down our local patient population into reasonable risk tiers based on the local patient and resource characteristics. So for example, if you're out working out of a very safe zone, then you have most of the patients are safe, uh, uh, safe to be operated upon as needed. Whereas if you're in a containment zone, definitely you'll have to take additional precautions to avoid any risk of uh, disease propagation among the healthcare staff and doctors. Secondly, when you're starting off, start with cases that are in the low risk group with rapid discharge from the inpatient setting so that the length of stay in the hospital is limited. Also consider lesser than average case volumes. Initially start with maybe 50% of the volume that you would do otherwise and gradually scale it up. And also suggest to your patients before the surgery 
to maintain at least maybe 10 days to two weeks of uh, a limited exposure to people, friends, family, so that their exposure to COVID-19 could be limited. Very important things to do prior to resuming elective surgeries that preoperative COVID testing as close as possible to surgery. We predominantly like to do one to two days before surgery. Consider whenever there is a confusion about diagnosis on a COVID-19 status of a patient, always consider doing an adjunctive preoperative high resolution chest CT scan to decide whether the patient is a candidate for surgery or not. Constant monitoring and analysis of real-time data will definitely help you uh, in managing the patient flow as well as you know, the safety profile of the patient population coming through your hospital. Outpatient-based post-operative care becomes a very important element because we are trying to limit the inpatient admission time and discharge them early post-operatively. And if any time should they require any IV hydration, et cetera, it can be done in a uh, separate setup like hydration clinics where such needs can be um, taken care of. Before you operate on a patient, please consider all patients are positive until proven otherwise. High resolution chest CT scan and RT-PCR for COVID-19 are a must. If the tests are negative, go ahead and operate. If the tests are positive, please wait until they recover from COVID-19, which takes typically about a month from the date of diagnosis for them to be negative. Another way of looking at it is prior to patient take, being taken up for planned surgery, you can perform PCR and antibody testing. When you perform these, there are several combinations are possible. One, PCR is negative, antibody is positive. That means the patient's already been exposed to COVID-19 before. Now they have immunity, but they're not an active disease process. So such patient, you may take up for surgery without any further issues. If the patient is PCR negative as well as antibody negative, that means they are negative for disease at the same time they were never exposed, they don't have any immunity, you can proceed with surgery, but you may, as an option, consider an exit uh, PCR test at the time of discharge. If the patient is PCR positive, then definitely they are in active infection, postpone surgery, and once they recover, then again they can be brought back and be planned for elective surgery. Something uh, very important to understand is the timeline of COVID-19 according to the lab results. Day zero, although the patient is infected, day zero to day five, the symptoms will gradually onset. Around day seven, IgM is positive, which continues to stay on till day 21. Around day 14, IgG becomes positive. Day one to day 28, the COVID, RNA, and antigens will be positive. Around day 21, IgM disappears. And day 28, even the COVID, RNA, and antigens also disappear. So if you look at the patient's symptomatology, day zero to day five, patient relatively will be asymptomatic. Day zero to day seven is where, which is a window period, where only PCR, RT, PCR is positive in this phase. And day 14 to day 21, it's a decline phase where patient is still infective. So it's best to avoid such a patient to be taken up for elective surgery. Day 21 to day 28 also is called convalescence phase where patient is completely better, improved, but still they can transmit disease to others. So please wait at least one month uh, from the date of diagnosis of COVID-19 to take a patient up for elective surgery. Another important element is taking appropriate consent for undergoing treatment during the COVID-19 pandemic. You, we all have existing uh, consent forms in our respective nations. At the same time, it's important to include a couple of um, additional statements in such a consent form, which suggests that, that the patient is knowingly and willingly giving consent to have treatment, surgery, or investigation. And they have been adequately informed that they're opting for treatment, surgery, or investigation in the midst of an ongoing outbreak of COVID-19 pandemic. And they're also explained that the risks, about the risks and side effects of COVID-19 infection and all the precautions that are being taken up by the hospital and the doctors and the staff. So these uh, two statements should be incorporated into 
the consent forms, which would avoid any future legal uh, issues from the patients to the hospitals and the doctors. I can't think of a better elective surgery than a bariatric surgery. So when it comes to bariatric surgeries, ASMBS recommends that in the era of COVID-19, so the patients, the obese patients may be safer through surgery and may in fact be better able to fight COVID-19 infection post bariatric surgery induced weight loss. So that means the patients will do better after their weight loss, even though they get affected with COVID-19. So at the same time, there's a lot of coverage in the media about the relationship between COVID-19 and obesity. In New York, largest US study of COVID-19 finds obesity as a single biggest chronic factor in New York City's uh, hospitalizations. And obesity and male sex, male gender are risk factors, independent risk factors for COVID-2 uh, related mechanical ventilation uh, besides diabetes and hypertension. Same thing, higher pre prevalence of respiratory uh, conditions requiring ventilation in obese population. This is all the very close relationship between obesity and COVID-19. So when a person is obese, they do not so well when they get infected with COVID-19 and require ICU admission and mechanical ventilation. So before the patient enters your theater, now that you have taken the patient up and uh, you're you know, about to perform the surgery, before the patient enters your theater, there are a few things that you need to do. Your team should prepare all the essential medications, consumables required for surgery and keep them in the theater and all non-essential equipment, medications, everything should be taken away from the theater. All the high touch, constantly touched upon surfaces should be covered with plastic so that they can be cleaned easily. A telephone inside and having a circulator outside the theater is always useful. So because any emergency requirement, one, uh, the team inside can call out and the person outside can bring in whatever additional material that is required. And having the high efficiency health and moisture exchange filters uh, on the patient's end is always helpful. Having separate area for doffing and donning of your PPE kits is definitely useful. So when it comes to laparoscopic surgery, it, there's no uh, reason to not offer laparoscopic surgery in the COVID-19 era. Only thing is certain precautions to be taken, mainly to do with the carbon dioxide that is being evacuated from the patient. So we have to take measures to evacuate CO2 gas safely from the patient. You know, uh, obtaining pneumoperitoneum in a closed technique, like using an OptiView trocar is avoidable, is, is advisable. And uh, avoiding leak of CO2 uh, through the trocars um, and making smaller incisions so that the gas is not leaking around the trocars. And one trocar should be connected to the gas evacuating tubing through a filter which can evacuate the CO2 safely. Uh, desufflation should be done once the incoming gas is turned off and the specimen should be extracted once the peritoneal cavity is completely desufflated. These are the, some of the safety measures you can follow. When it comes to Indian way of doing things, uh, what we like to do, some of us, uh, is that connect a five millimeter trocar to a ICD intercostal drain uh, bag, which is filled with a 100 to 200 ml of uh, hypochlorite solution, one or 2%, through which the gas is then circulated. And the same ICD bag is then connected to a suction. So the gas is evacuated through the 5 mm trocar into the ICD bag under the hypochlorite solution, and then captured into a suction uh, machine and evacuated from the theater. So you can try that, or there are many uh, machines and equipment that is available today for uh, evacuation of the smoke, uh, surgical smoke that is, at the same time, uh, negative pressure in the theater can also help in evacuating such gases and smoke. So one important thing to notice is that this is a study published by the uh, Cardiff University uh, wherein there is not enough evidence to qualify or to quantify the risks of COVID-19 transmission in surgical smoke. However, steps can be undertaken to manage the potential hazards. The advantages of minimally invasive surgery may not need to be sacrificed in the current crisis. So basically, what it says is that there is no not enough evidence that surgical smoke can actually infect people. And so we can proceed ahead with laparoscopic surgeries, but due diligence should be always followed. 
once the surgery is completed, any material that is to be sent outside, the specimens, etc., should be handled once you remove uh, the outer gloves. Naturally, all the doctors would be double gloving. Uh, close the theater for about 30 minutes for adequate cleaning and uh, uh, proper air exchange. All equipment should be cleaned and kept in a separate label bag and sent to central sterilization. Anesthesia, breathing circuit, and soda lime canister shall be changed and safely disposed after each use and plastic covers on surfaces removed and the surface wiped down with sanitizer. These are the basic care and attention to be taken after each surgery before you take on the next patient. When it comes to intensive care unit and recovery units, uh, preferably no entry to any relatives. All the staff should wear full PPE as much as possible. Barrier nursing techniques should be followed. Biomedical waste should be disposed with care. And any aerosol generating procedures should be minimized in the theater, in the ICUs, and the rehab uh, in the recovery areas. Um, also, using special equipment to reduce aerosolization is advisable. Wherever the ventilation is required for patients, a separate ICU with ventilators is advisable. When it comes to vaccination, there are a bunch of vac vaccines that are showing promise. There are upcoming um, vaccines. There are many are there. Today, we have Sputnik V had shown about interim efficacy of 91%. We have Pfizer with 95%, Moderna with 94.5%, and Oxford AstraZeneca with 70%. Some of these are mRNA-based um, vaccinations, and uh, Pfizer, even after vaccination, it takes about 28 to 30 days for a patient to acquire adequate immunity against corona. So knowing all these facts and knowing that we are pretty much the last barrier that is there to protect people. So, and there's always a question about second wave of COVID. So let's brace ourselves. And I thank you all for this opportunity. Thank you very much. Nand Kishore, well, you are very positive, although your topic is very specific. And again, on behalf of the Russian Society of Surgeons, we would like to thank our Indian partners for the first Russian-Indian project, which is devoted to such a relevant topic and for the multiple interesting presentations. And we do hope we will have very long-term and very successful cooperation. And uh, our next speaker is uh, Rafael Shavailov, who is the chief doctor of the Kazan Hospital from Tatarstan, specificity of providing uh, surgical care in the multi-profile hospital uh, in pandemic. The floor is yours. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, dear friends, dear colleagues. I am extremely happy to see all of you, my friends. I am extremely grateful for the invitation. Unfortunately, a colleague of mine, who is the chief doctor of um, our clinical hospital, due to particular reasons, cannot be in the part of our conference, and I will speak on his behalf. My name is Dmitry Klasilnikov. I am the lead of um, surgical department of our Republic level comprehensive um, clinical center in Kazan, in Tatarstan. I am the lead of the surgical chair. This is the largest chair. Uh, in the leading medical university, which is again located in our Republic Clinical Hospital. And I'm happy to see uh, all of our Indian colleagues and friends, um, and possibly they are aware that in the Russian Federation, the biggest number of uh, Indian students study in Kazan, in Republic of Tatarstan. Now, coming back to my presentation, my task um, is to cover how we provide a surgical intervention in the comprehensive center during COVID-19 pandemic. Well, this is not an easy task, but first of all, I would like to say what uh, our clinic hospital is about. So in fact, we are the largest medical clinic in the Republic and due to many circumstances, we provide daily 24 by 7, 24 by 7 surgical care, both emergency and elective surgeries, not only to the residents of our entity, Tatarstan Republic, but also from other entities from the neighboring regions who are 
referred to us uh, by sanitary aviation, by sanitary transport, sometimes by ambulance from neighboring regions as well. So multiple patients uh, self arrive. From the slide we are showing here, we have about 300 referrals a day. We have about 140 hospitalizations a day and 54% of our surgeries are emergency surgeries. We are doing liver transplantations and last year we performed 13 liver transplantations and this year, regardless of COVID infections, we carried out 18 liver transplantations. So yesterday we performed uh, liver transplantation number 18 for this year. Also we transplant kidneys. In our Republic Clinical Hospital, we have 15 chairs um, of Kazan State Medical University and Kazan State Medical Academy and Kazan Federal University, because probably you are aware that um, in the Federal University, actually, where Kazan Medical School came from, Medical University, so currently there is dedicated additional medical faculty there. So we are working very actively. But due to the COVID infection, we had to do some reallocation, many serious changes in order to provide care at the highest possible level. So at this slide, you can see a schematic representation of our Republic Clinical Hospital. This is medical town, medical town. Here at the bottom, at the back, you see pediatric uh, clinical hospital. So this is our main building, Republic Clinical Hospital. The draft of this building probably is very well known to our Russian audience because um, this is draft of the building of 1960s and actually this clinic uh, was planned for 1500 beds when we started working and I'm working in this clinic since 1982 oh my god difficult to imagine so we have four main blocks first second third and fourth so this is our biggest achievement and this is most important element that plays a big role in the providing surgical care, not only elective but also emergency care. This is our emergency room. And here I will tell you, here we have all essential structures and they create options for early diagnosis, timely diagnosis, and later we created buffer zone here, so-called buffer zone, almost uh, restricted areas that go directly to the first floor of block one and two. And later on, I will show you in detail. So here is uh, the emergency care. So this is hospitalization of elective. So patients, elective patients. So this is temporary infectious hospital. So this is the building, this is trauma center. So, and we reallocated our facilities in coronavirus infection. So that was in the first wave and now in the second wave, we prepared 200 beds, 250 beds here. So this is temporary infectious clinic. Then outpatients, outpatients, about 1000 visits a day, 1000 appointments each day and running ahead, I can tell you about the order of hospitalization of elective patients. All elective patients, they come to the outpatients, to the consultative department, to the surgeons, they work in three shifts. So any patient, any patient, even the one who lives in a very remote area of Tatarstan Republic, is able to come and is able to be appointed. Then there is examination. And here we have, again, all available instrumentarium for proper diagnosis. Then uh, after the diagnosis, and um, if we identify um, the need of the senior consultation or the employee of a chair, which is located here, so we carry these consultations in the outpatient facilities. It could be concilium, it could be decision about the elective surgery and later on patient is referred um, to the emergency. So patients are moving here, they are tested for COVID. So within three, six hours getting the response and then all that is referred uh, to the outpatients. So this is ER 
So if this is a local resident, so they go home overnight and, and then um, uh, they come next day and then hospitalized um, into particular department, department one, department two, surgery one, surgery two, and uh, they're coming here for elective surgeries. What's uh, uh, about emergency surgery? I will tell you, because um, this is already second wave of COVID infection. So we have new order in the Ministry of Health of the Tatarstan Republic. Um, so the same actually we had back in March, April. So the main players here, are the hospital and so the temporary infectious hospital for two beds. Also, we have um, a Republic level perinatal center. So here it is. Here we admit pregnant uh, patients um, from even neighboring regions. So 239 beds. But uh, the COVID infection could be seen also among pregnant. Um, we have also Consultative Center and Republic Center of uh, Catastrophe Medicine. So they're responsible for sanitary aviation as well. Also, besides, we have telecenter for teleconsultations and telemedicine. So we have daily consultations for the doctors um, in the areas of Tatarstan, for patients management, and to resolve the issue about the further referral of the patients to our hospital by specially sanitary aviation. So this is the scheme. Uh, this is the scheme of our admission department. So patients are um, delivered by sanitary aviation. Uh, so they're coming here. This is multidisciplinary team. They are waiting for the patients. So we have two examination rooms for mild patients, for moderate patients. But if patient has more severe changes, let's say patient is not stable, severe patients, loss of blood pressure, drop of blood pressure, then we have um, local ICU where we can try to stabilize the patients and then uh, all the diagnostic steps. You can see that um, we have a CT department here. Then we have clinical lab, local lab. We have um, ultrasound. We have X-ray available. So that means uh, any type of X-ray, contrast, etc. Endoscopic, endoscopic rooms, and also we have OR, OR two tables, two tables here. So all patients uh, who are coming for emergency surgery, and the ones where the PCR is not checked whether they're infected or not, they are confined in this area. And I will show you our patient flow later. So we have NGO here. So that means uh, we have three shifts. NGO is working 24 by 7. So we have two machines. All that um, allows uh, to do stenting, coronarography, etc. MRI is also available. So this is actually the same skin. And here you see the patient flow how patients are administered and then moved uh, to specific surgical departments. But uh, while patients uh, are not confirmed for COVID, positive or negative, patients are coming to main building, block one and block two, the ones that I showed on the map. In the first block, before COVID infection, we used to have dedicated surgical center, but um, we had to establish the red zone, the confined area, including um, emergency and admission departments. So here now we have not only surgery, because there could be any patients here, could be gynecological patients, let's say who need um, emergency care. They're waiting for the response. Uh, so they pass PCR tests and they're waiting for the response for the test results. Pre-COVID uh, here, we use uh, cardio ICU here, but now this is just ICU. 
for all those patients uh, who are administered in the emergency surgery. So all in all, it appears to be that we have 42 beds and uh, there are two uh, uh, and 12 ICU beds. When we get the results of the primary examination and it is became clear that, for example, patient is not infected, then patients is transferred to the specific surgical department. If patient is positive, then the patient is referred to the dedicated COVID hospital. All that has underground trespasses, trespasses so not difficult to transfer patient there, underground trespasses. And uh, you understand that our temporary COVID hospital is uh, on the facility of trauma center. They have three ICU and they have more than enough facilities to provide proper care. Besides surgeons from our departments, for example, if we made surgery here at the very beginning in ICU, for example, if it's emergency situation, then they put on PPEs, they come, they consult, they examine the patient in the temporary COVID hospital, and we have no problems with that. And I have to say here that um, for the whole period, period that uh, we are working since the start of pandemia, for these eight, nine months, we have to say that totally 10,000 patients, 10,000 patients got emergency care in our hospital, 10,000 cases. So totally 675 with acute pathologies and 337 elective. So all these surgeries were performed in the emergency rooms, right in the emergency rooms where there was no need when we got the response, without waiting, we performed emergency surgery. And uh, on the slide, you can easily see here that uh, more than 50%, this is acute um, appendicitis, hernias, um, diagnostic laparoscopies, and in half of the cases, there was conversion, resection of small intestine. So they were patients after uh, road accidents, uh, traumas, so the establishing of this emergency room ER that is available now is very helpful because we have federal road M7. So a lot, a lot of uh, road accidents. That is why our management uh, was supported by Republic government and uh, I got uh, a grant, presidential grant, 800 million Russian rubles to make refurbishing of the surgical departments to create new ICUs. And later in 2012, like all Russian people know, in Kazan in 2013, we had um, athletic competition, Universiate. So there was very big tranche of money. So complete reconstruction of the hospitals. But unfortunately, we reduced the number of beds like everywhere. So in each block, we used to have up to 40 beds, but now 25 beds. Number of beds is reduced. This is optimization of healthcare, which is going on in Russia for the last few years. But the most important, we have very good ER where we can provide care, surgical care at the highest possible level not taking risk that it can be infected by COVID and to do it at a very high level. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Dmitry, for your presentation. And we have one question to ask. You will see it on the screen now. Did you have cases of PCR negative, but later on, manifestation of clinical manifestation of COVID-19 developed, they became PCR possible. And if yes, um, what was the tactics of management? Well, this is not a secret. This is not a secret. 
if we come to the general statistics, I can tell you that from this number of patients that were hospitalized for the emergency surgery, 81 patients were PCR positive immediately in the ER, 81 positive. But regardless, still, we, had, we made surgeries and then we transferred them in the temporary infectious facility. Quite recently, quite recently, yes, I had this situation. That was elective patient with negative PCR, absolutely negative tests, multiple tests. I performed reconstructive surgery, massive reconstructive surgery, and they, on day five, patient demonstrated manifestation, clinical manifestation of COVID-19 and uh, COVID pneumonia, grade three. But luckily, we managed to save this patient. What would be the tactics? Well, definitely we close the facility uh, to be locked down, uh, then uh, sanification, and the patient is transferred to the temporary infectious facility. I think this is common tactics. Common tactics. If you identify the case, you close down, you disinfect, um, but all those who were in contact um, had to be two weeks on lockdown in quarantine. Well, thank you very much. And the next presentation would be made by Dr. Rajesh Pujami, the specialist in robotic surgery in the Fortis Hospital, adaptation to new normal surgery and COVID-19 during the transition phase. Ramesh, the floor is yours. Respected chairpersons and fellow delegates from India as well as Russia. I am Dr. Ramesh Punjani from Mumbai, India. I'm going to speak on adapting to new normal surgery and COVID-19 during transition phase. I must thank the organizers, the scientific team, Dr. Pramod Shinde and Dr. Jignesh Gandhi to give me an opportunity to speak in this historic event. And it is truly a historic event where the two great countries are going to talk on the pandemic, that to all the surgeons of both the countries. I have no conflicts of interest. The COVID-19 is a pandemic which has been described as a black swan it is the most clamorous, catastrophic, and redefining eon of our lifetime. It's more disastrous compared to a Spanish flu, which almost occurred 200 years ago. It's a rare and unexpected event of large magnitude, whose consequences will likely to be have a major role in history. Now, it has affected all the sectors of life, but the health sector is especially affected in this pandemic because the very people which are required to treat patients are at high risk of infection themselves and are irreplaceable because of their unique skills. And every doctor getting sick will deprive thousands of patients for their illnesses. It's very important that we maintain them. Now in March, 2020, as the COVID-19 struck, struck in India, the doctors were in a tremendous stress. Uh, they were facing the dreaded disease whose pathology, course of disease treatment, and complications were unknown. So it was an unknown enemy. And the absence of vaccines and effective pharmaceutical treatment, the hospitals have struggled to reorganize their processes and procedures. But yet, let me tell you, the medical fraternity has fought bravely, showing incredible dedication and a great leadership. The surgical departments were put to the acid test. They had to work with colleagues in COVID ward because all the surgical people had to give a hand to the medical ward to overcome this crisis. And though elective surgeries continued, uh, did, uh, had stopped, but the emergent and semi-emergent surgery continued. There was an inadequate supply of PPEs was an, another challenge to the medical fraternity. The fear of carrying virus back home to the loved ones was causing a psychological stress. And sadly, we lost few lives and many doctors got infected. Every pandemic passes through three phases. One is an emergency phase where there is an initial wave the outbreak of unprepared health infrastructure and that is a maximum mortality. The second is a transition phase where number of infected patients decreases as a result of social restrictions. Fortunately, the India seems to have entered the transition phase. And a full recovery phase, which is questionable when and how it will occur in COVID-19. Uh, this is the diagram depicting the uh, three phases of the pandemic and right now we are into a transition phase. Now, surgery in pandemic, in emergency cases, all emergent and semi-urgent cases were operated, but all the elective cases were ignored, and that is there is a huge backlog. And therefore, in transition phase, all the surgical department must resume elective surgery soon. But this will have to be done gradually 
for the safety of patients and the surgical team. A new normal will have to be established in place of an old normal. The transition phase is actually a phase of resilience, which is an ability to recover from setbacks, adopt well to change and keep going. And resilience is of surgical department will save many lives. The health structure in India is very peculiar. The private healthcare it constitutes almost 60% of total beds and 80% of total doctors. And they provide most of the secondary and tertiary medical care. And it must get geared up for this crisis. The hospitals in a transition phase, the existing infrastructure will have to be modified. It is being modified at many places because COVID is here to stay at least for some time. Creation of isolation facilities is a must in every hospital. Separate areas have to be created for triage and swap collection and a screening of all patients and visitor staff so the arrangements need to be made and a social distancing inside the premises. The hospital in transition phase through frequent cleaning of all the exposed surfaces and equipments by the disinfectants, ample supply of masks, PPEs and hand sanitizer at all points. A special processes in housekeeping, laundry, food services and CSSD so as to minimize the infection. Biomedical waste management has to be done very efficiently. And UV sanitation and robot of, uh, robots for transportation are the added tool to increase the efficiency. Every hospital will have to be digitalized. A teleconsultation has to be available. A teletriaging has to be done. A digital communication with all patients to avoid the contacts. A data analytics for decision making. And a robust cyber security uh, defenses should be available for digitalization. And a digital savvy healthcare workforce will be required. The surgical plan is that all emergency surgical work which was there earlier continuing must continue. And one can do a quick antigen test to find out the positivity and of course treat this patient as a positive, wear full PP and do it in a COVID theatre, which are low pressure operation theatres. All elective cases must start now, clearing huge backlog. Therefore, all semi-emergent and elective cases, they must be tested shortly before surgery to detect the possible infection. And if they are found positive, they should be shifted to the COVID OTs for the surgeries, if it is an emergency surgery. A few precautions are to be taken. The ethical implication of operating in this COVID crisis must be discussed with the patient at length. And one has to take an informed consent in case the patient turns out to be positive while in the hospital, he should be aware of it. The new normal, for, we'll discuss now a new normal for surgical OPD, for ward activities and for operation theatres. Now for the surgical OPD, the appointment should be spaced out. The frequent use of mobile apps, only one accompanying person allowed after thermal screening Everybody must wear a mask while in hospital premises. The appropriate PPE is at designated places and pathways should be designated for social distancing in a waiting area. As long as the surgical wards are concerned, the regular use of PPE will guarantee a high safety standards. A physical separation between COVID-19 positive and negative patients is of course very crucial and must be done. The backup room should be available in case anybody turns out to be positive while in the hospital and frequent monitoring of the patients to pick up an early uh, infection in these patients who were, who were initially negative. <coughs> there is a single identified person as an attendant comes with the patient and he goes with the patient. No further visitors should be allowed. However, in a dramatic lack of contact between patient and families during emergency phase must be addressed by telecommunication. And bad bound patient get depressed because there is no contact with the family, visual contact with the family members and one must we must supply them the tablets so that they can have a visual contact with the family members as long as operation theaters are concerned one should have a dedicated ot for a covid positive patient preferably two the one for the obstetric work and the other for the risk trial cases and the location of this covid should be near the covid icu and away from non covid theaters preferably they should have a negative pressure inside to avoid contamination and proper disposal of biomedical waste is mandatory. The non-COVID theatres, that there should be a, some structural uh, modification. The independent changing room with toilets and shower facilities should be there for doctors, nurses and support staff. There should be a provision for opening the doors with feet or elbow without touching the handles. The uh, air handling unit must have 15 to 20 air exchanges per hour. The exhaust air to be released 3 meters above the top of the building from the operation theatres. And scavenging of air from anesthesia unit through the 1% hypochlorite solution will decrease the aerosolization inside the theater. 
the as long as the functions of theaters are concerned, the adequate supply of PPEs and masks, there should be a separate donning and doffing area with supervision, especially for doffing, a minimum personnel in the theater, a disinfection with UV lights in between the cases, and disposable tubings and instruments as long as possible. The anesthesia has to be regional whenever possible. A care should be done if the tracheal intubation is required. The suctioning and non-invasive ventilation has to be done with the proper PPEs and um, with due care. The intubation box and video laryngoscope should be used very frequently in case it is required. The insufflation of tracheal cough must be done before ventilation. So all this is to minimize the aerosolization and infecting the healthcare workers. The frequent use of HMEA filters in the anesthesia circuit is again an added thing. Now, as long as laparoscopic surgery goes, a spread of virus through CO2 release is questionable, but yet one can take a care. There should be a tight ports without any leakage. The control CO2 release through the filters or they must be made to run through 1% hypochlorite solution. A minimum use of electrosurgical devices because surgical plugs also are known to uh, carry the virus. So therefore, they also must run through 1% hypochlorite solution. Thank you so much. And I extend uh, uh, this um, particular invitation to all the... Thank you very much, Ramesh. So a lot of technical details, which is very important. And the next presentation will be presented by uh, the team uh, led by Dr. Kurganov. Surgical interventions during COVID-19, the world experience. And our speaker is Professor Bogdanov. Good afternoon, distinguished colleagues. Today, in my short report, me and my colleagues, we wanted to provide the world experience um, that is covering the feasibility of surgeries um, in the time of COVID-19. Please unmute. Can you hear me now? Yes, confirm, positive. Thank you very much. I do apologize. So the problem is very relevant and probably there is no need to think how important surgeries are, especially in COVID-19. I think it's excessive. So currently we face this challenge and this issue daily and in all the countries. And the relevance here is confirmed by statistical data. And it's changing not daily, I think it changes hourly. So greatest uh, sadness in our healthcare system, not only in the Russian Federation, but probably in many other countries um, where there was massive infectioning um, by this viral infection. So there is a, a rupture of the sequence, uh, consecutive uh, steps of providing care. So this uh, sequence was ruptured, including surgical sequence. And to greatest um, sadness, um, very rigid statistics showing that by now, we faced such a problem that due to the uh, in incidence and prevalence, uh, we see that uh, actually majority of surgeries, uh, cancelled surgeries, more than 70%. And in many publications, they say that in order to minimize this cancellation rate could be done if we spent about 45 weeks, only then we can catch up because we canceled many surgeries. In the modern literature, in terms of COVID-19, there are several topics actively discussed. And the first one is a selection patient um, to perform the elective surgeries. And actually, first they discuss whether it's feasible or not. Then the second question, which is actively discussed, this is um, surgical treatment of oncology patients. Another quite disputable and hot discussion is feasibility and safety of endoscopy and, and video surgeries. And generally discussed, last but not least, this is organization of the surgical care, how surgical department should be reorganized and how the resources should be reallocated. At the same time, the greatest sadness statistics shows us that uh, the cessation of elective surgeries 
will lead definitely the exacerbation of the chronic diseases of the patients. So there would be more and more chronic patients, and then there would be increased rate of emergency surgeries as a result if elective was not done properly. On the other hand, that patient who had surgical intervention in COVID-19, well, statistically, in 75% of the cases, uh, they develop more severe complications of coronavirus infections if they were operated. Well, many specialists are related not to the type of viral infection, but uh, with the uh, surgical stress that patient is passing through during the surgery itself. Speaking about the patient selection for the elective surgeries under COVID-19, we have to say that all the specialists surely point out the need to refuse patients visiting the hospitals for extra examination, for extra tests, for extra consultations, nothing extra. What is the most important is the outpatient examination and then full-fledged home care. Besides, it is quite reasonable that uh, it can lead to some delay, delay in providing surgical care and correspondingly reduced quality of uh, the results. At the same time, patients have serious risks in terms of uh, surgery. If surgery is not performed, then It is not just a risk for the patient's health, but also there are more doubts um, about their uh, full-fledged functioning. So, this challenge of patient selection for the elective surgeries is really a challenging task. How to select, who to select, and there are multiple factors uh, that were shown on the slide, and we have to take into consideration all these factors and somehow put them together. The second important thing, which is also discussed in the literature, is the surgical treatment of oncological patients. And in the providing of oncology care under COVID-19, the specialists are mentioning that fact that they faced potential lack of uh, beds for this category of patients. And also um, mechanical ventilators. So, and the severity of their disease uh, requires uh, proper machines. Uh, uh, so, and the treatment of surgical uh, as, uh, patients and the planning of this treatment, we should also uh, comply with the measures I have already mentioned. Uh, and so, in this case, uh, tele, uh, medical consul uh, consultation might be of great help. And when it comes to the emergency situations, the surgical interventions should be uh, performed uh, 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 on an immediate basis. Uh, so, uh, when uh, we do, uh, uh, do not use non-surgical uh, 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 interventions and, uh, well, and the, the postponement of any surgical intervention might uh, impact uh, the survival rate. Uh, uh, so, in such case, uh, uh, when treating such patients, we should prevent any exposure to the aerosol, um, especially in the uh, uh, operating room, in operating theatre. At the same time, uh, the uh, performance of uh, the surgeries, even in uh, pandemic settings, it leads uh, uh, to greater chances for survival, and uh, the operations on such uh, patients should be performed irrespective of the epidemiological situation. Speaking about the potential and safety of endoscopic uh, operations, uh, uh, let's say during uh, COVID-19 pandemic, uh, it should be pointed out that the, at the start of the pandemic, we faced the situation when endoscopy approach and the technologies of performing such interventions uh, so was questionable. Uh, due to a high risk of uh, aerosol uh, production uh, when uh, using energy supply devices. So today the statistics uh, uh, shows that the patients uh, uh, who are candidates for endoscopic interventions or laparoscopic interventions 
should be properly examined, but also tested for COVID-19. And in case of a positive result, so and so such operation can be performed, postponed, if it's an elective one, of course. And the specials uh, use uh, uh, recommend to use uh, uh, separate operating th theaters and decrease uh, the use of energy supply devices in the course of operation. Uh, in other words, uh, minimize using electrocoagulation, uh, ultrasound uh, uh, machines uh, for the purpose of hemostasis or uh, desiccation. Uh, so, in the operating field. Uh, so we uh, uh, recommend to use uh, traditional surgical techniques. Uh, so it should be also uh, underpinned uh, that we make an emphasis uh, on the pressure of the insufflated gas during surgery should be maintained at a minimum level. And in the OOTs, we should use filters for the exfiltration of gases and it should be performed through the filtering system on a mandatory basis. Apart from this, uh, an, an emphasis is made on the use of specialized uh, systems uh, for uh, catching uh, the smoke and fumes, especially when it comes to biological aerosols uh, during operation. Uh, so some believe that the minimum uh, pressure uh, should be uh, used in the during this procedure. At the same time, it is recommended uh, for the surgeons um, conducting these uh, uh, interventions to use the technique of pneumoperitoneum, uh, the one that he's familiar with. Uh, so when it comes to the use of this kind of manipulation, at the same time, we have come across such uh, recommendations like uh, uh, prevention of the use of bilateral encephalitis to prevent the colonization uh, of the equipment with the causative agent um, and, uh, and also use uh, decrease the volume uh, of the surgical smoke. Uh, uh, statistically, uh, this is the type of uh, uh, trend uh, which uh, was predominant uh, at the start of the pandemic when we had to give up the endoscopic operations uh, and now uh, uh, provided we stick to these uh, uh, recommendations uh, we can uh, now perform these interventions no matter what speaking uh, about the organization and duration of the surgeries it should be also pointed out that uh, uh, practically all professionals speak about the strict uh, uh, the, uh, uh, zonality of such operations. Uh, so the equipment should be placed in the operating room, uh, so we should use uh, negative pressure and uh, such zones should be located uh, uh, at a distance uh, from uh, the places where active uh, uh, movement of the personnel takes place. Uh, so and the patient within the uh, operating department uh, should uh, move from one place to another uh, just according to the shortest route um, and they should certainly wear surgical masks one more recommendation uh, uh, and our colleagues recommend in the literature it's uh, <coughs> making all the list of uh, the healthcare workers who are involved in uh, the operation of specific patients in order to keep an eye on their own health. And it should be also <clears throat> uh, emphasized that organization of the surgical department and uh, operating theater. <clears throat> uh, so uh, it's the uh, movement of the infected patients with the positive uh, t test findings. Uh, so there must be a mandatory subdivision into phases, four phases pre-op phase, a transportation phase, then uh, surgery per se, and the post-op uh, transportation phase. For each of these phases, as you can see, there are certain recommendations in support of those. So uh, we can state 
today uh, that uh, the analysis uh, or the experience gained uh, uh, and these recommendations that were worked out by specialists, they have been discussed uh, in the literature sources. Uh, they are not only useful and they make it possible to optimize the surgeries, but also, they also provide for the safety of uh, uh, surgeries uh, in patients uh, and uh, equally uh, for the sake of safety for the attending personnel uh, and also the quality of interventions. That's all there is to it. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Dmitry Yurievich. Uh, so it would be interesting uh, to find out what are the expenses behind this. Uh, so time-wise, uh, uh, what about the positive PCR? What is the duration of it? You know, uh, there are different uh, uh, data on uh, uh, so uh, 90 days as uh, mentioned in the literature uh, so there could be certain fragments uh, of a still viable virus but the uh, viral uh, uh, I mean viable uh, uh, virus may uh, uh, last from uh, five to ten days uh, so thank you uh, very interesting. The next, uh, Dr. Rajesh uh, from Srivastava, uh, Gujarat. Uh, so, COVID-19, uh, time night. of crisis, and also surgical changes and uh, uh, room for optimism. So, the Good floor morning. is yours, sir. At the outset, let me thank AWR Surgeons Community and Russian Surgeon Society for giving me this opportunity to speak in this historical Indo-Russian conference. The topic I have been given is COVID, a time of crisis, but also for surgical challenges, opportunities, and optimism. Novel coronavirus has rapidly swept across the world. We surgeons need to define ourselves that if we want to be in comfort zone or growth zone. The epidemic of COVID-19 has presented as a grim and complex situation, causing great impact on economy and society and seriously interfering with ordinary medical practices. It has created many challenges, but also forced us to re-examine how to provide more patient-centered high-quality care. It has changed how we deliver care, which also allows for re-evaluation and improvement of common practices. The message is clear, stay home, be safe. But there are many whom the country now need more than ever, including we healthcare professionals. The challenge is how do we keep them attending to patients rather than becoming patients and carriers of the disease? Clinicians need to take care of patients' health as well as their own health because the disease don't differentiate between a clinician and a patient. This is an interesting slide by Wedling Wang and we surgeons need to be very careful to get exposed by these body fluids. Some body fluids like bronchoalveolar lavage fluids can have 93% positive viral loads. And you can see these are the fluids which we surgeons come in contact in day out and day in situation. Surgery involves many short procedures which involve aerosol production. And it's a true challenge to remain safe in spite of the exposures. Procedures like suctioning, intubation, dithermy uses, CO2 insufflation, desufflation, spillage, as well as CPR. Now, patient screening, again a challenge. The armamentarium we have are structured questionnaire with temperature monitoring, viral real-time polymerase chain reaction, that is RT-PCR or rapid antigen test, routine blood investigations, inflammatory markers, chest imaging, including HRCT. The issue in India is RT-PCR is not easily available, especially for asymptomatic cases. And there is a high control by a government on its testing. Even HRCT and advanced inflammatory markers are not easily accessible in rural India. And as well as not all surgical patients are screened by all possible modalities. 
The next challenge is environmental sanitization. It has become Electromedical equipment must be disinfected with alcohol or chloro derived solution. The next challenge is waste disposal. Although it was essential even before COVID era, but it has become mandatory in COVID era. We need to use dedicated containers. Containers should be closed and sealed before being transferred to the collection point and sharp should be segregated and that is a must. The next in the list is linen management. All linen should be handled wearing PPE during collection and they should not be placed on surfaces or floors, but directly inside the dedicated containers. They should sealed and immediately sent for cleaning and sterilization. Disposable materials should be used as far as possible as said earlier. Now, unless one will wear hazmat suit, he will not understand how discomfortable they are. The challenge is for a long surgery. Surgeons usually feel breathing difficulty, profuse sweating, goggles fogging up, operative discomfort, lack of concentration and what not. COVID-19 has led to a dramatic reduction in the numbers of patients seeking care. This is especially true of planned non-urgent problems, including procedures and surgeries. While this has caused collateral damage, with the condition of some patient worsening or taking an unfortunate turn, we all have operated worst of our gallbladder appendix or gangrene in this COVID times. One controversial statement is the incidence of caesarean section has reported to have gone down in spite of same maternal mortality or perinatal mortality. Similarly, procedures such as coronary stents, knee replacements or cosmetic surgery which reflect supplier induced demand have also gone down. In spite of all the odds, it's you have to decide whether to be a victor or a victim. Difficulties in life can make you or break you. It is your choice whether to be a victor or a victim. We need to remember every sunset is inevitably followed by a sunrise. In an attempt to deal with the epidemic, creative innovations and solutions were developed. To minimize contact with patients in COVID-19 wards, remote monitoring of patients was implemented. Robotic equipments and technology were utilized to deliver medications and supplies to the hospitalized isolated patients. Bioinformatics and artificial intelligence was used. The next development was in the field of telemedicine and remote collaborations. Internet access has become globally vital and essential. Its role cannot be emphasized enough during challenging times like these, when it is especially important to be able to remotely contact family, friends, and to work from home. Globe has never seen such a wonderful team meetings. In order to follow the social distance guidelines during the COVID-19 pandemic, clinicians utilized remote collaboration to continue group-based consultation, research products, and residents' education. It has proven a feasible and effective alternative mode of communication. It enabled easier meeting scheduling for many participants from distant locations and thus more comfortable and efficient while less time consuming. The next development is solidarity and collaborations. The pandemic created many blessed collaborations between scientific communities, medical centers around the world, sharing information and knowledge. Creative partnership and the digital economy can create a better world for all. This Indo-Russia meet is one of the wonderful examples of these collaborations. This is a slide on which there can be a whole day discussion, but here I will say just a few words. COVID time has offered opportunities of balanced life between family, profession, physical, mental, social, and spiritual front. People realize that the world can survive even when the temples, churches, or mosques are closed. More than half of the humanity has been confined to their homes since from the start of the outbreak. 
many children have seen more of their parents and siblings even before family values had become more important in covid times those who had never been in kitchen had learned to cook food in the absence of housemates in other words the family bondings and values are at its height in covid times what better optimism it could be it's me and my reports before and after the lockdown when the work is less it's better to invest the time on health and family i was 75 and now i am 68 without any medication of blood pressure finally i close my presentation with a video compiled by dr parveen bhatia sir you can very well appreciate that how the surgeons from all over the country have made it an opportunity to improve their own health in the most worst time of the globe have an attitude that looks for the positive and tries to be optimistic can help you to filter out some of the constant barrage of bad and discouraging news holding on to that positive attitude can help you to center on the things that provide you with what you need to make it through these days and with this i extend my sincere thanks again to the organizers for having me here thank you very much Uh, thanks very much, Rajesh, for a very interesting presentation. So please uh, uh, stay uh, 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 online because uh, there is a question to you, by the way. Uh, just one question, uh, uh, whether one can uh, contract COVID-19, uh, let's say handling uh, uh, fluids, biological fluids. Uh, 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 Rajesh, uh, please uh, stay online. I, I repeat the question: whether a, whether a, a, uh, whether a person may be infected with COVID nineteen when handling uh, biological fluids. So, have you got the question? So, is it possible for a person? To, be, uh, to get infected with, uh, is it possible for a person to uh, get infected with COVID-19 when handling biological fluids? <laughs> uh, so we're trying to uh, connect with Dr. Rajesh. Ah. <sighs> uh, Uh, so Raj Rajesh, please uh, use the English channel for this. Uh, there is. Uh, uh, <laughs> uh, so the question is. Uh, so whether a person may uh, get infected with COVID-19 when handling with biological fluids. Okay, we'll try to do it uh, using uh, a chat, for instance. Uh, if you can't hear us, maybe you will... No. I repeat again. Can you hear me? Can you hear the interpreter? Uh, so the question is whether a person may contract uh, COVID-19 infection handling biological fluids. Have you got it? Have you got the question? Have you got the question? 
whether a person may get infected with COVID-19 handling biological fluids. Mm -hmm. uh, so we have a very special conference today. It's an international conference and uh, probably for uh, the sound technicians, uh, uh, it's really a challenge. But anyway, we can come back to this question anyway. And uh, the, the next speaker, Arma Prasad, a specialist in uh, bariatric, laparoscopic, uh, endoscopic uh, uh, surgery from New Delhi, a president uh, of laparoscopic uh, uh, bypass robotic surgery by a method of choice. Uh, so, uh, so the floor is yours. Um, Hello, good morning, everyone. Uh, I am Dr. Arun Prasad from India. I am a senior surgeon at Apollo Hospital, New Delhi, doing GI, bariatric and robotic surgery. Today, I shall talk about robotic surgery in the COVID era. Now, we have been doing robotic surgery pre-lockdown which was till the month of March, a total of 14 cases. Once we had the lockdown in India, we've done from March to November, another 16 cases. So these are our numbers during the COVID era this year. And this included bariatric surgery, pancreatic surgery, fundoplication, hiatus hernia surgery, rectopexy, rectal cancer, and stomach cancer cases. So the question is, why robotic surgery in the COVID era? Number one, the surgeon is away from the patient. He's away from the rest of the team members away from the anesthetist, assistant, OT staff. And the staff also is away most of the time. In other words, there is very little interaction between various members of the team, thereby maintaining good distance. We have found that in operation theaters, whoever has developed COVID infection has developed from colleagues and not from patients. So robotic surgery is useful here because it keeps people away. Also, there is one less assistant compared to open or laparoscopic surgery. So you have one less person exposed in the operation theater. There is minimal tissue contact with the healthcare workers. So that is an additional benefit. There is a contained space with aerosol inside the abdomen. And we would use a smoke or a plume evacuation. The hospital stay is less. Less chance of wound infection and post-operative visits to the hospital, thereby less chance of people interacting with each other, less crowding and less of risk. Beds become free for other patients. So when there is a bed crisis, again, less hospital stay is going to be useful, like any minimal access surgery. So in our operation room, you can see that is the robot, that's the patient card, and that's the surgeon's console. So I will show you a brief video. That is the anesthesia being given with safety. 
This is our robotic operation suite where you can see the robotic instruments, the console. The surgery starts by placing the trocars. We have special smoke evacuation trocars which have a special valve. And this is connected to the viral filters. So the smoke is evacuated through viral filters. That is the wheeling in of the robot. Robot is brought to the patient. And this step is known as docking of the robot, where the robo is connected to the trocars. I would still be wearing gloves, N95 mask, goggles, and shoe covers as part of the safety precautions. You can see how the robotic surgery is performed with minimal contact of staff with each other and with the patient. This is a clip of a robotic bariatric surgery where a gastro jejunal anastomosis is being done. Then there are innovations for smoke leakage. As you can see in this video, we would cover the trocar whenever any needle or any item is being introduced inside the abdomen. Similarly, again with the staplers, so the trocar is covered so that there is no spillage of smoke or plume inside the operation theater. This is the plume evacuation and the viral filters. You can see in another video how our viral filters are connected to one of the accessory trocars. So to conclude, I would like to say non-COVID surgical patients are being neglected. Elective surgery needs to be redefined. Medically necessary surgery has to go on. Pre-op COVID test and isolation is an important part of the plan. Robotic surgery leads to less risk to the staff. And early recovery and discharge is good for all of us. Thank you very much for listening to me. If there are any questions, I will be happy to answer them now for you. Thank you and all the best. So I give the floor to another presenter. So what we have done and what we are planning to do in the future. Uh, uh, so uh, Vadim Anatolievich, you are, are on the air, please. So with your permission. Let me display my presentation. Uh, so can you hear me and can you see me? Yes, we can see you well. Unfortunately, I, I, I had to replace the uh, main presenter due to some reasons. I have come to know about this just recently. 
uh, just yesterday to be more precise. Uh, uh, so, and we uh, decided to present a, a short report of our, uh, uh, of the work of our center. So the dynamics of coronavirus and infection with coronavirus in Russia, it is quite well known. It is being uh, revisited every day. Uh, so there are a certain number of uh, lethal cases, uh, but uh, uh, there are quite a number of those who have required. And now the situation is more or less stable as compared to the initial period. Initially, we actually did know exactly what to do. Uh, but now uh, it's uh, uh, another situation as to coronavirus. Uh, so it has been uh, known since 1965. And uh, uh, there were also findings regarding viral pneumonias. Um, so uh, its uh, case fatality rate made up 10%. There was also a, a MERS-CoV virus, Middle East Respiratory Syndrome uh, in 2012. Uh, so, but since November uh, uh, 2019, there is a new story with COVID-19. I'm not going to dwell on this in detail. Uh, so according to WHO, uh, so, uh, uh, so the incubation period is uh, uh, there is in the majority of cases is asymptomatic uh, progression, 60 to 70 percent. Uh, so and uh, the viral factors are quite well uh, studied. Uh, initially, it was uh, actually associated uh, uh, with the uh, uh, bats. Uh, so as uh, the intermediate host, uh, or uh, but uh, there is quite a, co a complex uh, pathogenesis, uh, COVID-19. All this uh, uh, takes place through activation uh, uh, of aldosterone systems through the system, uh, uh, AC1 uh, receptors and AC2. Uh, so there are two groups of receptors that are antagonism between each, each other. Uh, so, uh, uh, I see one uh, cause certain uh, negative repercussions. It may bring a uh, uh, cause edema and uh, thrombosis. Uh, so, uh, uh, so these are IC2 receptors uh, that come into play. Uh, uh, so, under normal situation. Uh, so, and uh, uh, it provides for adequate uh, uh, reaction of the body to uh, uh, a different multi uh, factor of the aldosterone system. Uh, um, and in case of the viral invasion, uh, so they also block uh, irreversibly uh, AC2 receptors. Uh, there is an edema, uh, uh, inflammation, apoptosis, uh, uh, so that leads to consequences related to the development of pneumonia uh, and uh, involvement of the genetic specter uh, of COVID-19 uh, mechanism. To be more precise, uh, as far as the pneumonia is concerned, uh, the, this is all localized in alveoli in case of normal interaction uh, of the system, there is a balancing um, uh, or a, a disturbance of the balance. Um, uh, so there could be a global viral infection. And uh, uh, there are so-called uh, uh, ground glass uh, symptoms um, that uh, are of great importance uh, are the uh, uh, in the response of the body, the genetic factors might be contributing uh, to this uh, sort of developments and uh, major genes uh, that can directly or indirectly be a part of homeostasis. Uh, uh, so this is uh, due to the fact that it, in some patients, the progression of the disease may be quite severe. And uh, but uh, in uh, some other persons uh, in population at large, uh, they are 
do not uh, actually get infected or uh, uh, go asymptomatic. There is a so-called cytokine storm, uh, uh, cytokine storm syndrome. Uh, it's of great importance. It may develop uh, and, uh, in different conditions. Uh, this is uh, not a specific condition for COVID-19. It may be observed during different infections, uh, let's say, uh, uh, artificial circulation uh, and during surgeries, etc. At the first stage, one can observe um, uh, of this uh, COVID-19. Uh, there could be leukopenia and uh, uh, so dysregulation of T lymphocytes, T helpers, uh, uh, and uh, on the second stage, there could be also leukocytosis. Uh, this uh, third stage, uh, there could be a pronounced release of cytokines. Um, uh, this is uh, re uh, associated with interleukin-6. Uh, so COVID-19 uh, and the role of interleukin-6. Uh, so there is an involvement of, of the lungs. Uh, and the interleukin-6 uh, is a predominant factor here. This is important uh, in view of the treatment pathogenesis. Uh, so an inflammatory uh, uh, feedback in between uh, interleukin-6 and uh, angiotensin-2. Uh, so this has to do with the respiratory system uh, in general. Uh, so, and the major mechanism, it's the cytokine uh, storm and the injury, there is a, a DIC syndrome uh, and also the uh, penetration through the vascular wall. Uh, uh, so, um, and this leads to this uh, uh, syndrome. And then thrombosis is one of the contributing factors. It's the uh, activation of different components of the system, including uh, platelets, uh, suppression of the system, uh, 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 so this is also part and parcel of, of the mechanism, and this leads to multi-organ uh, failure. So these are our findings uh, on the increase uh, uh, so of the fibrinogen and the elongation of the antithrombin time. Uh, uh, so when this infection takes place, uh, there is a sharp rise uh, at the initial stage, then there is a gradual decrease. If there is no room for a major uh, uh, global infection, this is done at the level of the DMARS. Uh, so, and the hospital COVID-19 uh, so was set up on the 2nd of April to 2020, according to the executive order of the Russian government. Uh, so, uh, as a counteraction to stop the spread of the infection uh, and uh, due to a pandemic in um, the Moscow city. Now the situation is more or less relieved. And uh, so now we have, we know much more about it. There are certain guidelines developed in this connection, how to pro perform surgeries uh, uh, in COVID-19 area. Uh, so, um, so this hospital consists the intensive care unit and four infection diseases departments. Uh, so the patients uh, uh, from severe category, they may uh, aggravate and we transfer them to more serious cases. Uh, there is a tri triage of patients, uh, just like during hostilities or war times. Uh, so the more serious cases uh, that uh, require uh, well, uh, the use of ventilators uh, and all patients should undergo CTs before uh, uh, they are being transferred to this or that department inside the hospital. So uh, there was a single team uh, that uh, uh, was interacting with diagnostic and uh, uh, supportive services and the work of our hospital has demonstrated its efficacy. There was a IC unit for 18 hospital beds with all kind of uh, ventilators, ECMO, etc. And there was an uh, IC, uh, and all uh, departments were had oxygen supply. There is a triage of, of patients and with the participation of anesthesiologists, intensivists at the admission stage. 
and provision of additional hospital beds if necessary. Uh, so the, we also uh, um, uh, um, had a, a multi-faceted support provided. Uh, so uh, uh, some people, uh, some um, uh, personnel had to live uh, in the hotel nearby uh, to be uh, 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 um, just easy at reach. Uh, so the results of treatment were quite uh, adequate. All in all, we had 414 patients, uh, lethal outcomes, 19 cases, 4.6%. It's a good result. Yeah, so uh, uh, unhooked from the ventilator, uh, seventy percent, and case fatality in the ICU was twelve uh, percent, and uh, uh, every stay of hospital about twenty days. Uh, as to antiviral uh, drugs, uh, it was not clear uh, from the beginning which uh, exactly should be used, and some were quite. Uh, uh, questionable or disputable, uh, but according to our experience, uh, uh, so for the treatment of the uh, uh, cytokine storm, so we used uh, uh, Noctembra and also reconvalescent uh, uh, plasma. Uh, just uh, what was the practical approach towards the management of such patients, the effectiveness of such treatment, because antiviral therapy was quite modest or doubtful. Uh, so we had to stimulate, uh, stimulate the immune system. The majority of cases uh, were progressing uh, as mild uh, and uh, serious cases uh, with a cytokine storm, they require uh, quite uh, uh, intensive uh, um, medical therapy. Uh, in order to uh, uh, make uh, the forecast, uh, uh, let's say, of moving to from serious to mild form, it's hard to say now. Uh, so the intensive care unit, we had a simmer of uh, hemodialysis, hemofiltration, uh, and, uh, uh, and also some uh, repeated the procedures like uh, dehydration, uh, then treatment of the septic shock, uh, that's why we used special fractionation columns and they have demonstrated the efficiency in treating our patients. Uh, so we use a three component antiviral therapy uh, as was recommended in the guidelines. And we used it throughout treatment. Uh, so uh, uh, a very interesting find uh, was the use of Actrembra, Actrempa, uh, it's, uh, it's the interleukin-6 blocker. And after inter uh, uh, administration of uh, Actempra, so we have seen quite good uh, outcomes. Mainly, these are the patients with hyperactive progression or, um, and during early stage of the disease. Uh, and this uh, uh, medication has demonstrated its high efficacy. So serious progression of COVID includes a virus, uh, uh, syndrome cardiovascular, uh, coagulopathic uh, uh, and uh, gastrointestinal. Uh, so viral syndrome is, of course, taking the lead. There is a multi-component therapy, antipyretics, uh, detox uh, therapy, correction of the immune system. Uh, uh, they also included uh, IL-6 blockers uh, and anti-COVID. Uh, we also started to use anti-COVID plasma. These are the markers. Uh, uh, so, of the severity of the disease progression of COVID-19, including leukocytosis and, and lymphopenia, uh, trauma, thrombocytosis. Uh, so, um, so, as you can see by this uh, table, uh, uh, so antibacterial therapy was equally important. Initially, we used uh, 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 moxiclov and then azithromycin. And then we switched to uh, another uh, medications in case of viral pneumonia. Uh, we had to do the uh, cultures uh, and we used uh, uh, not that uh, uh, strong antibiotics. Uh, so for to conduct antibacterial uh, therapy. So respiratory syndrome, maybe the oxygen therapy uh, and also uh, 
uh, cardiovascular syndrome in a number of patients, uh, especially those that were admitted uh, with such conditions uh, as uh, um, the dominant one, there was a two component control and patients with ischemic head disease were had to treat the complications and coagulopathic syndrome, as we have seen already in our uh, pathogenesis analysis, we use a, a low molecular heparin and in a number of patients, we had to use antiplatelet therapy. In uh, so, Plexan is not uh, Plexan is not always efficacious. That's why we had to use two components therapy, gastrointestinal syndrome. In a number of patients, it was quite pronounced. Uh, uh, so, mainly, uh, uh, the progression of the syndrome boiled down uh, to the use of. Uh, adequate uh, nutrition, gastroprotectors, and renal syndrome. So it uh, included mul uh, multi-organ failure and correction of the uh, electrolyte balance. Um, and uh, in a number of patients, there was a pronounced neurological uh, syndrome. And uh, uh, timely diagnosis was of great importance and neurologist uh, monitoring. Uh, uh, so the, there are some findings uh, produced by the fourth infection diseases department. I used to be the head of this. So uh, patients over 65, 67, they were made up the majority. Average uh, hospital days uh, uh, stay at 7.4. There was also a serious group of patients. Uh, uh, ventilators uh, were put on ventilators 22%. In the intensive care unit, there were 30% of patients admitted to the diagnosis were as follows. Those that were confirmed or only in 70%, there were positive tests for P by PCR. The severity according to CT and concomitant diseases, uh, there was a 90-year-old patient with serious dementia. Uh, so, you know, it's standing in, in, in history and uh, yeah. Uh, uh, there were also serious concomitant diseases like diabetes mellitus, uh, uh, COPD, etc. Three component therapy in a number of patients. Uh, we use uh, reconvalescent plasma as uh, uh, one of the components. According to our uh, experience, Aptempra uh, is efficacious during the first uh, four to six days, but uh, uh, reconvalescent uh, plasma, it is more efficacious uh, in seven to ten days after the onset of the disease. Aptembra was uh, uh, effective in 90% of patients, uh, in, uh, but reconvalescent plasma, in, uh, we use it only in uh, six patients. In five patients it was efficacious, but in one it failed. Uh, preliminary conditions, uh, 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 conclusions. Uh, uh, so the main uh, pathogenetic mechanism in the development of the infection is the global uh, virus invasion, invasion with subsequent uh, involvement of mechanism of intravascular uh, 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 thrombosis uh, and activation of the coagulation system and thrombocytosis uh, and micro. Uh, so as uh, also uh, respiratory deficiency and uh, hypoxia was developing uh, with the microcirculation and cytokine storm. Uh, so uh, hyperimmune or inadequate response to COVID-19 aggression was not directly related to this. Uh, it is justified to use any kind of components that prevent uh, the thrombosis uh, and uh, it was used adequately in, in dosages in all patients. Efficacy of standard antiviral therapy uh, gives rise to a lot of doubt. Uh, so it should be pointed out the high efficacy of uh, uh, Akmetra in our patients, uh, irrespective of the age, uh, was quite uh, uh, efficacious at the start of the disease. Initially, respiratory therapy in patients with COVID-19 uh, so, uh, had to be used, uh, and the oxygen therapy with the constant control of oxygen saturation. Uh, so uh, um, the patient triage and organization of patients uh, was of great importance. Thanks uh, for your attention. 
and uh, uh, thank you time and again for including me um, uh, into the list of speakers. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, please stay with us. We have a number of questions to you. Uh, so, and you will have to answer questions. <laughs> uh, uh, so, uh, uh, the question was whether you co uh, one can contract COVID-19 uh, handling biological fluids. Uh, what do you mean by biological fluids? You mean in the lab, or I mean to say blood, sputum, uh, or uh, let's say, uh, no, or, well, in my opinion, one can get infected if the patient uh, uh, is a super spreader of COVID, uh, let's say by day seven, when there is a um, further release of the causative agents uh, through, uh, in, uh, through biological fluids, including uh, staying in the intensive care unit, uh, but uh, the, uh, the pa patient should also wear personal protecting uh, equipment. And uh, uh, there is, uh, uh, so, and one should know whether the patient can be excreter uh, of the a causative agent uh, of COVID-19. Such was the attitude in our center anyway. And then regarding the tactics of patient management in case of pneumothorax. Well, uh, uh, in our situation, of course, it may come across, uh, it may happen. Uh, no. uh, uh, so in case uh, uh, there is a need to, to provide mechanical ventilation, Mm, uh, uh, then in case of pneumothorax and with regular surgical uh, intervention. I don't remember that we had a critical case of pneumothorax uh, that would require global drainage. Uh, there was one case uh, uh, that could be classified as such, but actually uh, this kind of problem was not that uh, important in our case. And then some uh, uh, question, there are some questions about the endoscopy department, uh, the way it is organized in case there is a uh, 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 GI uh, bleeding or hemorrhage. Uh, uh, so it's uh, of course uh, in, important uh, uh, we analyze the situation. Uh, some patients uh, required uh, resolution uh, in the bronchi uh, so uh, they conducted this uh, process. Uh, this helped to uh, disconnect the patients from the uh, uh, ventilators uh, and it was done on a planned basis, let's say twice per day or upon demand. And secondly, uh, when there was a tracheostomy cannules, uh, so and tracheostomy, it was a uh, uh, principal uh, uh, approach in order to uh, not to augment the aggression early tracheostomy. It uh, helped to uh, disconnect patients, to unhook uh, uh, patients from the ventilators. Um, and so uh, uh, GI bleeding uh, in uh, our uh, uh, situation. I don't remember a single case uh, with such condition, uh, but uh, patients receive this kind of therapy and uh, uh, we had to provide endoscopy, but it was not frequently performed anyway. So one or another question, did you use hormonal treatment? Uh, so in case of COVID-19, uh, yes, we did use uh, hormonal treatment and I did not uh, touch upon this issue, but in case of a negative progression of the disease, uh, uh, before uh, developing uh, serious septic complications, we certainly used hormonal therapy as a, a modality to uh, decrease the probability of cyto cy cytokine storm and uh, those consequences that we're talking about and uh, indication for hormonal therapy. So, of course, it should be done it's when especially when it is uh, important during the first seven to ten days. But later on, there could be some septic complications and we should uh, use a detox and antibacterial therapy. Uh, 
thank you. And the last question to you. How can you explain in a number of patients long-term hyperglycemia in case there is no, uh, when the diabetes mellitus is ruled out? Hyperglycemia and any change, uh, let's say any kind of a situation related to the development of the global stress or cytokine storm or surgical intervention it leads to the changes or alterations in the system uh, or, or, or the glycemia control and its strain uh, uh, and uh, release of those active substances naturally leads to, uh, well, uh, to the mobilization of glycogenes and elevated uh, blood sugars uh, in case of major cardiovascular surgeries and in case of some other intervention there is also a, a, a hypoglycemia is always there uh, and uh, similar kind of uh, conditions may develop uh, in case of uh, cytokine storm with uh, a serious uh, COVID-19 disease. Thank you very much Vadim Anatolievich your uh, presentation has been truly important uh, and the next to speak will be Sergei uh, Alexandrovich Kovalex, head of the cancer department of the Northwestern uh, uh, District uh, Medical Center, named after Sokolov. So potential of immunotherapy, uh, so in case of cancers. So the floor is yours. Sergei Alexandrovich. You are on air, you can speak. I'd like uh, to welcome you at the conference devoted to the organization of surgical care in COVID conditions. Well, here you can see my disclaimer. And obviously, first and foremost, we must uh, talk about uh, safety. That means uh, patients uh, should be tested for the coronavirus. Uh, there should be swabs uh, taken or CT done, and if the patient is hospitalized, there should be a second uh, smear done for COVID-19 and uh, chest uh, CT. Colorectal cancer is the disease we deal with, and uh, it ranks uh, second in Russia in terms of mortality and morbidity from all cancers. More than 60,000 patients uh, with colorectal cancer and in, uh, in 2016, almost uh, uh, 39,000 patients died uh, from colorectal cancer during the year. It's uh, the population of a small town. It looks like uh, the decision has been found uh, thanks to the blocking of PD-1 and PD-L1 receptor which is on the lymphocyte, Professor Hodzi Tosuku and Isida Yosumasa were the pioneers in this field and PDL1 is needed by the tumor cell. Pembrolizumab is the drug which is an anti-PDL1 antibody. In this case, uh, we can block uh, the pathway and uh, you can see PDL1, PDL21 pathways are being blocked as a result of the binding of the receptor with the ligand. Uh, we can block the maturation and the spread of lymph of uh, tumor cells, and uh, this uh, leads to the immune response that was a revolution in oncology. Thus, we achieved a very good effect in the treatment of tumors, especially when we have microsatellite instability. Also, as for tumors, there may be a deficiency of reparation proteins and uh, hence we have DNA mismatch repair. A study was conducted 
Keynote 164 to assess the anti-tumor activity of pembrolizumab in patients with high MSI and uh, also HDMMR positive uh, with uh, metastatic colorectal cancer who were on anti-tumor therapy. This study was conducted in two phases, 128 centers in the world. In a cohort, the patients got more than two lines of standard therapy. In cohort B, more than one line. The primary endpoint is overall survival, progression-free survival, and overall response rate. In cohort A, there were 61 patients who got more than two lines of standard therapy. Median follow-up is 31 months. In cohort B, more than one line of standard therapy. Median follow-up, 24 months. All patients who were included in Keynote 164 had uh, ECOG uh, 0 to 1. In cohort A, 27 patients got more than three lines of chemotherapy in cohort B, more than 19 patients. What are the results of Keynote 164? Well, uh, you can see some patients uh, had uh, overall response rate, which was quite good. The complete response uh, was uh, also achieved in a certain number of cases. Control of the disease was achieved in many patients also you can see the assessment of the foci of the disease as compared to the baseline, depending on the number of lines of therapy progression-free survival. 24 months in 31% of patients in cohort B, 37% of patients had this progression-free survival. Overall survival, 24 months overall survival in cohort A, 55% in cohort B, it was uh, 63%. So patients who got one or two lines of chemotherapy, their overall survival is higher as compared to patients who had uh, two or three lines of chemotherapy before pembrolizumab uh, was administered. Adverse events in cohort B, grade three and four, no such events as you can see it here. And there were a small number of patients uh, who had uh, three or four uh, grade uh, adverse events in cohort A. Autoimmune complications were in small numbers, mostly hypertension. And uh, as you can see it here, patients with different tumors and uh, MSI had uh, a better response to immunotherapy as compared to chemotherapy. There were five studies presented and regardless of the tumor, the overall response rate uh, was 34.3%. Uh, Remission occurred in all cases with tumors and MSI. On the basis of this study in 2018, these drugs were included in modern standards of care for patients with colorectal cancer and macrosatellite instability. So the question is, should the patients with colorectal cancer and inoperable metastasis be subject uh, to surgery. In the past, uh, we said uh, yes, but now, due to the results of the studies, and especially JCOG 1007, the paradigm has changed. Chemotherapy and immunotherapy were compared for colorectal cancer, 165 patients were studied. They were divided into resection plus chemotherapy group and uh, the second group uh, chemotherapy only and uh, median overall survival 25.9 months in resection plus chemotherapy group and 26.4 months for patients on chemotherapy only. 
Thus, if the patient has uncomplicated colon tumor and inoperable metastasis, the resection of primary asymptomatic uh, focus is not recommended. The patient should be put on chemotherapy, and uh, in this case, uh, median overall survival will be even higher. Right now, there is Keynote 177 third phase uh, study, pembrolizumab uh, monotherapy for patients uh, with uh, colorectal cancer compared with uh, standard chemotherapy. The results uh, are quite encouraging. Monotherapy with pembrolizumab showed uh, the clinically improvement uh, quality of life in patients uh, with with naive, uh, in naive patients, uh, the toxicity is lower. In case of monotherapy, the quality of life is higher as compared to chemotherapy. As for recommendations and guidelines for 2020 in patients with colorectal cancer and MSI, it is stipulated that, that anti-PDL1 antibodies can be administered, such as pembrolizumab. Right now, studies are still in progress. I hope in 2021, there will be recommendations regarding the administration of such drugs uh, as first-line therapy for patients with colorectal cancer and MSI. This will increase overall survival and uh, increase uh, the quality of life of our patients. Thank you very much. Should you have any questions, I'll be glad to answer them. Thank you, Sergey, for this very interesting presentation. This uh, topic is uh, very relevant in case of COVID-19. Well, Sergey, in case of uh, the acute uh, COVID-19 pandemic, do we need to expand the indications uh, and uh, more actively maybe use uh, radiation therapy for such patients, uh, patients with different types of cancer? What is your take on that? Well, chemotherapy in the conditions of the pandemic is uh, cuts both ways. On the one hand, we can postpone surgery, but on the other hand, chemotherapy can cause immunosuppression and thus the patient on chemotherapy is more subjected to the risk of contracting COVID-19. That is why I think uh, immune uh, drugs uh, have a less uh, risk for the patient to contract the COVID-19. Thank you so much. Now the floor is given to Dr. Pankaj Handewal, who is uh, from Baroda. He is one of the most uh, famous uh, surgeons in this area. The theme of his presentation is managing with limited uh, human resources and supplies and minimal invasive surgery during COVID times. Good afternoon, Pankaj, the floor is yours. COVID times have been one of the most challenging times for humanity throughout the world whether it is a developing country or a developed country. All of, us have, all of us have been stressed to the maximum and there has been a limitation to the resources and supplies which have been available for us during the COVID times. How we managed minimally invasive surgery during these COVID times in India is what I would be talking about. In India, a national lockdown occurred on 22nd March. At that time in our region, there were a few sporadic cases but for all practical purposes, there was no community spread. To understand how we dealt with it, I've divided this time into three phases. March and April, where there was confusion and chaos. May, where some awareness and stability came. And after June, we were cautious, but we were comfortable in performing the minimal access surgeries. This confusion and chaos started in the end of March and it continued till a little bit about mid of April. There was an element of confusion, but along with that, there was an element of fear as well. We had been hearing stories about spread of COVID to the medical personnel following surgeries in Italy and New York. And these stories fueled more and more fear among the medical personnel. It was being debated whether we perform laparoscopic or open surgery, 
a large number of surgeons were of the opinion that laparoscopy may be more dangerous and could lead to higher risk of transmission of the COVID infection. We had no idea about the mode of spread during surgery from the peritoneal fluid, blood, or from the feces. The another area of ambiguity was handling of the aerosols generated during anesthesia or from the cautery and the energy devices. Now, how to protect the medical personnel in theater was one of the most important aspects. A lot of discussions, webinars, which added more to the fear and gave us less direction. To add to this thing was the chaos due to non-availability of essential items, which we used to very occasionally use, suddenly became essential items. RT-PCR testing was not available in most of the places. N95 mask sparingly used otherwise suddenly became the most commonly used mask by all the medical personnel. In India, we were not used to using disposable. In our part of the country, we tend to use more of reusables and PPE are mainly used in patients who had either HIV infection or HBS AG infection. So suddenly we had a huge demand increase while the supply was limited as earlier it used to be used sparingly by most of the medical personnel. Also the staff had significant fears and these fears needed to be eliminated. So how did we deal with the situation? We stopped all elective procedures as most of the countries in the world did. Only life-threatening emergency surgeries were being performed. Now the other thing was in our part of the country, we do 90% of our work in small nursing homes which are personally owned. Only high-risk patients were operated in multi-speciality hospitals. Following COVID, we had to close down our small nursing homes and perform the surgeries only in the multi-speciality hospitals. RT-PCR testing was not available for us for pre-operative testing, but good part was there was no community spread. So the possibility of an emergency patient having COVID infection was extremely rare. But we had the option of only the history, history of cough or fever, history of travel, because most of the cases we were seeing in our part of the country were of patients who were traveled abroad and any history of contact with a COVID patient. We would also perform the non-specific markers, uh, reduce white cell count, elevated C-reactive protein, serum peritin or D-dimer levels elevated would make a patient suspicious. But we would not find any of these markers elevated at that time since the community spread was. There was a significant shortage of N95 masks. To overcome that, we gave each staff three masks. Once used, the person would have to label with his name, get a TTO and reuse it after two days. I don't know whether this was correct or not, but we did not have any other option at that time if we wanted to use the N95 masks. The PPE kit which the staff wear, as you can see here, there is a complete covering of the PPE kit, a second layer of the impervious gown which is present, a N95 mask covered by a three-layered mask and presence of goggles. In spite of our advising the staff, they would still wear two masks secondary to their fears. Wearing the PPE kit and the gown on top of it would make it very exhaustive and produce a lot of heat when the surgeries were prolonged. I would rather prefer to wear the HIV kits, which basically included a hood, goggles, N95 mask, an impervious gown, two layers of gloves and leggings. And this was what we would wear while performing the surgeries in the multi-speciality hospitals. Till mid-April, we had a national lockdown ongoing and so we did not find any significant spread of the disease in the community. Since we were performing emergency surgeries for life-threatening conditions, we could manage things. But later part of April, failed conservatively treated patients started coming to us for surgery. Acute cholecystitis patient treated conservatively at another hospital came about two weeks later with a gallbladder perforation. Acute appendicitis treated at end of March came back with a recurrent episode within four weeks of the conservative treatment. A patient treated in again in end of March gallstone pancreatitis treated conservatively, gallbladder not removed, came back with a recurrent pancreatitis and this time it was 
having a necrotizing element as well. These emergency patients coming back increased in number and that required for us to open up the nursing homes. It was otherwise not possible to function in a normal manner unless and until our nursing homes were reopened again. Fortunately, in end of April, the SAGES EES recommendations were published. These recommendations gave us a good idea about how we should be proceeding with the minimal access surgeries. The most important aspect was that there was very little evidence of spread of COVID during minimal access surgeries. And so we could perform the minimal access surgeries with less risk and more confidence than before. The two most important points which we took from the guidelines was evacuation of the smoke while we were performing the surgery and two was deflation of the pneumoperitoneum at the end of the surgery to be done in a safe manner. So we reviewed our practice, PPE kits we were already following. Since preoperative RT-PCR was not permitted, an HRCT chest was being seen as a modality which could pick up COVID infections. We started doing a preoperative HRCT chest screening for our, all our patients subjected to surgery. Also, we focused on the management of the aerosols generated during anesthesia, the laparoscopic carbon dioxide, and from the cautery and the energy device. Since PPE kits were in short supply and they were exorbitantly priced, we had our operation theater staff stitch these leggings and the hoods, which were then etiode and they were used. So we came up with an arrangement wherein we had this impervious gown, which is a reusable gown, which at the end of the surgery is immersed into a soap solution and then into a sodium hypochlorite solution before it is sent for the washing. A hood, N95 mask and a reusable head shield which could be etiode and used again. The precautions during anesthesia mainly involved limited number of personnel in theater, intubation and extubation precautions and scavenging of the gases. Our anesthesia friends came up with again simple solutions after removal of the mask while the patient is being ventilated prior to intubation the ventilatory mask is applied the patient is covered with an impervious plastic sheet so that there is no dispersal of the aerosols in the operation theater following this They would also intubate the patient using a tent, which you can see here, again impervious plastic placed on a metal frame and the patient could be intubated with again minimal spray of aerosols into the operation. For the gases going into the patient and coming out of the patient at the level of the endotracheal tube, which had the HME filters placed and also at the inlet of the anesthesia trolley as well as the outlet of the anesthesia trolley, these filters were placed. So whatever was going into the patient or coming out was simultaneously filtered. At the outlet of the anesthesia trolley, a tubing was connected. So the gases coming out of the anesthesia trolley were scavenged outside the theater into the atmosphere so that there was no dispersal of the aerosols into the operation theater. While performing laparoscopy, the special precautions which were taken was having smaller incision for the port so that you do not have any CO2 leakage around the ports, operating at low pressure and releasing the CO2 from the port controlled through the filters and especially at the end of the surgery when the abdomen is to be decompressed, making sure that there was no air CO2 leakage into the operation. As we can see here, we have the outlet from the valve in the 5 mm port. This is connected to the filter and the air is pushed out or scavenged out of the operation theaters. Similarly, whatever we were sucking into the suction, as it comes out, it is again filtered and then it goes out outside the theater and is not released into the theater.
By the end of May, our awareness and the stability improved significantly and we were able to perform the surgeries in a fairly safe manner. The supplies of the PPE kits improved and 95 mask availability increased. The prices reduced significantly and the staff also started getting used to working with safety. In June, we had a good number of surgeries, cautiously performed, but comfortably so. RT-PCR was available for preoperative screening, supplies easily available. We had performed more than 50 surgeries, the system was set, the staff was comfortable. Community spread started in July 2020 in our region. System was geared to handle the situation comfortably. The first peak settled in September. October and November, we resumed elective surgeries with all precautions. As we await second peak and cases are rising in our region, we have gone back into the emergency surgery mode. So we are now learning to live with the new normal of presence of COVID. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Pankaj. We'll try to ask you questions if you hear us. Can you hear us, Dr. Pankaj? Can you hear us? One, yes. two, three, four, yes, five. Yes, I can hear you quite clearly. Okay, excellent. Dr. Pankaj, could you tell us uh, antibodies, uh, IgM antibodies, how long are they in the organism? Is there a risk to catch COVID-19 a second time? Uh, the risk is there uh, to catch the infection again as per few cases which have been reported, but uh, the number of cases are not a lot and the intensity of those cases most of the time has been low. Uh, another question, what is uh, the reason for massive for subcutaneous emphysema in patients uh, on mechanical ventilation. Why do patients on mechanical ventilation uh, have uh, subcutaneous emphysema? Uh, you mean patients who have undergone minimal, uh, minimal access surgeries? Well, I mean patients on mechanical ventilation uh, of any type of patients, patients with COVID-19. Why do patients with COVID-19 have a subcutaneous emphysema when they are on mechanical ventilation? Well, that's uh, out of my purview because I'm not a person who treats COVID infections. I'm mainly talking about minimal access surgery during the COVID times. Okay, in any case, uh, thank you so much for this uh, wonderful presentation. Now the floor is given to Mahmoud Timir Bulatov. He's a professor, head of the Department uh, of the Surgery of Bashkir University. He will be speaking on restructuring the region's surgical service to deal with the pandemic. Добрый день. Uh, Презентация видно well, хорошо. Я вот afternoon. не Can понимаю. Так. I do not uh, understand if everyone can see my presentation. Я включил not. звук. Yes, uh, we can see your presentation, but uh, the slides are very small. So please uh, turn on звук. the sound. Слышно, да? Well, everyone should hear me right now. Так, я, я звук включил. All right, so the sound is on. We have a minor technical problem. Не слышно, да? Well, so you cannot hear me, I assume. Or at least not everyone can hear me. Hello. Okay.
Но другой тогда... Я, я, я включаю... Включен мне, не the слышно, да, меня все равно. Давайте я на, на ноут попробую. Окей, я попробую это сделать от У меня все включено. Так, Looks like everything is on. Let me try again. О, я давайте, может, через брау браузер попробую. Maybe зайти. I will try it uh, to do through the browser. Just give me one minute. Sorry, we have a technical pause, as we call it, because of the technical glitch. So I try. Unfortunately, Professor Timir Bulatov has some problems. So I'd like to give the floor to Ramin Goel, who is an expert in the field of bariatric surgery, the founder of the Bariatric Surgery Center in Mumbai, building global surgical workforce through academic partnership in COVID times. Ramin, the floor Hello, is friends. yours. Greetings from Indian Association of Gastroenterology and Surgeons. IAGS. I'm glad that AWR Surgical Community from India and the Russian Surgical Society have jointly organized this meeting during COVID-19 pandemic and invited me to share my thoughts and whatever we have achieved in last 10 months uh, to create an international collaboration for COVID-19. This has been an interesting year. Uh, obviously, we feel sorry for all those lives lost during this time, and which is which is so difficult to to justify to the families and the friends who who lost their near and dear ones. But during this time, uh, there had been a great effort to build global workforce to bring people together through academic partnerships. This started actually before the COVID-19 came. Uh, when I took over as the president of IAGS in February, I had this on agenda that we should have regional partnerships with other surgical associations beyond the political uh, divisions. And so we approached Surgical Society of Bangladesh, Surgical Society of Pakistan, Maldives Association of Surgeons and the Sur Surgical Society of from Sri Lanka. 
and they 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 very aggressively and they were very willing to support the cause but then what happened within a month of my taking over as the president covid 19 pa pandemic un got unleashed all over the world and as you know this was probably this is the probably the most discussed disease by mankind because of the media and because of the social media probably everybody around the world got information within minutes about each development happening in any part of the world from limited knowledge we went to a misinformation overload and then information overload and this this has resulted a, a great it had a great impact on surgical practice surgical practice because of pandemic came to a complete standstill for months i stopped surgery for almost 3 months at a stretch initially mostly affecting bariatric surgeons plastic surgeons and non trauma orthopedic work this is because they they hardly have any emergencies but it affected each one of us i agree oncological work cardiology work and diseases in the acute presentations continued in limited format something like the gallstone disease renal disease hernias abscesses trauma etc it has put the leadership of various association in a in a dilemma on one side there was a unexpected work stoppage the there were financial constraints on surgeons because there were hardly any income and the the outflows continued and our members were at great stress with uncertainty about the time frame and there were mental stress with negative inputs and the outlook looked bleak but there was a upside to it people spent quality time with their family members they had increased participation in household chores they had time for quality reading and they had time and willingness to learn new surgical techniques or the principles that made us think how we can redesign our our training programs how we can help our members during this time uh, of uh, of pandemic so very early in march and we started com conducting covid webinars and we realized that we are not are responsible only for surgeons or our members as the leader of a society we are also responsible for other surgeons and the public at large so we started creating weekly webinars to create awareness on covid related information these webinars which were held on the weekends were attended were open to all physicians and surgeons across the country and in neighboring countries as well very early from 4th april we started having these webinars and for this we used a, a platform which had 4 400000 doctors as its members and that led to a situation that we always had at least around 3000 participants to attend these webinars which was a which was accepted by all the members because we brought uh, we brought people from all over the world experts from all over the world these were virologists ep epidemiologists animal researchers surgeons who brought updated knowledge to to our medical colleagues because that was the dire necessity during those times first 3 to 4 months and that helped them understand the covid 19 and they understand the sars cov 2 and understand how they can protect themselves and their family members and their patients and how they can keep their hospitals and practices going on friends this was a crisis but we as a association used it as an opportunity because we realized there are very senior consultants and experts who have time at hand who were who were so difficult to get in previous years the connectivity improved because of the of the of the various platforms like the one we are using now 
they were so we had access to worldwide faculty members and we started inviting other national and international associations and groups to collaborate with us for knowledge sharing for the first time uh, in india all the three minimal access surgery associations came together to bring out a unified guidelines for surgeons and that had lot more credibility than uh, individual associations guidelines and similarly the other as international associations started working together with us to to provide uh, information systems so we started holding webinars training programs and conferences during this time these webinars were subject specific for surgeons and there were basic master classes on basic surgical topics or uh, advanced topics webinars for experts in different specialties we normally iags conducts on a uh, fellowship programs fellowship courses for surgeons around 30 courses every year these are on site three day programs uh, with, with a diploma at the end after an examination once we realized that pandemic is not going to go away in 2 to 3 months we quickly shifted our fellowship courses online which required lot of infrastructure which required participation from faculty and that there were many advantages of these fellowship courses these fellowship courses now became available round the clock and instead of a 3 day program now those 30 modules could be offered over a month and anybody could start a fellowship program on any of the day so it was not specific to one geography or one particular weekend of the month now the program was going on online uh, throughout the month and person can join and attend a lecture at his convenience so if a surgeon is operating in the morning he can attend lecture midnight and and uh, quickly give a mcq and go to the next lecture this this made accepted made it more acceptable because now person doesn't have to travel to a different city doesn't has to lose his practice and is a uh, is learning the same way or can go and re re attend a lecture a uh, second or third time to have clarity then we also held a conference which of about which i'll going to talk in detail uh, indo uk surgicon with royal college of surgeons uh, of edinburgh so the webinars that we held was subject specific and i'm sure most of you have attended webinars at different places but these webinars were attended by almost 2000 plus surgeons each time while typically a, a continuing medical education a cme would have only 100 to 150 surgeons in past so the the virtual platform that was provided during pandemic uh, led to increased participation increased learning and these participants were not only from one city or from one country typically we had participants from 10 to 20 countries each time which increased the reach of the our webinar and we would have faculty from four to five countries to participate in this webinar this this led to a international collaboration uh, of providing information or of learning uh, from from these webinars then various associations as i mentioned Uh, with other minimal access surgery associations we brought guidelines which were which were published subsequently in journal of minimal access surgery and uh, the information was used by various state governments to develop their sops with national surgical association of maldives bangladesh and pakistan we we exchanged webinar information and we provided online training opportunities and already there are surgeons from various countries who are going through these online training uh, programs and the faculty of those country are included in in helping us conduct the program these we also led to involvement of elsa uh, 
uh, for member participation. So in various conferences of ELSA and vice versa, their, their members participated in IAGS meeting. This is, this is something very unusual. Uh, I mean, earlier also there were participation in ELSA meetings, but there'll be 20, 30 surgeons who would be going to attend. Now there'll be 300, 400 surgeons or 500 surgeons attending each of these meetings from, uh, from our country. Then uh, something very unusual happened that we started getting complimentary delegate participation. So European Society of Endoscopic Surgery invited uh, members of IAGS to join their conference, uh, which was readily accepted by surgeons from India because earlier it would take a huge financial burden to travel to those countries. And similarly, Korea, Korean endoscopic surgery offered this uh, to, to our members. So I think this led to increased learning and this was at a no cost basis uh, interaction between the, when we held Indo-UK Surgicon, we will, I'll mention that later, we offered the, the same thing to, to overseas participants. With Association of Laparoscopic Surgeons of Great Britain and Ireland and British Obesity and Metabolic Surgery Society, uh, we had a complimentary participation in the UK Surgicon. And now uh, the meeting of ALS GBI, which is, which, will, which is recently got over, the same complimentary registration was offered to Indian Association of Gastrointestinal Endosurgeon. So what I'm trying to tell you is that COVID pandemic has given an opportunity for greater academic exchange between surgeons uh, at, at, at a very minimal cost. Indo-UK Surgicon is a typical example of a collaborative conference. We had planned this conference with Royal College of Surgeons of Edinburgh uh, two years back. And this conference was to be held in July 2020 in Edinburgh. And this was postponed because of the pandemic. So we held a virtual conference in October uh, 2020, and this was endorsed by Bangladesh Surgical Association and Society of Surgeons of Pakistan. And from, uh, and we had almost 2,000 delegates in this and over 200 faculty. Now, you realize it when we, we were planning to hold it in Royal College of Surgeons and Surgeons Quarters in Edinburgh, we, were, we had a capacity of accommodating only 150 to 200 surgeons, out of which about 100 surgeons were planning to travel from India. Now, when we held it virtually, there was no limitation. We had over, as I mentioned, we had over 2000 attendees. When we were planning to host it in Edinburgh, we had only two halls, the second hall with a capacity of only 80 participants. But when we held it virtually, we used four halls and we had eight specialties over two days, a full day meeting of each specialty and in four halls. When we are planning in Edinburgh, because of cost constraints, we had only 30 to 50 faculty. When we held a virtual conference, we had 200 faculty from 20 countries. The expected expense per delegate was 3000 to $5,000 when we were traveling to Edinburgh. While the expense per delegate was only $15 when we had a virtual conference. So the live transmission when you're traveling to Edinburgh was not feasible because the entire uh, lead, uh, uh, faculty from India was traveling. But when we held a virtual conference, we had 40 hours of live transmission from 16 centers across the country. So friends, the, the pandemic and the, the the, the, the subsequent integration led to a phenomenal uh, benefit to the surgical community. And what, had, what, it has, what has been the, learn, the learning or the lessons that we have learned? <coughs> During COVID-19, faculty was willing to contribute. People realized that everybody is affected worldwide and there was no hesitation even by the senior most person to, to join the programs that we planned. 
there is, was an increased understanding between associations. Uh, one of the major driving force was technology availability and acceptance. Now we are in a position that we are accepting technology and the biggest beneficiary of these tie-ups for the surgical community. Looking forward, I, I see a challenge in maintaining interest of surgeons, but I, I already foresee hybrid and physical meetings. So whether every physical meeting will also have a virtual component. So all the meetings are likely to be hybrid so that those who can't travel or those who do not have time to travel uh, will be able to participate in these meetings because of the learning of these last 10 months. The faculty requirement will go down. We, will, we, can, we can have more faculty participation from across the world and they don't need to spend a week to attend, uh, to travel across the world to, uh, to have a one hour session or two hour lectures. And participants, we need to look to whether participants are willing to travel or spend time for a physical meeting. So I think all these are the challenges that we are going to face and we are going to see this in near future. Uh, global workforce in COVID-19, yes, we, there were new approaches to international collaboration and learning. And this meeting is a living example of that where AWR, Surgical Community of India and Russian Surgical Society are joining together. Knowledge sharing has gone beyond geopolitical boundaries. There had been limitations because you could not invite people from certain countries as faculty or delegates because of the political issues. We have, we have been able to go beyond that now and uh, because of the virtual platform. And we have access to experts beyond national boundaries. So friend, there is a, there, we have a way to go to, to look. I believe, I seriously believe that the, the learning methods and exchange has completely changed. Uh, future will be different than what it was uh, one, one year back. Uh, we are going to see a different kind of conferences, different kind of meetings forever. And, and that will be for the good. I wish to thank the organizers of this meeting, especially Dr. Ramana and his team from India for inviting me and the organizing component of uh, Russian Surgical Society for this opportunity. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Raman. Well, it's uh, a wonderful attendance. Uh, thousands of doctors attended uh, the conferences. We'll try to get in touch with Ufa again with Professor Timir Bulatov. Let's see if we have a connection. Yes, uh, can you hear me? Yes, Mahmoud, uh, we can hear you. I am sorry for this uh, technical problem. I am trying to share my slides again. I hope uh, you can see my presentation right now. Yes, so you should turn on screen share sharing. Okay, just uh, turn on slideshow and uh, we'll see your full screen. Okay, that's uh, what we need now. Terrific. All right. Good afternoon, good evening, dear colleagues. Uh, sorry for this uh, technical problem. In my presentation, I would like uh, to talk about uh, such issue as restructuring the region's surgical service in the situation of COVID-19. Previous speakers have already mentioned what can be done to protect uh, medical staff, uh, to protect uh, ourselves. So let me just uh, cover some of these issues. We do have some problems uh, when COVID-19 started. Naturally, postponing elective surgeries is one of such problems. 
maybe we still don't understand uh, this uh, problem fully. And uh, of course, uh, soon we will face uh, the consequences. Also turning uh, hospitals uh, to COVID-19 hospitals and the reduction in the number of surgical beds, that's another problem. Well, also emergency surgeries were carried out in healthcare facilities and uh, the situation looks normal, but when there is one patient with COVID-19, the place is quarantined and uh, patients uh, without COVID-19 cannot get any medical care in this case. That's uh, another serious problem. There were also cases when the patient had fever after the surgery or had uh, abscess. And uh, in this case, uh, we thought uh, the patient did not have COVID-19, but in fact, the patient was COVID-19 positive. Another problem is uh, providing care and emergency surgery for patients uh, with acute uh, pathology who might uh, have uh, COVID-19, or at least we suspect uh, he or she has COVID-19. So these are the major problems uh, we encountered. Also, I should say that uh, usually such uh, problems uh, occur in small hospitals when, for example, the surgeon are in, surgeons are infected and cannot provide the care. The question is what to do with this uh, patient. The first major problem is elective surgeries. There is no opinion what to do with elective surgeries, but our distinguished Indian colleagues have already mentioned what happened in India and of course in our country such elective procedures were put off for the time being and in China for example it was shown that elective surgeries led to an increased number of hospitalizations of patients with COVID-19. So we have to postpone them for the time being. Well, the same was true of Italy at the initial stage of the outbreak of this coronavirus. Well, of course, uh, uh, we should only focus on emergency life-threatening conditions that should be our priority. And uh, of course, uh, in this case, we should have a clear system of triage of patients. There might be alternatives uh, such as medical or conservative treatment uh, when uh, surgery is impossible due to COVID-19, but uh, conservative treatment uh, is not always possible, cannot always result uh, in a good outcome. Well, so, uh, but that's uh, probably the only option in such a situation, like, uh, for example, the use of antibiotics for treatment of appendicitis uh, or something like that. But that should not be done en masse. And, uh, well, again, this slide is very populated, but uh, I should say that, of course, uh, PPEs are very important for health care workers as well as uh, other devices um, like uh, smoke uh, removers, uh, etc. And uh, in case of laparoscopy, well, we need uh, to use uh, specific uh, filters so that aerosols would not uh, be spread all over the operating room and of course uh, electrocoagulation uh, should uh, not uh, be used at uh, full capacity or at least the power should be reduced uh, when we use uh, such devices for electrocoagulation. Well, here you can see the check lists uh, of uh, what the particular devices can be used in the situation of COVID-19 pre-operative, perioperative, and post-operative. Well, this slide shows our surgical departments in Ufa, 
well, Ufar has the population of slightly more than 1 million people. And uh, of course, um, the work of surgical departments, uh, surgical uh, units uh, has changed due to this uh, COVID-19 situation. And uh, you can see that uh, there are several uh, units uh, which uh, were closed for elective uh, surgeries. Uh, they were used as COVID-19 hospitals or units. Well, most uh, inpatient uh, hospitals, especially one universal hospital that we have did not uh, provide uh, elective surgeries as well. And uh, we keep uh, working in this uh, mode. Uh, well, right now we have uh, more elective surgeries, uh, but not as many as we used to have uh, before the pandemic. Here you can see the number of uh, functioning general surgery beds. Well, in March, 660 general surgical beds in May only 213 because other beds were used for COVID-19 patients and you can also see that right now the number increased twofold as compared to May or April. Well here you can see the structure of the Republic Center for Surgery for Patients with COVID-19. That's hospital number eight. And uh, you can see originally we had uh, this uh, hospital for COVID-19 patients. It was uh, just uh, restructured for such patients right away. There are two surgical departments. Each department has 60 beds, altogether 120 beds. There is ICU for 20 beds, three ORs, and uh, we can provide uh, surgery for patients uh, with uh, cardiovascular diseases, uh, cancer, etc. So here you can see that each uh, hospital can be divided into the red zone and uh, the green zone. You can see the number of uh, patients uh, treated in a particular unit. And uh, you can also see that the number of patients uh, increased uh, with uh, every month. Uh, and in fact, uh, there are not so many patients uh, as you can see it uh, here. Well, we had uh, 95 patients uh, who have been operated on. Well, patients were transferred uh, from one surgical department uh, to another surgical department. Uh, and uh, you can see 69 patients uh, had uh, comorbidities uh, such as uh, diabetes mellitus, uh, 16 patients, uh, hypertension in 9% of cases, uh, CAD in 10 percent of patients uh, obesity in three percent of patients uh, stroke uh, in three percent of uh, patients uh, well usually uh, uh, these are patients uh, with COVID and all these comorbidities well here you can see the distribution of patients who were operated on with lung lesions on CT it can be up to 30% in the severe form, light form, up to 21%. Hospital length of stay, everything depended on the manifestation of the coronavirus infection. As a rule, they exceeded seven days. And here you can see the structure of different surgeries, mostly due to ischemia or gangrene of low extremities. Well, peritonitis, uh, 12 uh, surgeries, acute uh, appendicitis, uh, 10 surgeries, well, plus uh, some other surgical pathologies shown here. Well, here you can see the types of operative interventions. 
due to peritonitis, for example, they were prevalent in this case, more than 22%. And I have already mentioned this. Well, you can see that 46 uh, patients uh, were transferred uh, to ICU. The indications uh, for their transfer to the ICU was uh, acute uh, respiratory distress uh, syndrome. Well, this slide shows that these figures are basically the same as in case uh, with uh, standard patients without COVID-19. Well, here you can see some minor differences. First of all, the mortality rate of patients who were operated on with COVID-19 was uh, quite uh, high. There are different uh, reasons uh, such as acute uh, respiratory failure in most cases. And uh, here you can see those uh, complications that uh, the patients uh, had uh, resulting in death. Uh, again, one of the major reasons for death was acute uh, respiratory failure and multi-organ failure, which ranked uh, second. Also, this center at uh, hospital number 18 became the center for treatment of patients with acute uh, coronary syndrome. Originally, uh, there was a surgical unit of uh, 60 beds allocated for such patients, uh, ICU 37 beds. Uh, you can see the main uh, procedures First of all, due to CAD, uh, also and uh, vascular interventions. And uh, there was a specialized surgical department uh, allocated for this. There were also other surgical procedures. And uh, you can see uh, the number of patients uh, was not uh, quite uh, significant, uh, but uh, you can see colon cancer, acute appendicitis, uh, eight uh, patients, uh, well, are mostly like uh, cardiovascular diseases, uh, stroke, uh, etc. And if we look at uh, literary data, you can see that uh, SARS-CoV-2 results in a higher level of death the major risk factor of the development of post-operative complications and death is uh, coronavirus. That's uh, the major risk uh, factor. Other risk factors are known to you and the uh, post-operative complications uh, develop in 50% of cases. Uh, the mortality rate is uh, twice as much as compared to patients with the SARS-CoV-2 acute uh, respiratory syndrome in Patients who had been operated on amounts to 63% in the UK. The mortality rate after surgeries accounted for 23.4%. And this slide is prepared at the very beginning of the pandemic. So you can see that the number of uh, the infection rate uh, was quite uh, high. You can see it was uh, almost a uh, hundred percent uh, in medical staff who were infected with COVID-19, but that was only at the very beginning, especially medical nurses and anesthesiologists. Uh, that meant uh, at the very beginning of the pandemic of COVID-19, healthcare centers were not uh, prepared uh, to prevent the spread of COVID-19, did not have uh, enough uh, supplies and personal protective equipment. But now the situation has drastically changed. This slide shows 
the number of uh, beds in uh, different uh, centers and uh, hospitals in our republic. You can see in the first uh, half a year of 2019, as compared to the first uh, half a year of 2020, there has been a reduction in the number of patients uh, hospitalized. Uh, well, uh, as you can see it uh, here, and uh, usually, well, uh, the number of patients uh, who were hospitalized uh, in 2020 was 80% uh, of 2019, but uh, the mortality rate uh, increased uh, in inpatient hospitals. We analyzed uh, those uh, figures and believe uh, that uh, this uh, is uh, due to the fact uh, that uh, patients uh, who need urgent uh, surgery or emergency surgery, well, uh, uh, cannot uh, just get the specific uh, surgical care. Well, as for outpatient uh, visits, the number of outpatient uh, visits uh, was uh, reduced in the first half of uh, 2020. It's only 78% of 2019, but at the same time, there was a drastic increase in the number of uh, home visits. Uh, more doctors visited patients at home rather than patients coming to the clinic. And here you can see some of the proposals which I have already mentioned. Let me just uh, go through them once again. There should be emergency procedures conducted uh, in even in case of pandemic uh, COVID-19 because uh, it's a matter of life and death for the patient. As for elective surgeries, well, patients uh, with the suspicion of COVID-19 must be isolated. Uh, and uh, I think uh, that uh, there is a need uh, to provide the specialized uh, care. The need of use of personal protective equipment is a must. Uh, as for laparoscopic procedures, uh, well, we should be very careful to use uh, electro uh, quarters in this case. Uh, well, of course, uh, wearing personal protective equipment, uh, masks, uh, face shield, etc is of great importance and here you can see the picture of our hospital that's a specialized COVID center which I'm showing right now and you can see the opening ceremony of this COVID hospital the Minister of Health of the Russian Federation Mr. Murashka was at the opening ceremony there are specific uh, boxes uh, for patients, isolated wards for patients uh, with COVID-19. And again, unfortunately, uh, there was no surgical unit uh, in this COVID-19 hospital. And also, that's a second hospital which was built in Sterlitamaka within a 50-day period. Here, we already have the special surgery unit uh, for COVID-19 patients. All uh, the doctors are already working there and treat patients. Well, so we believe uh, that uh, the construction of general infectious hospitals is an optimal response to the pandemic, but uh, they should have uh, surgical departments with ORs. And uh, of course, uh, restructuring of hospitals is uh, the measure which is necessary to cope uh, with the COVID-19 pandemic. Infectious hospitals must have all the necessary equipment, including labs uh, to diagnose and confirm infections. Uh, also, there should be endoscopic uh, and uh, laparoscopic uh, technique. Uh, the equipment uh, must be as mobile as possible so 
so that it could be moved from one unit to another unit. And uh, of course, there is also a need uh, to increase uh, the number of staff because uh, medical staff uh, are working in very difficult conditions. They are worn out. And of course, we need to increase their number. In the conditions of the pandemic, there is uh, a need uh, to organize the specific uh, diagnostic uh, departments, uh, especially for non-invasive methods uh, of uh, diagnosis, such as imaging, such as ultrasound, CT, IVIS, MRI, etc. And in most cases, we have the special department uh, where we can uh, diagnose uh, an infectious disease or any infectious pathology. And uh, also there is a need to have original surgical centers uh, with the special equipment, uh, with the medical staff, uh, with specific safety measures taken. Thank you so much for your attention. Thank you very much. Uh, I have a minor question for you. Just uh, several questions uh, that came to the chat. Uh, if a COVID hospital and the patient is uh, in the hospital without any surgical uh, service and the patient has uh, emphysema or pneumothorax or something like that, uh, well, or hematoma, for example, what should be done with this patient if there is no surgical unit uh, in a particular hospital? Well, right, well, if you have a COVID hospital, but there is no surgical department there, well, we must uh, transfer such uh, patients to the surgical hospital for COVID-19 patients, if it's possible, of course. But uh, in most cases, it's possible patients will be transferred to the COVID-19 hospital where there is a surgical unit. Well, or a patient has uh, the acute appendicitis suspected so we make a diagnosis of appendicitis in a general hospital, but then the rapid test shows the patient has COVID-19. In this case, the patient will be transferred to the COVID-19 hospital with the surgical unit and surgery will be done there. Okay, thank you so much. It's uh, clear, colleagues, our first uh, breakout session has come to an end. I'd like to thank our speakers for their interesting presentations. We'll have a short uh, two-minute break. Thank you.
Good afternoon, dear colleagues. I am Mikhail Medicinsky. I am one of the technical organizers and I will be the moderator of the next session, which is devoted to the specialized surgical care under COVID-19. In this session, our experts will share experience of how they perform surgeries on specific indications and many of them under pandemia need dramatic changes. Specifically, we will talk about the oncological care, bariatric surgery, and our Indian colleagues will also share the experience on using that and our session would be started by Parvin Bhati, who is the leading specialist uh, on uh, the presentation global COVID-19 influence to the obesity problem. The floor is yours. You're welcome. Thank you very much. In God we trust all others must bring data. Today I am going to speak on COVID-19 and obesity. I bring greetings from Institute of Minimal Access Metabolic and Bariatric Surgery, Institute of Robotic Surgery, Sar Gangaram Hospital, and Bhatia Global Hospital and Endosurgery Institute, New Delhi. All of us know about COVID-19 that the first case was reported in Wuhan, China in December 2019 and WHO declared it pandemic in March 2020. Now obesity and COVID-19, it is a collision of two pandemics. And it has been seen that obesity aggravates COVID-19. And it many situations, severe COVID-19 patients have a higher BMI than the non-severe ones. And the hazard ratio for death in class three obesity, that means BMI more than 40 kilogram per meter square is of the order of 2.28. Why obesity and COVID-19 is a dangerous combination because both of them affect the inflammation and the thrombosis. Obesity is a pro-inflammatory condition and it is associated with high levels of pro-thrombotic factors. The adipose tissues in the body, especially in the visceral areas in obese patients, they have angiotensin converting enzyme receptors and they have a firm binding to the viral protein. So viral gets a portal into the adipose tissues and from the viral increased viral load because of the adipose tissues, the viral shedding continues for a long time and it affects the lung and the heart and ultimately leads on to multiple challenges, multiple complications because of the COVID-19. What is the risk of exacerbation of COVID-19 if the patient is obese and that is of the order of 2.31? And if the patient is having COVID-19 infection with diabetes, the risk exacerbation is 2.61. And if the patient is having hypertension, then 2.84. Now you imagine these obese patients, morbid obese patients have comorbidities in the form of diabetes, hypertension, heart disease, sleep apnea syndrome, and so on and so forth. Definitely the risk of exacerbation is multifold. Barry Popkin from University of North Carolina had reported that if a person has COVID-19 and he is or he or she is obese, then the patient person has 113% higher risk of hospitalization and 48% higher risk of dying from the disease than normal weight or overweight adults. I, this was a reported in JAMA November 2020 issue. And he had said that 
if you have contracted the coronavirus, you have more than double the likelihood of going into the hospital if you're obese and 50% more likelihood of dying also. This is a study which has been reported in Obesity Reviews August issue that they had a meta-analysis of 399,000 patients and it was seen that 113% more hospitalization. And if you are infested with, inf with the coronavirus, then some, and you are obese, then 74% more likely chances are there that you will land up in ICU and 48% chances are that one, one is more likely to die also. And in the editorial in Obesity Journal, it was reported that in US, especially in US, it, as compared to other uh, countries, the mortality rate has been high because of the prevalence of obesity of the order of 42.4%. And can you imagine in US, 9.2% of the population is having class three obesity. That means more than 40 kilograms per meter square. And that is the reason for having more mortality, more morbidity as compared to other countries also. The mortality association was stronger in young adults. For example, if the patient is age 50 and younger, with severe obesity had a 36% higher risk of death compared to their normal weight peers. So thinking is that admission, ICU, ventilation and death definitely increase if the person is having obesity. When in March 2020, the COVID infection started, then most of the researchers have found out that the risk factors are heart disease, lung disease, diabetes, male patient, and elderly patient. But after nine months, most of the studies have reported that BMI remains a strong independent risk factor for severe COVID-19 infect infection. Why it leads on to challenge? Because of the cytokine storm in the body. As I mentioned that adipose tissues, the virus will stay there and then the viral load will increase, viral shedding will carry on because there is an alteration in immunity in obese patients there is a it is a pro inflammatory disorder the obesity is pro inflammatory disorder then the cytokine storm sets in and that leads to death the cytokine storm affects the lungs the liver and kidneys and multi organ failures start because of the invasion of the immune system so in obesity facts, the position statement has been given by the obesity and COVID-19. The two sides of the coin have been reported. And in this, the main factors which are having the impact on COVID-19 and obesity can be classified into biological factors and the social factors. Biological factors, as we mentioned, that adipose tissues are rich in angiotensin converting enzyme 2 receptors. So the virus also has the affinity for these receptors and it becomes a good storehouse for the virus. Because of the pro-inflammatory cytokines, the low-grade inflammation, decrease in immunity status, decrease in pathogen defense, and especially obesity is a pro-thrombotic factors are there and it leads on to reduced fibrinolysis, the chances of morbidity and mortality are definitely higher. And in obese patients, it has been seen 
that the impaired ventilation, obesity hypoventilation uh, is there. And that is the reason of metabolic complications and increased cardiovascular challenges. And lot of learnings have been there from H1N1 infection and now from the COVID-19 infection. But the thoughts are the immunity is changed and especially in the vaccination part also when these obese patients used to get the vaccination for the influenza virus h1n1 virus then also the efficacy was not of the order which was there as compared to normal weight patients and especially the social factors are that patient is obese and if the patient is staying at home then also the chances of the risk are higher and in the hospitals also because of the beds not being available the ventilatory support the mechanical ventilation especially in prone position these are the challenges so one has to accept and that leads on to more complications in obese patients so as i mentioned vaccination for influenza virus also the two times greater influence of incidence of influenza and influenza like weakness illness was there being this despite being vaccinated in obese patients so one has to be very very careful in conclusion i would say that one, there is a correlation between the obesity and the COVID-19 infection. So one has to be very, very careful because of multiplicity of the problems. A million deaths is a statics, but one death is a tragedy. Thank you very much for the opportunity given to present on obesity and COVID-19. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much, Professor Parvin, for a very interesting presentation. Yes, truly, patients with obesity normally demonstrate a more severe cause of COVID-19 of coronavirus infection. About 90% of patients with CT3, CT4 with severe COVID-19 do have um, different grades of obesity. And now we are moving to the next presentation and uh, our Indian experts uh, continue sharing uh, experience of providing specialty surgery during COVID-19. And our next speaker is um, Dr. Avanish Saklani, uh, who is representing Tata Memorial Center Mumbai, guidelines for measurement of cancer surgery during the COVID-19 pandemic. So, Dr. Avanish, the floor is yours. Hi, good morning, everyone. I'm uh, Dr. Avanish Saklani. Uh, Professor Colorectal Surgery and Robotics at Tata Memorial Hospital. My topic today is to look at guidelines of cancer during COVID-19. I'll just start my presentation now. I am Dr. Saklani. My topic today is to present guidelines for management of cancer surgery during COVID-19 pandemic. COVID-19 has caused quite a panic in the world with increased number of cases and increased mortality. This is going to affect healthcare, especially cancer services. A report of uh, cancer mortality in three hospitals in Wuhan revealed of those patients who had COVID and were undergoing cancer treatment, mortality was as much as 25% with chest complications amounting for 50% or so. If you had any cancer treatment within two weeks of uh, cancer treatment and had COVID, the chances of having problems was four times as higher compared to normal individuals. So it is no wonder the uh, American College of Surgeons put forward guidelines to stop uh, elective surgery, defer or postponed. However, cancer was categorized as urgent or the 3A category apart from cancers like thyroid or estrogen receptive breast cancers. The ESMO guidelines were quite specific. They categorized cancer into high priority, which require urgent intervention in terms of bleeding, obstruction, perforation, or where the risk of cancer progression was more than, uh, than if you postpone the surgery. Low priority was for cases like thyroid cancer and prostate cancer. All the others remained in intermediate category. The ESMO guidelines for colorectal cancer were quite specific. 
uh, stating patient with obstruction, perforation and bleeding required urgent surgery. This could just be a stoma, uh, complete resection. Management of complications were also categorized as high priority. On the low priority list were uh, patients who were complete responders after chemo radiation or those uh, who were uh, metastatic cancers requiring biopsies. Prophylactic surgery for cancers were also put on hold. Based on these guidelines were published by Indian General of Surgical Oncologist for locally advanced colon and metastatic cancer, they decided to defer surgery until progression. They suggested new adjuvant therapy in form of oral capsibutam only. For rectal cancer, they suggested defer surgery till progression and to give new adjuvant therapy with oral capsitabine. Uh, short course radiotherapy was preferred over long course chemo radiation. Emergency surgery was still to be done, diversion stoma or resection of primary depending on findings. However, surgery was deferred for uh, pseudomexoma peritonei or those requiring IPEC. However, in the meantime, high grade appendicular tumors, mesothelioma, and ovarian cancer could receive new adjuvant chemotherapy. So on one side, there was the risk of COVID infection uh, in these cancer patients, and on the other side, was the risk of progression during cancer. The hospitals were stressed because they had to divide hospitals into three phases one for screening patients for cancer, one of those who turned of cancer patients who turned COVID, and the others for normal elective cases. So the number of beds for admission were reduced to a third, number of intensive care beds were limited. As there were no blood donation drive, blood transfusion was also difficult. So major surgeries requiring transfusion and intensive care facilities were put on hold. A well structured plan for a tertiary cancer center was performed at Tata Memorial Hospital. This required administration thing, a creation of core COVID-19 action group, in terms of cancer care, complex surgeries requiring blood transfusions and intensive care were postponed. Short course radiotherapy was preferred to long course therapy. In terms of patient directed treatment, all follow up patients were asked to follow have teleconsultations. For patients visiting the hospital, there were screening camps set outside where temperature monitoring was done. If they were febrile, they were referred to a fever OPD and put on COVID beds till the screening was done. There was strict restriction of relatives and friends. With regards to employee, high risk staff members for provide provision for paid leave. The staff were put in uh, rota so that there would be a fallback option in one team got mass quarantine. Hospital buses were allowed for transport of staff. Initially, only symptomatic patients were screened. However, a couple of weeks later, when the infection started surging, all preoperative patients underwent uh, testing of COVID-19 using RT-PCR. Those with positive or uncertain thing were either quarantined in the hospital or under home isolation. While the complete PPE kit was used for COVID positive patients in specially designated COVID theatres, uh, standard PPE uh, N95 mask and uh, visors and full protective gears were used for standard operative thing. Enhanced recovery procedures were encouraged. MIS procedures were done uh, using a filter, I think it's air seal or uh, to prevent aerosolization. Uh, early discharge from hospital was encouraged with telephone follow up. We looked at our uh, observation of uh, changes which happened during the COVID pandemic and we realized the number of outpatients decreased by 65%. Endoscopy came almost to a standstill with 90% dropped. There was a 200% increase in short course radiotherapy. So as you can see from the right hand side, uh, there were no robotic procedures, CRS, HIPEC or excentration done. But the number of laparoscopic procedures remained steady throughout this case. This is because we felt the benefits of MI surgery were more than the risk of COVID. We followed all the guidelines for MIS procedures in COVID times. Uh, they just suggested there was very little evidence regarding risk of minimal invasive surgery. However, the possibility of a viral particles in aerosol was there. Use of filters uh, while releasing aerosolized particle was suggested. We used either air seal filters or HEPA filters in mid-MIS. 
are laparoscopic procedures like both side incision were small as possible to decrease uh, leakage around the pores the pneumoperitoneum settings were set to about 10 or so uh, only standard surgeries were performed no extended resections were done uh, evacuation of gas was uh, done only with using a HEPA filter we tried to use an air seal system uh, the COVID-19 virus size wave varies from 0 0.070 to 0 0.07 microns. HEPA filter removes about 99.97% of this thing. Uh, the air seal system uses the ULPA filter which can clear almost all the virus. Uh, in about 350 procedures performed, almost more than 60% were MIS procedures. And uh, we are happy to say that none of our staff or uh, patients died of COVID during this time. As stated earlier, with over 350 patients operated, 60% were done in MIS procedures, and RAS protocols were followed, people had early discharge, and the specialist nurse followed them at home form. A guideline for minimal access surgery during COVID times has been published by Inter-Association of Surgical Practice. In UK, normally cancers are referred during the two-week wait urgent pathways, however, uh, this has decreased by up to 84%. A study looking at impact of this on cancer, on cancer survival was done. Each stratified and stray stratified 10 year cancer survival estimates for 20 common tumor types at age 30 years and older were used as reference for comparison. They calculated a 2 month delay in 2 week waiting referral resistant estimate loss of between 0.7 life years as per record patient depending on age and tumor. The impact was those was maximum with those with the red chart on the brain which seems to be uh, mainly for stomach cancers and brain tumors as well. Uh, a systematic review and meta-analysis published in BMJ earlier on had shown uh, delay in starting treatment can impact survival. Uh, in fact, uh, as you can see in the graph on the left hand side, for every four week increase in delay, mortality of bladder, breast, colon and head and neck increases. Similar thing works for uh, adjuvant therapy, either a delay in adjuvant therapy, either radiation or chemotherapy. For breast cancers, in fact, uh, de uh, details are available. For every delay, 4, 8 and 12 weeks, there are additional deaths of plus 10, plus 20 and 31. So obviously this COVID epidemic is going to have, have an impact on mortality. Besides the delay in treatment of patients who will operate in COVID times, uh, do they have increased mortality? An international multicenter comparative cohort study has been done of more than 9,000 patients in countries. The hospitals are classified as uh, cold uh, areas where everything was isolated including the patients, the critical care and theatres where compared to hot hospitals where such segregation were not available. So presently the mortality of elective cancer surgery in COVID times had a mortality of only 1.5% with 4.2% lung complication. In cold surgical units the mortality was low at 0.7% compared to the hot surgical unit of 1.7%, even the lung complications were lower. Uh, less than 2% of patients developed COVID during the post-op ward stay. Their mortality was high. In the cold unit, it was 11.5% with lung complications of 35%. However, in the hot surgical units, if you developed COVID, the mortality was 22% and lung complications 46%. So I think what we get to know is it's better to perform elective cancer surgery in specialized cold surgical unit with streamlined flow for surgical theaters, intensive care, and post-op stay. When we looked at our uh, outcomes of COVID-19 patient, we have, of 330 patients uh, which were screened, almost 30 patients, 36 patients turned out to be COVID positive. Every treatment delay was 28 days. Um, Almost 12 out of the 36 patients either had disease progression or died or uh, lost to follow. So almost 30% of these patients uh, could not undergo the planned treatment because of progression of uh, disease. Besides the other sort of patients like uh, patients who are for CRS hypec and exenteration who were not planned for surgery, their risk is still to be estimated. So I think uh, this has played a tremendous impact on cancer patients.
uh, and I hope we can do better in the future. I think the pandemic is still not over. I think with specialized guidelines now helping us and the fact that the virus seems to have mutated and is less infective, we can probably take on cancer care uh, quite well now. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Avanish, for a very interesting presentation. So conservative treatment of colorectal cancer and the options um, of COVID-19. We had a dedicated presentation in the previous session. So thank you very much for your amazing presentation. And now distinguished colleagues, we have some changes um, in the agenda. According to the technical reasons, Professor Ivanov will speak later and with Professor Avanish's presentation, we close our session. Many thanks to the experts for brilliant presentations. And also, we would like to thank um, our sponsors for the opportunity to uh, organize this event, because without their participation, it would not be possible. And uh, we would like to let our colleagues uh, know more about each sponsor. So please appreciate this information. Hexa largest manufacturer of disposable medical products, uh, important equipment with Hexa Medicals brands. They have their own production lines, full line production from material up to the finished products. The SKU list is more than 3,000, so this is raw material, this is material that is properly checked. Hexa was certified and allowed to be used in hospitals, meet international standards. Leading hospitals of Russia greatly appreciate the quality and the convenience of HEXA. So medical products of HEXA are uh, distributed through the trade houses. The company is located in Moscow region. And this is our contact information.
Здравствуйте, уважаемые коллеги. Меня зовут медицинская Александра Викторовна. Я выступлю модератором следующей сессии. Сейчас у нас небольшой технический перерыв. Мы ожидаем технического перерыва до 12.36 часов московского времени. Пожалуйста, оставайтесь с нами. Давайте встретимся на 15 минут. 15 минут перерыва. Пожалуйста, оставайтесь с нами.
Ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to speak to you for the next 12 minutes on our experiences and a brief look at literature on surgery in COVID times. My name is Roy Patankar. I'm Director of Surgical Services at Zen Hospital, Mumbai. This talk will take you through guidelines, through pre-operative workup, changes to OT and AHUs, concept and problems, surgical smoke and energy sources. This all began with these papers in May in the Annals of Surgery, which basically said that there was COVID virus found in the peritoneal fluid of COVID positive patients. Subsequent papers in Langenbeck's Archives and Surgeries and other journals say that in, even in positive patients, the COVID virus is not found. Another interesting paper in the Annals of Surgery looked at various different tissue from peritoneal fluid, omentum, and very interestingly, the COVID virus was only seen in the rectal wall and in the stool samples. Not seen in peritoneal fluid, omentum, duodenal wall, small bowel, appendix wall, gallbladder wall, bile or liver. We do know that diarrhea could well be a manifestation of a COVID infection. And it is important that particularly people like me who do a lot of lap colorectal surgery or endorectal surgery need to be extra careful of this issue. I'm to rely on some papers, and this is a paper in the World Journal of Emergency Surgery, a joint statement by the American Hospital Association and the American Society of Anesthesiologists and the American College of Surgeons, as well as an excellent paper on the inter-society guidelines published by four different Indian minimal access societies. So these are the basis of the guidelines that I'm going to give in my talk. Should we be using these fancy expensive surgical helmet systems? And the answer is a resounding no. No simple data shows any advantage of this. Anesthesia is careful. Keep 20 minutes between patients. Use regional as far as possible. Use only closed circuits and use intubation boxes with video laryngoscope that we can see. Need to think about scavenging system for the exhaled carbon dioxide and various things that we can do. This is two modifications we have done using simple HMEF filters as well as bleaching powder where the exhaled gases from the boils machine are put through a HMEF filter and then connected to a bleaching powder solution which disinfects the virus and then the exhaled uh, air is then put directly into our AHUs. So this is something that you need to keep in mind. This is a simple thing to do. There have been case reports and some data on acute abdominal crises in patients with COVID-19. And a very common problem is acute mesenteric ischemia. One of the two COVID hospitals that I own and run is a purely COVID hospital. And we do see patients coming with acute abdomen. So one of the most important things is enteric perforation. And the second is thromboembolic events causing acute mesenteric ischemia. And generally, the prognosis is guarded with a high morbidity and mortality. And there is a lot of data and literature about this. We published in July this year our own experience of two cases of enteric perforation, one ileal perf and one cecal perf in patients who were COVID positive. And both these patients had a stormy post-op course, developed a suppressed myocardial output and had a very high morbidity. So there is a, another excellent paper in, uh, available online published just three days ago in the, on 3rd of December, 2020, look at review of literature in acute mesenteric ischemia and COVID. One of the things that concerns me as a minimal access surgeon is the surgical plume or the surgical smoke that we give. Whatever energy sources we use, be it the cautery, the ultrasonic scalpel, the ligature, the thunderbeat, all of them have a surgical plume and important that we keep our settings as low as possible. Let's look a little bit about this surgical smoke. There is very little data that show that uh, the ultrasonic shears or the ligature or the thunderbeat can cause problems. I think this problem is overstated. These energy sources are extremely safe but I would suggest use, use them sparingly, use them in as low a setting as possible. For example, and in our hospital, we use the ultrasonic scalpel at one and five, as opposed to three and five that we were originally using. This is a, a, a compilation of papers with, done by my friend Dr. Deepraj Vandarkar. 
in all there are 106 articles looking at covid virus in surgical smoke and there is simply no data that to show that there could be any transmission like this i however must caution you by saying that absence of evidence is not evidence of absence the data however has been really on the hpb virus or the hepatitis b virus I've looked at a lot of data and perhaps the laser is probably the most risky form of energy sources in laparoscopic surgery. But I am very, very certain based on this article in surgical endoscopy, which looked at a thousand odd articles that laparoscopic smoke and COVID transmission is safer in laparoscopic surgery as compared to open surgery. And this article summarizes that. We do need to take care about problems of gas leakage in laparoscopic surgery. And this is an article that looks at gas leaks in washers. So our protocol on our hospital is to preferably use a Veri's needle. We do not use a Hassan trocar. Look very carefully at leaks in your washers before starting the case. All specimens are extracted after decephalating the abdomen and then make a gridiron incision to take it out. We keep our pneumoperitoneum only at 12 millimeters of mercury decephalate in a controlled manner, not by uncontrolled manner. Pay attention to your plastics and instrument disinfection. And we use a smoke evacuator in all our patients. And this is uh, added very much to saving OT time. Important, you designate a member of your surgical team for smoke evacuation. Minimize the use of drop down drains. And if you're using a port closure device, please make sure that you decephalated the abdomen completely do not use a port closure device with the abdomen insufflated because this leads to a lot of gas leaks. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. My email ID is roypartnagar at gmail.com. I would be happy to answer any queries you have on COVID and surgery in, in the course of this. Thank you very much to the AWR group and Indo-Russian group, including my talk in this. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Roy, for a wonderful presentation. Yes, truly, we have to mention that uh, safety of the team is a really very relevant topic, especially in pandemia. So thank you very much for a wonderful presentation. And uh, our session is continued by Dr. Jignesh Gandhi, who is a specialist in the endoscopic and open surgery of the abdominal, uh, anterior abdominal hernias. And he will speak about the uh, emergency hernia Hello everybody, we are going to talk about emergency hernia surgery. surgery during COVID times. I am Dr. Jignesh Gandhi, GI laparoscopic and robotic surgeon from Mumbai and I bring you greetings from my country and I am very happy to be part of this historical Indo-Russian meeting which is a joint venture between the AWR community of India and the Russian Surgical Society. I have no conflicts of interest in the talk. So this is the first ever historic meet, which is going to be focusing. And I'm sure you have heard many speakers before me and even after me, who are going to talk about this important topic. So we all know that we had the crisis of the coronavirus and it has spanned across the globe and created a lot of devastation for all of us. I was like this before the lockdown was announced in our country and post lockdown, this is what remained you know, this is how I look like and my identity was almost hidden as a surgeon and this is what I looked like in the OR, barely people could recognize, you know, who is who. So coming to the topic of COVID and hernia, in every patient we have made it mandatory that the imaging of the chest along with the abdomen should be done because we are going to cover up the abdomen for the hernia, the chest also should be done by doing a CT scan because RT-PCR, as we know, has a sensitivity of about 70%. Initially, there was a lot of fear about aerosolization and you have heard the experts also talk about it today. So open surgery was in vogue during the COVID times, but gradually we found out that laparoscopic surgery is the way forward because you can have a faster recovery and send patients early home. So in an event that if you have a second wave, we can go ahead and have more resources for our patients. One time definitive repair should be the solution. So if you have a potential contaminated or a dirty hernia, try and do a tissue repair. We should see to it that the patient should not be taken off for exploration again. 
try and use a uh, macroporous mesh even if you're going to do a clean contaminated case so that your acceptance levels are better an additional stay during the covid times is required because a lot of these patients who are covid and we are going to operate for some emergency hernia surgery can lead to a cytokine release syndrome which is also known as crs and we have seen crs almost going up to 28 days also post covid infection this was one of the tricks which we used for aerosolization in our department and you can see here i have used the electrosurgery and i've used a small simple suction catheter attached to it so whatever are the aerosols liberated they will be taken care through this this was me during the covid times that i could do an eta pars on this hernia very very comfortably but what happened was because of the lockdown people were staying at home and they came in with a lot of complications so during covid times this is what a lady the first case which i'm going to present she came in with this big hernia there which was blocked and you could see that the overlying skin changes which were quite bad which was telling us that there was underlying something which was not looking very healthy there was a gangrene skin and even on part of the omentum on the ct scan which was looking stuck there in addition to this this patient also had liver cirrhosis and ascites so technology came to our rescue and then i could use this open system for an icg in this patient because i didn't want that post repair this patient gets any kind of lipocutaneous necrosis because obviously it was an open surgery so this is the way it looks on an icg when you give uh, indocyanin green and you use this special device you can see the flap how nice and vascular it looks like the blue line represents a good vascularity this is a lower flap which is also seen nicely on the fluorescence uh, imaging technique and you come to know that there's a good vascularity in both these flaps because this kind of images give you a lot of assurance that real time you can judge the lipocutaneous necrosis whether it's going to come up or not come up in this kind of patients this is again the same flap seen in a different mode this is after the defect closure you can see there is a green represents good blood supply and you can see the edge of the skin everywhere that also shows you that there is a good blood supply in that area this is after the mesh placement so in this lady it was a momentum which was dusky so we decided to give a wash there and i could put in a macroporous mesh as you can see in the picture here and post that you can see that the edges of the skin are nice and green this again tells us that there is a good vascularity in an event that you don't find this green line you can revise it because in covid times we do not want the patient to come back again to you so this is a picture of the patient before and this is after and how technology in covid times helps us to perform open surgery in a better way so that we can assess vascularity properly and use technology to avoid re explorations because we don't want patients with covid or during covid times to come back to us again this is again another case who had a skin erythema as you can see there the overlying changes of the skin so obviously we knew that we had to go ahead with an open surgery and we found this loop of the bowel there which was looking very very bad and on further exploration and taking out you could see there was a band of constriction and this is the unhealthy mesentery which had a blood clot indicating that there was a mesenteric thrombosis this patient underwent the bowel resection with anastomosis so in such patients when you are doing a controlled anastomosis the choice is up to you whether you're going to use in a macroporous mesh or you're going to do a tissue repair both of them are acceptable another lady who was waiting during the covid times with this big hernia and also with the stoma closure so again uh, there was a problem uh, because she used to get repeated episodes of pain so finally we decided her to take up for the surgery this is a result post operatively she had a very large hernia so we did a covid test with rt pcr in this patient along with the hrct test uh, chest so that both of them together help us for 100% sensitivity closure of the stoma because it was a planned case with a proper bowel preparation did a bilateral tar or a transverse abdomen is release in this patient and i put in a large mesh of 50 cm by 50 cm which is now available under trials in india because it was a huge defect and the most important part in such big surgeries is that you need dedicated team members everyone who is trained in this kind of complex awr procedures should be washed up for the case because then what happens is the time taken for the surgery goes down significantly and you can have better outcomes so this is the size of the mesh which is 50 by 50 cm probably the biggest which is available in the market in the world today another case who had a combination of an umbilical hernia and also a left recurrent hernia this patient then we uh, did it with an eta pars technique because i didn't want to have too many incisions so from the left side approach 
creating the entire reef sopas plain this both the hernias were tackled together with etep rs repair so this is what uh, is a decision making which helps in covid times which patient should go for open which patient should go for laparoscopy should be balanced properly so the hernia mission unlock give priority to the patients who have irreversibility and complications so these are the patient who should come up for surgery first the second is patients who are admitted during covid times and now are coming to you they should also be given a priority the third list of priority should be for patients whose quality of life is affected and we have devised a scoring system so all those patients who are now coming up during the unlock mission to get surgeries done we are keeping a scoring system to decide which patient will be prioritized for a hernia surgery so that we do not have uh, a lot of patients coming in at the same time and laparoscopic approach i think is going to be the way forward because we can have a shorter stay more beds available so that the patients can in case we have a second wave uh, during the second wave of covid we can have more human resources and more beds available for these kind of patients this was a dream of the past but now i think with the social uh, distancing norms this is going to be very very difficult <clears throat> this is one of the workshops where me and my colleagues have conducted the hernia training program live training on site and we do this very frequently under the awr leadership but this is going to be a dream uh, of future this is my awr team in india i thank all of them and each member including dr ramanna and all the able leaders under whom i have been doing my awr work successfully for last couple of years and these are my point of contacts on my email or my youtube channel or on whatsapp so any case for discussion for any of my russian colleagues i'll be more than happy i thanks once again the organizing committee of the indo russian the russian team as well as the indian team to give me this opportunity to share my views on emergency hernia surgery and covid times thank you very much for your patient hearing i'll be very happy to answer any of your questions thank you very much thank you very much so this is great demonstration of a model technology so thank you very much for that and we are also very grateful to our experts that beside the discussion of particular questions they are ready to cover some particular issues of emergency surgical practice in covid specifically dr arlov um, is already who is representing udin city hospital will share his experience on the successful surgical treatment of late complication of Crohn's disease in COVID pneumonia. The floor is yours, Professor Lov. The floor is yours. Good afternoon, distinguished colleagues, friends. I'm very happy to welcome all the participants of the conference about the surgical care in pandemic COVID-19. My name is Dr. Arlov, and I'm happy to make uh, uh, this presentation. So by now, in COVID-19 pandemic, our main deal building on Udin Hospital is not reallocated for COVID patients. We still continue working as standard hospitals, so we are doing elective surgeries through observational rooms and also elective surgeries of the patients who are referred uh, from the emergency. So this is a successful uh, treatment of Crohn's disease in pandemia COVID-19. We have to say that uh, in our patients, uh, it's not profile uh, in the inflammatory bowel disease. Yes, we face complications and we provide emergency care to the patients with particular complications. So let me remind you, Crohn's disease and so-called terminal ileitis or granulomatous enteritis, regional terminal ileitis or transneural ileitis, so all that are quite complicated diseases with not clear uh, uh, etiology. Normally, the treatment is provided by specialized centers like ours um, in Moscow City with different rate of success. Epidemiology is very well known. So this is... Uh, uh, mainly 20, 30, 60, 70 years of the patients. Um, so we faced the case of 34. So that is quite prevalent in the population. We are using Monreal Crohn's disease classification, which is presented here. The treatment of this disease, mainly conservative, 
definitely surgery can be indicated. So the choice and the type of conservative or surgical treatment is guided by the length of lesion and severity of the case. Well, surgery, this is normally complicated Crohn. So here are the cases for surgery. These are indications. If conservative is not effective, in case of uh, surgical complications in strictures, um, in the obstruction, bowel obstruction, in the total uh, colonic uh, lesion, so colectomy can be performed. And regardless of the treatment, the relapse rate is still very high. So from 28 to 45 percent of patients do relapse within five years and up to 60 percent of patients relapse about 10 years. So that means even after the surgery, patients still have very high risk. They require continuation of the conservative treatment. So in this conference, I would like to present our case. So this is a patient age 32. IT specialist who was administered to our clinic, uh, so with very big pain syndrome, uh, no nausea, vomiting, uh, no stool for two days. Um, and we know from the medical history that patient has Crohn disease for 15 years, not effective conservative treatment. So 10 years ago, total colectomy was performed with further complicated post-op period. So duodenal fistula, that is relapsing, that was relapsing um, and periodically opening and closing. Uh, so actually, by the moment of admission, patient had malnutrition. By Montreal classification, this is A2, L3, L4, B301. So when we performed the uh, radiological examination, we saw multiple level colloidal cups, um, obstructions, so mainly they relocated to the left segment. When we performed CT with um, IV contrast, we appreciated features of adhesions. Also, in the left nasogastral area, we saw abscess. Uh, fistula. So we drained the fistula and we got about 300 milliliters of purulent discharge. So surprisingly, uh, we observed. Uh, so ho we hope that after the resolution of the purulency, so the syndrome will resolve. But the next day, the patient uh, worsening. So we performed fistulography. We found formation, mass, and again, obstruction. And uh, the patient uh, was referred for emergent surgery. So we performed um, obstructive resection. We eradicated acute bowel. We removed bowel obstruction, then ileostomia, also sanation of the purulent cavity in the left nasogastral area. So post-op period was very difficult in the patient because patient uh, demonstrated external duodenal fistula and uh, we had big losses of about one liter of small intestine fluid with a leak into the abdomen we performed multiple sanation laparotomies. Also, we made an attempt uh, endoscopic duodenostomia in order to uh, remove duodenal content, although we saw a very severe maceration of the skin in the anterior abdomen, big blood losses and big losses of the small intestinal fluids. And we made a decision to have secondary surgery so we performed a very severe adhesiolysis. We mobilized small intestines with difficulties, technical difficulties. Also, we selected duodenum. We managed to close fistula. We mobilized uh, duodenum by pocher. Also, we closed duodenal fistula and re restored the integrity of the small intestine uh, with stomas. So next day, 
So we saw the uh, small intestine uh, discharge by drain, again, was uh, failure of uh, the previously. So resection of the small intestine with eunostoma post-op period was again quite difficult, challenging, but this time already with positive dynamics. Patient was in ICU unit with systemic inflammatory reaction, which was regressing. And one month later from the day of the administration, the patient appeared to be PCR positive for COVID-19 and patient with already healing process. The patient was uh, referred to the COVID dedicated clinic, Filatov clinic, because patient had COVID associated pneumonia. And in that case, it was bilateral viral pneumonia COVID-19. So on CT, you can see quite advanced involvement. This is CT2, CT3. So patient uh, for three weeks was in dedicated hospital. Then with negative PCR on COVID-19, patient referred to Udin Hospital for prolongation of treatment. Patient was continuously complaining on nausea and vomiting. Patient had malnutrition. And when we performed CT, abdominal CT, in the left nasogastral area, we saw abscess. And you see it on CT, this is pigtail. We performed the puncture and the drain of the abscess cavity. When we performed the contrast passage into the gastric, into the duodenum, into the small intestine, we did not see any obstruction. So the lesion was sonated, pigtail removed. The lesion healed with the secondary tension. Before the discharge, we performed a rectoscopy where we identified granulations and pseudopolyps in the rectum and reduced uh, lumen of rectum. That means a relapsing disease, a relapsing Crohn. So two months after the start of the disease, patient was discharged in satisfactory condition for further rehabilitation and systemic treatment. Patient was really had malnutrition, could hardly move, but uh, hoping that he's rather young and uh, with the previous treatment, we have good hope for the complete recovery because of surgical complications of Crohn's disease. So patient recovered. And uh, based upon this clinical case, we can say that we can take some learnings from here. All the patients who are administered emergently to the emergency hospitals, they normally have a very high probability of being infected and also high probability that it can be infectioning inside hospital. Although the treatment was done completely in epidemiological safety, actually the hospital is uh, seeking to the safe COVID hospital vector, but nevertheless, we could see that in the intensive care, there are cases of viral pneumonias. So from here, we can conclude that in case of development or suspicion of viral pneumonia in the patient, so there is a need of daily or weekly lung CT, then PCR diagnosis, and if the disease is not typical, and uh, uh, if we need some extra activities between the hospitals that are dealing with the emergency care to the patients and also hospitals um, that are dealing with the treatment of patients with COVID-19. 
So we had um, a really a very good consequence of treatments in our hospital, uh, other hospitals. Uh, we have good connections with our colleagues, fill out of hospital, and this is successfully demonstrated by this case. So thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much for the presentation of very interesting case. Thank you very much. And uh, we believe that um, it's very important um, to discuss um, the treatment of such multidisciplinary diseases, complicated diseases like Crohn disease and complications of that. So thank you very much for that. And we do proceed our session and the next presentation would be made by Dr. Shara Sharma, who is the expert from Fortis Hospital, Navi, Mumbai, with a presentation of acute abdomen in COVID-19 from triage to surgery. The floor is yours. You're welcome. Today I'll be talking about acute abdomen in COVID-19 from triage to surgery and share some of my experiences. I have no conflict of interest. My ER case mix from March onwards has been inflammatory diseases like cholecystitis, pancreatitis, appendicitis, abscesses, then obstructions, bowel obstructions, small bowel perforations, diverticular disease, hernia obstructions, incarcerations, and intestinal ischemia and abdominal trauma. My case distribution, mainly the chunk was anorectal, gallbladder, hernia, cancers, and small bowel. And about 22% of the 300 odd cases that I operated were COVID positive. 60% of my work was emergency. And the 40% of elective work was symptomatic. Most of my elective work was symptomatic patients. The question I would ask in ER is, is the surgery mandatory? If I do not operate, will the patient survive? Can the patient have long-standing disability due to non-operation? Also, does the benefit of surgery outweigh the risk? Now, the surgical indications are always independent of the presence or absence of COVID status. Certain principles that I would follow is, one, sound surgical judgment. Second is to optimize the patient care resources. So COVID is a, an extremely burdened system in the hospitals and we need to channelize the patient care resources. Utmost importance is to preserve the health of the caregiver so that they can stay safe and always follow a multidisciplinary approach to treating the patient. Knowing the COVID status is important and we should know that 80% of the patients coming to the ER may be asymptomatic. So they may be COVID positive, but asymptomatic out of which only 20% may end up being symptomatic. So doing an oxygen saturation, getting a rapid antigen test, RT-PCR, X-ray and HRCT will ultimately get you to know about the COVID status of the patient. HRCT is important for a surgeon and it's a reasonably quick way to identify a COVID suspect. The hallmark is the bilateral peripheral ground glass appearance. 90% of COVID negative patients with positive CT findings will subsequently turn COVID positive. A CT chest should always be preferred by the patient irrespective of the status of surgery or no surgery. We need to offer the safest and the least invasive treatment to the patient. So if an operation can be postponed without increasing the risk, that should be the way to go. We can also choose minimally invasive procedures for non-traumatic abdomen like aspirations or pigtailing. Now, non-operative treatment for acute cholecystitis, appendicitis, diverticular abscesses is well known. We can also have uncomplicated intestinal obstructions which can be conserved. I have also conserved perforated peptic ulcers with localized peritonitis. Of course, all this needs to be done under strict monitoring. And the moment you find that the patient is deteriorating, you have to change to an operative management. The surgical algorithm in extreme emergency would be easy. So you need to consider delaying the urgent surgery if the patient is exhibiting symptoms of viral infection like fever, cough, and sore throat. Suppose non-operative management is not possible, then at least wait for the RT-PCR. In case even that is not possible, then you consider the patient or presume the patient to be COVID positive and proceed with the operation. Suppose you are operating a patient in incubation period. Well, the patient may develop 
symptoms in immediate post op period that is first thing second is there is a higher chance of ards the patient might end up in icu and there is also an increased rate of mortality in such patients but of course when we are discussing increased rate of mortality and morbidity they are patients who undergo complex operations but beware even simple forms patients of covid are not best candidates for surgery now surgical outcome in covid patients may not always be bad so if you are taking care operating patient in regional anesthesia doing a minimal procedure like an aspiration under local anesthesia or a pigtail drainage and you are also avoiding a general anesthesia and intubation you might have a good outcome even in a covid positive patients but it is important to detect these diseases early do a timely intervention and also follow a good post op care so that you can have a good surgical outcome you may also have a very sick covid surgical patient so the patient may be severely hypoxic may be on anticoagulation therapies with multi organ dysfunction now these patients are extremely high risk for any kind of surgical procedure you need to get in your co surgeons the intensivist pulmonologist the anesthetist discuss with them the outcome of surgery or non operative management and ultimately you have to discuss with the family members and you have to counsel them tell them about the medical treatment tell them about the outcome or the high risk of surgery uh, high risk of death during surgery and once everyone agrees including the relatives you can go ahead and start the treatment now abdominal sepsis does it influence the evolution of covid well, that is not entirely known but we know that factors which have poor prognosis in covid like copd cardiovascular diseases diabetes and obesity can also have poor outcomes in abdominal sepsis it is obvious that a grave source of infection coupled with covid can have a fatal outcome now progressive respiratory failure itself may make surgery difficult and a non operative treatment can be suboptimal and itself can have serious outcomes and we will never know whether it was the covid or the sepsis which took the patient down should we do a laparoscopy or open in a covid patient well there is enough evidence to suggest that covid is present in peritoneal fluid so you can find the rna in peritoneal fluid but it has never been found in the surgical plume and the surgical smoke or the plume composition is same in open or laparoscopy so i would say that laparoscopy is as safe as a open operation only thing is we need to have a proper smoke evacuation technique i would not discourage laparoscopy if it benefits the patient an informed patient consent and a family member consent is most important we need to explain that there is higher morbidity and mortality if the patient is covid positive we also need to explain on and have a consent for non operative management of a covid positive patient we should tell them that there is a possibility of developing covid in case the patient is covid negative when the patient is admitted in the hospital or even in the immediate post op period there is in fact possibility of the patient developing covid infection even at home also very sick patient relatives need to be told about the outcome of surgery or non operative management in such patients we need to prevent contamination of the medical team so abdominal surgeries are extremely high risk for covid transmission we need to have negative pressure ors the personnel need to have full ppe protocol we also should have the minimum or staff which are required for functioning in the ot the anesthetist need to use intubation boxes video laryngoscopes and the surgeon need to enter at least 15 to 20 minutes after the intubation has occurred please prefer open surgery whenever feasible and in case we are doing a laparoscopic operation do consider smoke evacuators you must know that covid rna can be present in all body fluids so obviously tracheal secretions and saliva there is 100% of the times covid rna is present but in the blood 10% of the times in the feces 66% of the times you will find covid rna in peritoneum 
or peritoneal fluid, the COVID RNA is found 100% of the times. And the risk of contamination exists even in asymptomatic carriers. So at all times in OR, we need to follow a level three kind of a PP protocol. Another category of patients is the ICU. So finally, we come to patients who are having abdominal emergencies in the ICU. So these patients can be suffering from COVID infection. They are on anticoagulant therapies and they are on steroids. And they present with various abdominal infections, perforations, perectal bleeds, hematochezias, rectus sheath hematomas, and bowel ischemia. So all this mix I have seen from the ICU, which is I feel more than what I have seen during non-COVID times. To conclude, my dear friends, I would say that COVID infection has a big impact in surgical ER admissions and outcomes. We need to have sound surgical judgment and the surgery needs to be thoughtful and you need to have the whole interdisciplinary team coming to take the decision. It's very important to have informed consent from the patient as well as the family members and protection of the medical personnel is extremely important so that we keep them safe and healthy. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, um, Sharad, for sharing your experience. And the next team is led by Professor Strzelecki and they will speak about the emergency surgical treatment in COVID hospital. Uh, the presentation would be made by St. George's Hospital, emergency surgical treatment in COVID hospital. The floor is yours, you're welcome. Good afternoon, distinguished colleagues. On behalf of Dr. Strzelecki and on behalf of the team of the surgeons, we are welcoming all of you. Well, unfortunately, some emergent situations uh, did not let our lead to make this presentation personally. So today I'm sharing our data, our impressions about the ER surgery in the COVID hospital. <clears throat> so in pre-COVID time, In St. George Hospital, uh, this is a multi-profile hospital, 579 beds. So vast majority, uh, there were surgical beds. Also, there were some therapeutical beds. We provided specialized care on the following indications, surgery, traumatology, purulency, gynecology, urology, cardiology, and uh, also <coughs> beds, patients with strokes, and ICU. So our clinic had nine ORs, including one uh, endovascular, endovascular operation room. March 16, 2020, we were reallocated like infections hospital to provide care to the patients uh, with uh, <clears throat> pneumonias and from April 30. So, so this is providing care to the patients with a new coronavirus infection. So from March 16, all elective hospitalizations and surgeries were stopped. So working under these new conditions, um, it required some changes in the structure of our hospital. <clears throat> so that was a dedicated order that changed the number of beds so 479 beds plus 36 beds of ICU. Okay. From October 10, we see 48 ICU beds, 418 <coughs> oxygen units, CT 128 scans. We lost 100 beds. This is gynecology and traumatology because they did not have oxygen. And in these departments, we have a clean area. Correspondingly, these new conditions, they require the extension of ICU features. 
So now they are using as uh, ICU beds. Now anesthetists and nurses and surgical nurses, all medical sources are working in the ICU, in the OR territory, in the OR facility. In the most difficult moments, we can place up to 75 ICU patients. during the pandemic, which reached more than 10,000 patients, and also some of them were referred from other hospitals. Almost 10% of those who were admitted, <clears throat> or one third from those who were in ICU, only almost 1,000 patients required prolonged mechanical ventilation. Correspondingly, we understand that for a period of pandemia, we dramatically reduced and changed actually the structure of the surgeries we performed. All the surgeries only on the emergent or life-threatening indications. So totally 903 surgeries, abdominal surgery, bureau and surgery, urology, gynecology, traumatology. So just few laparoscopic cholecystectomies, 12 laparoscopic appendectomies, uh, 11 uh, colonic obstructions, 14 uh, hip replacements because of um, femoral neck fracture, 10 emergent revascularization of um, lower limbs vessels. <clears throat> the main volume, main surgeries were tracheostomas, 74 endoscopic interventions, endoscopic hemostasis. So these are new conditions, new realities. It required new approaches. So two most important things. This is safety of the patient. So we are trying to reach better results due to the reduction surgical time reduction of anesthesia time. So main idea is to avoid mechanical ventilation, treatment of choice. This is general or combined anesthesia with the control of uh, gaze exchange. And in majority of the cases, surgeries are done in the mechanical ventilations. So regional methods of pain killing is possible. Although uh, the practical use is limited due to the use of anticoagulants. So safety of the patient, <clears throat> safety of the personnel is also a very important aspect because the most precious what we have now is the stuff. So using PPEs, it's a must for all of us. We try to minimize surgical time, to minimize the contact. So in the OR, only minimal number of people to minimize dispersion of biological fluids. We are trying to refuse from uh, ultrasound detectors and electrocoagulators during open surgeries. We're trying to reach uh, complete sealing. And also we are using the system of um, smoke eradication using video laryngoscopes during intubation, minimization of dispersion. So our understanding has great importance because uh, in the process of our studies, we found out the presence of the virus almost in all biological fluids. And here is <clears throat> abdominal effusion, and the virus also can be excreted from the gut. So the most frequent procedure we performed is tracheostoma, and the option of choice is puncture dilation tracheostoma with video endoscopic navigation. 
methods, pretty safe methods. We create external tracheal fistula in ICU patients who require prolonged um, ventilation, so minimal risk of complications related to the bleedings with anticoagulants. And as we said, we are trying to reduce dispersion of viral particles into the air. <clears throat> I have to mention also the specificity of flexible endoscopia. So in conditions of new coronavirus infections related to the high risk of contact with viruses with unavoidable formation of aerosols in air. So we are trying to refuse from uh, fiber optics uh, using video systems. So additional PPEs here on the screens and minimal stuff during the intervention from endoscopic methods here you see a vast majority were all types of endoscopic hemostasis so in terms of viral involvement and also using anticoagulants we need that clinic should have all possible tools to perform endoscopic hemostasis. We would like to share our observations, yet very limited, but still very interesting. During preparation to this presentation, we saw thrombotic complications of the new coronavirus infection. We also saw massive hemorrhages, soft tissue, and in retroperitoneum, in a number of patients and, and with the medical collection, there was no trauma. So soft tissue hemorrhage, big one, unexplainable because uh, the coagulation parameters were absolutely normal. City picture of this massive hematoma of the <clears throat> retroperitoneal space not related to the kidney so prolongation prolongation of the bleeding so we cannot explain such hematomas because all these patients again i repeated they had normal coagulation parameters with the prolongation of bleeds we had to perform surgeries and then the rest the situation was resolved with conservative management so summing up summing up I would like to say that in the COVID hospital, we can say that what is important is adequate anesthesiological solution and individual assessment of respiratory patients' potential. We speak about the reduction of surgical time. We're speaking in favor of many invasive approaches to reach very precise hemostasis and to minimize formation and uh, transmission of so-called viral aerosol. As Confucius used to say about three pathways to knowledge, pathway of thinking, this is most generous pathway, the uh, pathway of imitation, this is the easiest, and the pathway of experience, which is the saddest. So we have to confirm that we passed three, through all three of them. But I don't know whether we approached the knowledge. So the life will show. And at the end of my presentation, I want wish all of you sincerely stay safe, stay health. I would like to wish you a successful Congress and once again for this opportunity to speak up today. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Strzelecki. Yes, incredible work was done uh, for the organization of the medical care for COVID-19 patients. And the next presentation would be made by Dr. Sarfaraz Baig, who is the GI surgeon, bariatric surgeon, who is a chief doctor of Calcutta Clinic, with his presentation about the urgent gastrointestinal surgery's collateral victim of COVID-19. The floor is yours. You're welcome. Hi, this is Dr. Sarfaraz Baig. I bring greetings from Digestive Surgery Clinic, 
which is based out of this beautiful hospital Bellevue in Kolkata in the eastern part of India. Today I'll be talking about urgent GI surgery and how it can be affected due to the COVID-19 pandemic. Here is a case of a 32-year-old male who presented to us with deep jaundice and fever. On an ultrasound, it was picked up that he had multiloculated liver cysts, which is probably hydrated, which is not an uncommon disease in this part of the world. The CT scan showed that there is a large multiloculated hydrated cyst. The difficult part was that almost entire liver was damaged and only 20% of functional residual volume exists which is why we were not surprised when the liver function test returned with a report of 28 milligram per dl of bilirubin so that was deep jaundice and almost 60 percent of that was conjugated suggesting that much of this jaundice was due to obstruction and some of it was due to hepatocyte injury the liver enzymes were extremely elevated and so was the INR so we started treating him for the coagulopathy and while we were contemplating for urgent optimization and a semi-emergent liver surgery to decompress the entire liver so that whatever liver is left can be saved, his COVID-19 report turned to be positive. We did a CT thorax and that showed us ground glass opacities at the periphery. Now there was a dilemma. On one hand we wanted to do a liver surgery urgently so that we could decompress the cyst and save the residual liver and save the patient from going into an acute liver failure. On the other hand, we realized that this patient also needs a COVID treatment and there was a pneumonia brewing. Therefore, doing any surgery would lead or had a high risk of a post-operative respiratory failure. We were aware of all the reports published from the world that in a COVID positive patient, the mortality of doing a surgery is high. Bearing all this in mind, we thought that we might decompress him through a radiologic technique. The interventional radiologist opined, since this was not a unilocular cyst, a multilocular one, and there were hundreds of these, it was not going to help this patient at all, and there might be a risk as well. So, we started him on an anti-COVID treatment, keeping the liver profile in mind and using ivermectin, in this patient with uh, vitamins and this patient was uh, also given antibiotics considering that some of the jaundice and fever must have been due to the cholangitis uh, because of the disease and we started him on al albendazole which is the specific therapy for the hydrated cyst we also gave him lactulose some B complexes as a part and parcel of liver supportive treatment Fortunately, in the next two weeks, his CT thorax started showing resolution of the COVID lesions and he returned as COVID negative on his RT-PCR. His bilirubin, however, during this waiting period of two weeks had shot up to 32. His liver enzymes were very raised and so was his INR and he was started to getting drowsy, suggesting an encephalopathy. So here was this patient where waiting had led him to a situation of acute liver failure. And now we were facing a situation where we thought, where have we gone wrong? Was waiting a bad decision? Now we started optimizing him again for his liver failure. And we, we thought that as soon as we can get his coagulopathy in control, his drowsiness and his ammonia levels back to some normalcy, we would, we would go for a surgery and decompress him as quickly as possible and anticipate a liver failure in a stormy post-operative period. And with this counseling, we did prepare the patient and we counseled the family and we proceeded to doing a surgery after a few days of optimization. We did not want to do a minimal access surgery in this patient because he wanted to go in quickly and finish the surgery quickly to reduce the anesthetic exposure to this already liver damaged patient. 
So once we entered, we can see that we aspirated the fluid and confirmed the hydrated and we could put in the scolicidal agent in this patient we use cetrimide and having done that we could open the cyst and evacuate uh, the uh, evacuate the liver from all the cysts with uh, soft forceps as well as some indigenous technique like using the spoon so it has been our experience that if there are multiple cysts which are so small that do not uh, come out of a good suction as well a good idea would be to scoop it out from the depths of the liver cavity having done all that we put in a mop inside the cavity and surely we did expect this there was bile stain in the mop this was anticipated although we could not demonstrate this in the MRCP due to the huge cyst but we anticipated there would be a biliary communication if looking at the interior of the cyst also suggested that there was bile staining we did have a plan of uh, exploring his common bile duct and with a lot of difficulty in his prohibitive additions we could reach the bile duct and we could uh, put uh, we could clear it with a Fogarty catheter both the top and the bottom to be sure that we are not leaving any hydrated daughter cyst in the bile duct that would lead to a biliary fistula and we also did a sphincterotomy in the, with this balloon on table. Thereafter, we put in a T-tube in this patient and uh, closed the abdomen with one more drain inside the biliary, uh, inside the liver cavity. There wasn't any of the omentum to use as capitonage technique and uh, because this patient was so asthenic, so we were happy just putting in a large wide bore drain. This post-operative recovery was smoother than we had anticipated and his bilirubin started coming down slowly. So did his little bit of uh, fever and his drains uh, from the liver cavity started coming down from 400 ml of bile from the first post-op day to about 20 ml in the next two weeks. And his T-tube uh, drainage also reduced from 200 ml to 10 ml in the next six weeks. So when we got him in six weeks, we had a patient something like this. He was recovering, he was getting better, and uh, his uh, liver failure was disappearing. So uh, this was a patient who ultimately did well. We were all very happy. So was the patient and the family, especially the father, uh, who thought he had lost his son. And we also thought we probably we would lose this patient. Uh, the message that we get from this patient or the lesson as you might say is that the COVID-19 infection has altered the treatment of patients who otherwise require emergency surgery. The multidisciplinary approach towards this problem is what is something that we are learning. There are continuous and dynamic discussions between the surgeon, anesthetist and the other physicians who are involved. And a good decision is something that we do not know what it can be defined as. Uh, while we look back at this case, since it turned out well, we also know and realize that this case could have turned out to be on the other side. We may have had to lose the patient. So uh, there are so many options in treating these patients during a pandemic. And uh, I, I think philosophically speaking, we come to one decision, and that is everybody is right and probably no one is wrong. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks very much, Sir Faraz. And we thank uh, time and again our Indian experts for such an interesting uh, presentation, for this opportunity to have an exchange of opinions. The next to speak is Dr. Om Shri Shastavi, uh, uh, so he also works in Mumbai, and uh, so he will speak about the COVID-19 lessons learned by the task force. There are several uh, with aspects the to operating a patient in the midst of the COVID pandemic that should be examined, and I am going to be dwelling on this part in six compartments of how surgery should be approached in times of COVID. Uh, my name is uh, Dr. Om Srivastav. 
I practice infectious diseases and immunology in Mumbai. Definition of elective surgery is pretty standard. Surgery that is subject to choice. In patients who are COVID positive, elective surgery is planned only in those situations where delaying surgery may lead to complications of which some of, may, some of them may be life-threatening. For instance, coronary artery disease with critical arterial blocks, emphysematous cholecystitis in a situation where the gallbladder may rupture due to an infection are some of the examples to be used in this kind of situation. There are other descriptions of surgery where there are boundaries and parameters that can be used to define as to what surgery can be delayed. For instance, surgery which is defined as low acuity surgery where the, the patient is healthy, the disease is not life-threatening and it could be done as an outpatient surgery. You, you are advised to postpone uh, such a surgery or time it for a more convenient situation for yourself and the hospital. Those surgeries which are low acuity surgeries in unhealthy patients is also advised to be performed at a later date. There are those situations which have got an intermediate acuity in a healthy patient is also a situation where surgery should be postponed. <coughs> And in the following three categories where there is intermediate acuity surgery in unhealthy patients is also considered to be a situation which can be postponed. In situations which are high acuity in a healthy patient is a, a situation where you are advised not to postpone and the same applies for a high acuity surgery in an unhealthy patient that will need to be done in a hospital and not postponed. These are, these are by and large general guidelines about how you define which kind of surgery must be taken up as an elective surgery and which ones of these are, are uh, so surgeries that you cannot postpone must be taken up as an emergency surgery. Okay. If you look at the cone, the red cone in the slide, in a healthcare system where there is no strategy. There is going to be those situations where the high number of deaths from the pandemic, there is also a high risk of non-pandemic deaths from lack of surgical services or ICU beds. This is a situation that comes out of little or no planning and no execution. That is why boundaries for surgical procedures in COVID patients are outlined. If you look at the next two cones, the yellow cone, which is the suppression, the green cone, which is the mitigation, and the rest of the path that there is followed by a strategy like this, there is always going to be a lesser number of deaths. There are always going to be lesser number of critical ICU admissions and much more recovery that may be followed up for all such patients. This is why it is important to have a strategy of operating on COVID patients which may be classified as high risk, middle risk and minimal or no risk. To reiterate the point that I was making in the previous slide, there is merit in classifying surgeries which may be urgent or emergency or ones that can be either postponed for a later date or done as outpatients. All this risk stratification leads to outcomes that are going to be beneficial for the patient and do not uh, impose on the healthcare system the, the burden of an emergency surgery with a high mortality or high risk of complications that may actually keep the patient in hospital for a longer period of time at a higher cost and possibly with potentially fatal complications. So there is some wisdom in trying to segregate those surgeries into 
based upon their risk into high risk, low risk or, or middle level risk and planning them accordingly. And that then brings me to the point as to which is the test that you are going to do on your patient. How do you interpret it? Is it completely accurate? Right. So I'm going to divide this part of the diagnostic testing into three parts, which is the, the molecular test, the antigen test and the antibody test. And what do each of these tests mean? Each of these tests can be done by either a swab that is taken from your patient's nose or his or her throat. Some of them may require, especially the antibody tests, may require your patient's blood sample. But otherwise, a throat swab should suffice. So when you do a, a molecular test, especially the RT-PCR test, it is something that is going to be giving you the test inside 24 hours time. It's actually a fairly accurate, fairly diagnostic, in fact it is the gold standard and it will tell you that whether your patient has active COVID or not in most instances. I'm going to qualify that at, as we go on further. What it will not do is it cannot show you if you ever had COVID or were infected with the coronavirus in the past. That is different to the antigen test. The antigen test is much quicker, it will take one hour or less and that a positive result is usually accurate, but a negative result may need to be confirmed with a molecular test, especially if your patient is displaying symptoms. And the antibody test, again, is something which is a blood test, uh, can be uh, taking as little as one, sometimes as much as three days, and that it will show you whether your patient has antibodies in their system. But also important to point out that an antibody needs to be what is called a neutralizing antibody. If it is not a neutralizing antibody, it is not going to be offering any protection to your patient's system. And that simply having an antibody is not enough. So tests should be looked at in giving you that result of a neutralizing antibody. So none of these tests are 100% diagnostic. Some of them have got what is called a false negative, which can be as high as 30 to 40 percent. Some of them can be a false positive but that is a much lower percentage between one and two or two and a half percent. But none of the tests are 100 percent. They have to be interpreted in the context of where your patient is and if there is any doubt you may need to be seeking the assistance of other diagnostic modalities like a CT scan of the chest or repeating the test again. Now there are clear directions again that are about the pre-op or the day of surgery or post-operative gestures or actions that need to be taken by both the surgeon and in the anesthesiologist in preparing such a patient. What are the recommendations for what needs to be done on the day of surgery and the day after the surgery or while your patient is recovering? In the part where your patient is recovering after the surgery, there is now a growing role of a virtual kind of discussion where you don't need to be at the patient's bedside all the time because you will be in your HOSMAC suit or your, or your PPE gear. And that a virtual consultation will do about the same amount of information gathering for you that it would in case you were at the patient's bedside. So a lot of things have been modified in a way where you could be performing the same thing with the same results without actually having to be at the patient's bedside. So again, in terms of segregation of such patients, there would be those patients that will necessarily need to be admitted in a hospital for their procedures. There will be those patients that can be kept elsewhere outside a tertiary care hospital if their surgery is not going to be as an emergency surgery and that there is a role for monitoring such patients in in Mumbai we tend to do this a lot in COVID care centers where patients are not sick enough to be inside a hospital but not well enough as yet to go home COVID care centers are all across in the city of Mumbai and a lot of such patients have been looked after in those places 
with very good results but it requires a very competent team that follows a clear set of boundaries in the community so that such patients also recover from their surgeries and do not pose a threat of having any community transfer of such infections in the time that they are being in the in the post operative period and so other sets of questions that i keep getting asked is is there a role of taking something while i am dealing with covid positive patients that will prevent me from getting the infection even though i may be completely in my gear my pp gear so is there a medication that i can take there have been a lot of papers evidences that have been published about whether this kind of agents can be used in preventing an infection unfortunately none of these medications that are listed on the slide have been used in a randomized controlled trial or have been peer reviewed so that they can stand scientific scrutiny where one can say that yes there is evidence that if you were to use any one of these medications you are going to be preventing the chance of getting covid and so amongst the the number of medications that have been discussed and spoken about is there a role of hydroxychloroquine or chloroquine or is there a role of ivermectin or doxycycline or drugs like immunomodulators immunoglobulins and several other drugs some of which were touted to be very promising just about 6 months ago but have fallen by the wayside the problem there as i have already mentioned is that there is not a single randomized controlled trial that can that can say with certainty that this drug as a prophylaxis is good for preventing covid the other question is if indeed you are going to take any one of these drugs how long will you take it and what is the dose so since we don't know any of these things they are best left for the time being for mainstay treatment some of them have been approved some of them are not but other than that other than treatment there is not a great deal of role for prophylaxis of any of these drugs and that brings me to the other major issue of operating on covid patients what are you going to do with contamination of the operating theater which is actually a major cause of nosocomial infection and so good hygiene practices in hospitals and in operating theaters is mandatory it's not just required it is mandatory to make sure that post operative nosocomial infections not get transferred from one healthcare worker to another so those are strict policies that need to be implemented each time your patient comes out of the operating theater so which is the best agent that should be used in these situations to decontaminate your theaters and sterilize surface areas which may or may not have been used by covid positive patients there is a role of all of these agents you could use isopropyl alcohol or alcohol you could also use sodium hypochlorite the evidence about sodium hypochlorite is quite clear that most bugs are going to perish when there is 1.5 to 2% of sodium hypochlorite and that that is something that is used in a number of situations in a number of institutions to ensure that the theater is then decontaminated and cleared for the next next lot of patients the question again is what is the duration for a healthcare worker to be kept in isolation in case he or she becomes positive while tending to a covid positive patient as i was mentioning a little while ago there is very little evidence that the virus is lasting for any more than 7 days and in patients who are on ventilators for the virus to be being shed for any more than 10 to 12 days and therefore to keep a patient like this in isolation for any more than 14 days does not serve any scientific ends and that most of that any process after that is only about the anxiety that comes out of the policy maker and not something that is evidence based so these are questions what we knew 8 or 9 months ago is different to what we know now we know much more 
but in spite of how much we know we don't really know a great deal about covid and then that brings me to the one question that i'm sure all of us are dealing with how do you decide in somebody who continues to be positive for the rt pcr in the absence of symptoms or viral load for covid-19 how do you decide when is it safe for this kind of person to be coming back into the workforce or to be shifted out of the hospital and kept with non covid patients in the ward in the in the document that came out of who in the month of june or july this year the evidence is abundantly clear that the presence of the virus beyond the 15th day after the infection is that most people will be shedding less than 5% of the virus there is also the cdc guidelines that came out about 5 days ago that people who are covid positive may require to be isolated for no more than 7 days so again this is a reflection of a changing kind of evidence policy based on evidence and that we are also learning as we go along as to what is the best time frame for such patients please remember that in people who have crossed the 15 day period after their infection where the rt pcr continues to be positive it may well reflect that such a person is shedding the dead viral particles rather than live viruses and so that may be a false positive in this situation where you may think that the patient continues to be rt pcr positive but is not actually and is shedding only small bits of the viral particles which are present in a patient system from the first infection and does not necessarily represent a new infection so interpretation of this kind of a test is is something that requires an infectious disease specialist to be around uh, to look at what is the evidence and then give a clear guideline as to how this kind of test should be interpreted if indeed the test is positive in a patient or a healthcare worker beyond the 15th day of symptoms and again i am coming to the last bit of planning for surgeries in the era of covid what kind of road map should be kept for patients who are going to be operated if and when covid gets over there needs to be abundant amount of caution because the last thing that that any healthcare provider is going to be happy with is an outbreak of covid in situations where other people will get affected simply because it was premature to admit a covid positive patient to operate a covid positive patient or to put somebody who is covid positive into the intensive care unit of a hospital it would have to be a gentle process it would have to be a process where you take small baby steps before you embark on regular operating duties and performances of surgeries in a, in a situation which is in the post covid era or at least in in a situation where covid does not have the same kind of presence or urgency in our lives that it has at at this time and i am going to conclude my talk here by quoting somebody i admire quite quite uh, admirably somebody who is somebody who i quote quite frequently also abraham lincoln had this to say that the key to good public speaking is that you should have finished speaking before your audience has finished listening i want to thank all of you for a very patient hearing i'd like to thank dr ganesh kandhi and the organizing committee for giving me this opportunity thank you mm thank you very much dr om for a very uh, substantive uh, presentation and also for the demonstration of those uh, pathological changes uh, uh, taking place in this surgical care and now we turn to the next presentation dr uh, samir rich um, so and he will speak about the conservative treatment of uh, acute abdomen lessons learned good morning everybody so uh, we're uh, all ears from mumbai uh, and yeah. are being given a difficult opportunity as a surgeon to talk about conservative management 
of acute abdomen during the present pandemic of covid the let me check yeah so i would like to have first as there is no concept of interest uh, as everybody is aware the covid uh, infection of sars originated in the province of hubei from china and was declared pandemic somewhere around february to march of 2020 uh it had a transmission from human to human and the main spread is possible because of respiratory secretion some there were controversial reports of uh, the spread because of feces and also through fomites uh as a surgeon are we are concerned about acute abdomen or emergencies where we require to operate so when we have a transmission from human to human because of either respiratory problems or because of secretions are we supposed to operate all these patients who present with acute abdomen if we are going to operate are we subjecting the medical paramedical and even the surrounding patients with a risk of spread of infection if we are going to operate a patient what would be the prognosis of that patient and what would be strategies if we have to operate or even conserve to decrease the transmission and improve the prognosis this is what i am going to talk about so when we talk about surgical patients any patient who comes in surgical department they are either covid positive or suspected positive now these patients who are positive they have a varied range of respiratory complications and they can have thrombotic complications and hence if they are covid positive they they may require icu backup or icu admissions they have propensity to go on ventilator and very high mortality rate second category of patients who belong to high risk who may not may or may not have symptoms but they have a history of travel last 14 days or have a history of contact with covid positive patients in last 8 to 14 days these patients may develop symptoms and they are treated as high risk they are suspects or they can they can be just a carrier third category where we have low risk patients where they do not have any symptoms neither they have any exposed uh, exposure to covid patients neither they have any history of travel so when when we consider all these patients when we categorize all these patients you one one has to remember that transmission is via aerosols possibly in laparotomy even in laparoscopic surgeries which has been uh, documented by the barbers which they who have found a high concentration of uh, this virus in peritoneal fluid and if we have to operate these patients as a grade 1 with covid positive or suspect they would have high perioperative mortality and morbidity that would be not only for patients but even for medical legal concerns this was about the patients what is the surgeon or paramedical staff would have once they have they, they once they operate on covid positive or a high risk or maybe a intermediate risk patient uh this they, they get exposed to this kind of infection and if a medical or paramedical staff suffers an infection they it, it produces increased burden to the healthcare system as these surgeon paramedical staff or the nursing staff may be required to be quarantined and may also require further treatment so that that would be the the the, the medical staff would be out of circulation for maybe 14 to 21 plus days so what procedures what would require the higher rate of transmission they are aerosol generating procedures as endoscopy maybe laparoscopic surgery which you offer on bowel and surgery is very required to have bronchoscopy or they is concerned with aero digestive tract so when we classify any patient coming to surgical with acute abdomen uh, they have to either be categorized before offering any treatment they should be either immediate they were for patient who require immediate treatment some people require urgent which is expedited and who can actually wait for an elective surgery so this is a list of the surgeries possible where you can emergency surgery in life threatening where you have exsanguination of hemorrhagic shock have acute vascular injury patients with aortic dissection compartment syndromes emergency cesarean section patients with septicemia with recurrent fasciitis and peritonitis and of, of course non settling of bowel obstruction uh patients as appendicitis and cholecystitis yes they will may require urgent treatment but however i will discuss with you how do they can they can be conserved because we do not want any spread to any of the either surrounding patients neither to medical and paramedical staff patients with open fractures that they can be conserved with splinted 
and may have some other methodology where you can still conserve a fracture. However, when you have acute nerve injury, the tree can be splinted. Wait, we can wait till patient has a proper workup and then subjected for surgical intervention. Uh, when you talk about emergency, if a patient with bowel malignancy, with, with acute emergency comes, still an attempt should be made to delay the surgery, evaluate the patient, assess the risk versus benefit ratio of doing an early surgery versus a delayed surgery. If they settle with, the, with conservative treatment, they can be still offered with uh, uh, conservative uh, new adjuvant or an additional chemotherapy. When we talk about uh, this acute abdomen, this uh, SARS-CO2 uh, virus is able to enter gastrointestinal the epithelial tissue. Uh, and these patients can have a heterogeneous or, the, or maybe subtle in cases. The, and usually the clinical features can be overlooked. However, the patients can present with acute abdominal symptoms, which can be caused by acute abdominal pathology independent of COVID area. Now, when we talk about these symptoms, they, they may be typical as well as atypical, which we can be missed as laparotic findings. However, a good amount of uh, viral load has been detected in the stools as well as peritoneal fluid of infected patients indicating active replication in GI tract. And hence, any surgical, uh, any general surgery or GI surgeon who is uh, going to intervene in any of these patients should be very careful using and should use a protection care. Now, symptoms vary really from acute abdominal pain, which can be localized or generalized. They can present with vomiting, diarrhea, fever, and maybe loss of appetite. A good amount of study where you documented uh, one in five cases of COVID patients with uh, abdominal symptoms, maybe uh, may have only abdominal symptoms, has been documented in about more than 2,000 patients with, uh, from China. Now, when you are approaching an acute abdomen, you always have a high suspicion of uh, uh, the COVID symptoms. So uh, the patient has to have, you should have a detailed history, uh, whether any history of exposure to any, any of the patient or travel and understand the chronology of symptoms. Preferable to have a swab, RT-PCR, antigen test in any way, all patients rather, but definitely not suspicious. Uh, when you are dealing with acute abdomen, try and attain a diagnosis with whatever imaging what you can have, just to have a, the, the, avoid any discrepancies in clinical diagnosis. CT and MRI, when if you're if you're telling a computerized tomography, preferable to do a the chest CT scan also, just to know the, the Conrad score. So that, that that would prognosticate the patient depending on the, if you have really you have to intervene this patient, you may be able to be in a clear position to prognosticate him. So if a higher CT scan the score of Conrad which has a positive correlation with abnormal coagulation. So it is not only a, the patient may go on ventilator, but they can have the abnormal population after surgery or intraoperative surgery, patients can bleed. And hence, if these patients should be tried, attempts should be made that you can delay the surgery, or if you can conserve them, it will be still better. Viral pneumonia with conservation has bad prognosis than long loss prognosis. This would be better for us to understand if we have to prognosticate preoperatively any of the patients. Now, the, the other factors which can influence the prognosis may be respiratory failure, increased ventilator requirement, patients can go on ARDS, they can have thromboembolism, the, they have infections, arrhythmia, renal injuries, electrolyte dysfunction, and important to understand that these patients can also present with symphor, severe lymphopenia and liver cell failure also. More, common, common acute abdominal cell uh, signs, what we have seen is uh, they may mimic appendicitis. With uh, right electrolyte of pain, they can have clinical features as appendicitis, but however, they can have uh, diarrhea. It's, it's always preferable to have an imaging. Second common uh, presentation, what we have seen is ischemic bowel disease. They, they have pro coagulable state, they are causing bowel ischemia and perforation. However, no problems in abdominal and skin pathology would be seen in these cases. Uh, there have been documented uh, on conservative management of acute appendicitis, uh, very well documented in a journal. And also, where they have documented the uh, conservative management of hollow viscous perforation. The, the patient was, the, the drain was placed under UAG guidance, patient was kept nil by mouth, and then the, started the, the gradually on liquids and was maintained with uh, the fluid replacements and antibiotics. However, and patient was successfully discharged after 21 days. So when you have, when you know that patient has uncomplicated appendicitis, 
you can attempt by keeping the patient with, uh, under observation with antibiotics and then subsequently when the either the, the patient becomes low risk or when the, the pandemic allows you to do elective surgery you can operate for a internal appendicectomy a perforated appendicitis it's preferable you could drain under local all the drains under percutaneous guidance and drain the collection so that again subject to any subjected for internal appendectomy intrastitial obstruction try and give a good conservative with nasogastric decompression antibiotics and fluid management follow viscous perforation if it's localized patient is stable preferable to put drain under uga or percutaneous guidance and optimize the patient if the patient settles well and good However, if you can delay the surgery, the surgery patient is uh, has good viral load and decreases down the load, and then patient can be subject to the it can have better prognosis for the patient. Patient with diabetic colitis and pancreas, obviously they would be, be preferred for the conservative management. However, if patient with acute colitis in a severe condition where you are suspecting either uh, gangrenous appendicitis, uh, gangrenous colitis. or maybe a localized perforation it's always preferable you try and put a percutaneous cholecystectomy under uh, ultrasound guidance and may may, may delay the, the surgical intervention for at least maybe 4 to 6 weeks till that time patient can recover either covid part and also you can optimize the patient so when we then when this is a protocol what we follow for acute appendicitis to uh, which is uh, which is optimal option the where you reduce the risk of surgery the owing to covid and also we already with the risk of transmission to medical and paramedical staff so uh, if you have to admit any of the patient you are considering the patient or either operating patient in this covid uh, high risk group preferable to keep them in single room isolate the patient sanitize well and have good amount of disinfectants around uh, preferable all the, the medical and paramedical staff who visiting that area should have personal protection gear uh, they have been used at all instances and preferably the need the lobby should be with negative pressure so the, what lessons we have learned is first is the, when the surgical acute abdomen comes the try and have a thorough history and understand the history of contact or travel categorize the patient preferable when you are taking trying to do any of this uh, intervening in any of this patient interrogating this patient try and uh, have your protection gear of you have your respiratory uh, mask up and uh, isolate the patient sanitize them and uh, always wear this protection gear categorize all this patient and understand what the surgical risk would be confirm the diagnosis understand what would be the risk versus benefit ratio of surgery and conservative management if you have a, the uh, hrct on the test you can definitely understand what is the conrad score which will tell you about prognostication if you have any acute collections or any any, any the collections where the, they would may they would require uh, surgical intervention uh, understand whether you can do a percutaneous uh, method or a minimal access method where you can decrease the septic septic load you can uh, do a damage control procedure so that you can delay or or postpone the surgery for some time have a good monitoring on the patient even if you are on the patient and always 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 assess the risk of the benefit ratio before definitely considering any major surgical intervention with patient thank you thank you all thank you very much sir uh, for the demonstration of your experience in the treatment uh, tactics uh, Uh, so and we are happy to introduce another presenter Igor Ivanov director general uh, of the institute of uh, rozdravnadzor uh, it's uh, the system of management uh, uh, in the healthcare uh, uh, organizations of the russian federation so uh, good afternoon dear colleagues First and foremost, I would like to thank uh, for this opportunity to address the audience and share my uh, 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 materials. Uh, and I would like to put an emphasis on the work uh, conducted by uh, the National Institute of Quality of the Federal uh, Service of uh, uh, Pit Surveillance uh, in the uh, area of health uh, when it comes to the quality management in the health uh, uh care 
related facilities. When we speak about quality and safety, for instance, when we uh, I mean uh, uh, when we start to speak about this, uh, it means that there is some uh, reason to do that. If something was uh, uh, off uh, the uh, routine practice and uh, we failed uh, to achieve the results that we initially planned, in that case, we, uh, we pay uh, uh, close attention to the issues of quality and safety and try to find out what went wrong and uh, what are the reasons uh, behind that, behind this or that incident or um, accident. Um, so it should be pointed out that uh, all too often uh, uh, we are uh, kind of dealing with risk uh, uh, associated management rather than manage risk per se. And uh, it means that the Institute on, on Quality is trying to develop uh, such a uh, system into healthcare facilities that would make it possible to manage risks and not just uh, uh, work as, as usual, not business as usual. Uh, so the fact is that healthcare uh, should not be hazardous to anybody. This uh, uh, seems to be a pretty clear premise, premise and uh, it goes without saying but regretfully healthcare delivery is associated with the host of risks and it should be pointed out that from the viewpoint of safety the probability uh, of uh, uh, risk uh, associated incident or unsafe healthcare is 100 times higher than the probability of being the victim of an air crash or let's say, uh, suffered from uh, a man-made uh, uh, disaster, let's say, on the uh, nuclear power plant. That's why uh, medical activity is uh, a high-risk activity. And uh, uh, the healthcare workers involved in this process, they should uh, pay uh, a keen attention to the issues of quality and safety in their routine activities. Uh, it goes uh, without saying that the answer to the question, to which extent uh, we can make the risk management uh, and uh, minimize them and make them optimal, I mean, uh, uh, the uh, achieving of results and the associated risk, and the answer could be as a standardization as the basis for quality management. And when we talk about the quality of medications, so we uh, use the GMP uh, rules uh, uh, or, or when we speak about the quality of the medical devices, these are the ISO standards. Uh, but even here, one can find uh, uh, industrial or sectoral standards and we can subdivide them into two large groups. I mean, medical standards, these are the international medical standards so there are 38 uh, uh, such standards all in all in the world. They have been accredited in the international organizations on uh, quality in healthcare. There could be national standards uh, that work at the level of just one uh, individual country. And uh, there could be also uh, countries that may develop their own requirements on the basis of their national subtleties and national culture. Uh, uh, and uh, in, but the pivotal uh, aspect, uh, no matter these are international or national standards, it's the list of requirements and rules and the management uh, quality management system is based on them. Uh, and the standardization of those uh, processes that uh, health uh, care organization is implementing since 2015 upon the request of Ross Zdrav Nadzor. So we have, our institute has been dealing with the issues of the methodology issues of the quality issues and uh, uh, introduction of qual uh, quality requirements in healthcare facilities. Since 2015, we have developed a, a whole portfolio of medical recommendations meant for the 
uh, hospitals and it was the first version of such recommendations for outpatient facilities uh, and also for the lab uh, facilities uh, uh, now we have such standards for uh, polyclinics uh, let's say or dental care uh, uh, outpatient clinics uh, there is a new version of these guidelines for uh, the medical organizations let's say with uh, 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 kidney problems uh, or those on uh, uh, dialysis uh, so now we are developing similar recommendations for the ambulance uh, <coughs> services and also uh, the, uh, separate versions for oncology for gynecology for psychiatry because all of these domains they have their own uh, subtleties and we have to account for all of them and uh, so because there could be highly specialized uh, uh, quality management system what about the <clears throat> uh, recommendations of rostram nadzor in this slide you can see a comparison uh, between uh, the such <coughs> proposals of rostram nadzor and also uh, uh, jci standards and also <clears throat> nsqhs australian uh, st standards so if you uh, prefer it you can also look through them uh, and if you have a closer look at these uh, the chapters and what they are talking about you can see that the proposals made by the restaurant Margot, it's not the translation of just one single standard because when it comes to a recommendation of restaurant Nazor, there are 14 different standards behind them i mean uh, available uh, on uh, at the international level and uh, we have <coughs> certainly made this kind of a selection uh, if we uh, if we have a look at the basic principle of the jci standards they are reflected in <coughs> different uh, recommendations of rosdrav nadzor in terms of safety and they can be compared to the national uh, standards uh, but the practical recommendations, it's an independent document adapted uh, from the viewpoint of international requirements, but it, uh, all, it is also considers all the mandatory requirements placed to healthcare uh, 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 organizations. Uh, so here we can use QR codes. Uh, so in order to uh, get and familiarize oneself uh, with the hospital with the polyclinic with the medical lab uh, so they are all uh, in the public access uh, free of charge and you can have a look at them and use them in your everyday work in 2016 we started to introduce these uh, recommendations in different regions of russia we started from four uh, subnational borders uh, from six uh, healthcare organizations. Now there are more than 40 subnational bodies more than uh, uh, that are implementing these recommendations and uh, another 52 organizations uh, they have uh, uh, proved uh, uh, that they are com com that they comply with these uh, requirements. Here there are the results of the external assessment. Uh, well, I mean, uh, that they comply with the requirements of Rasdram Nadzor. Uh, as you can see here, uh, there is only one section that belongs to the green area. This is the blood transfusion and its components when it comes to the blood safety and blood uh, products. All other uh, sections. Uh, so you can see that uh, they still have uh, a lot to do to meet the requirements. Uh, so, uh, regular uh, medical institutions, there are thousands and thousands of them in uh, the Russian Federation. They have all the relevant certificates, the personnel has undergone training, but <clears throat> we can see that in these uh, medical organizations, there are quite a number of risks uh, that nobody uh, uh, is coping with nobody manages those risks starting from the chief medical officer and uh, his or her subordinates but uh, this is just an example how standardization works in this country uh, uh, well within certain uh, framework so what is well organized here 
the first thing, there are clear-cut rules uh, that uh, include uh, a very detailed description of what has to be done in, in order to uh, provide for the safety. And the second component, uh, it's a fairly serious control uh, in order to uh, be really sure uh, regarding uh, provision of safety. Standardization is possible in this country, uh, in our healthcare organizations, uh, and uh, this uh, uh, section is just a confirmation of my words. Uh, all other, <clears throat> uh, so, well, chapters, they are uh, not uh, ranking uh, high. It means that in these organizations, there are a num uh, quite a lot of uh, unmanageable uh, risks. It means that the healthcare system and the health uh, the facilities in view of the uh, uh, COVID-19 pandemic, <clears throat> so, and the personnel, they closely correlate uh, with the relationship given here. <clears throat> this is epidemiological safety and surgical safety. Uh, so only one fourth uh, corresponds to the requirements. Seventy-five percent fail to meet the requirements regarding uh, surgical safety. This is a very serious sign, warning sign. Uh, also, when uh, implementing the quality management system and implementing Rosdravnadzor uh, recommendations, we can uh, try to. Uh, 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 work out uh, the uh, uh, we can find out the disadvantages is the domination of the archaic approach to the uh, control and search for uh, so-called uh, those who have to blame and uh, uh, of course this is not uh, uh, the way to do it because if uh, somebody makes mistake we should not punish those people but we should try to find out the reason and rectify the situation we also have such a problem like the lack of qualified managers in the healthcare system, including quality management and the contingencies on the practical issues, and lack of transparency and the low effective system of collection and uh, uh, keeping record of statistics, low level of validity of the infection of the information produced and low effectiveness of resource management. <clears throat> so, because uh, there are quite a lot of patients suffering from infection, nosocomial infection, uh, uh, and this is uh, no good at all, after all, because, and it goes without saying, uh, this, uh, this problem uh, is being silenced uh, or hushed, and uh, if we uh, just uh, do it this way, we shall never solve this problem. It has to do with this, uh, many other lines of activities. Uh, so, uh, uh, so because uh, we, without such a system, uh, it would be very problematic uh, to uh, work out uh, a system uh, to rectify the situation. The low efficacy of resource management, this is also related to the healthcare facility, uh, healthcare delivery. And it's another serious risk factor. So there is a structural and functional approach towards healthcare delivery. And uh, let's say ignoring a process and approach. Um, and so we should, uh, there must be a proper continuity and interrelationship between different processes. Because if this is the case, then everything is fragmented. And this is, of course, uh, due to the safety and quality management. Here you can see the results of audits, let's say, for surgical safety. Uh, so, and these are really vulnerable issues when it comes to healthcare delivery. Is the organization of the system of surgical uh, care uh, as uh, one of the competencies of the healthcare facilities, the preparation for elective services, uh, surgeries, is the provision of safety in the perioperation peri period and provision of safety in the post-op period. The most successful are uh, those uh, requirements when it comes to compliance with those requirements. Let's say a provision of safety before 
transferring patients from uh, 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 the uh, uh, operation uh, department to, to some other departments after operation. Uh, so uh, all others, uh, so they are still uh, um, require much improvement in order to provide for proper uh, surgical safety. When implementing the quality management system uh, and also practical recommendations uh, uh, related to surgical safety, uh, uh, so uh, there are a number of uh, techniques and instruments. Uh, uh, so, and uh, uh, they make the process of healthcare delivery to be really well coordinated especially when it comes to surgical patient management. And uh, this makes it possible to improve the level of quality and uh, uh, proper healthcare. So here we can see some positive changes in those organizations that they have implemented this uh, surgical safety uh, component. This is due to clinical uh, in, uh, <clears throat> indica uh, indicators of the uh, surgeries. Uh, this, of course, improves the safety level uh, and uh, this reduces the number of, uh, <clears throat> let's say, urgent cases. And uh, uh, at the same time, the number of complications uh, that happens here. So here you can see the results of... So these are results that were obtained in a very difficult, different organizations in our country upon the practical guidelines of Rosdravnadzor. And the results are very impressive in the organizations that uh, really confirmed the implementation of the meeting and um, demonstrate high quality and safety. <clears throat> quality and safety. That's the most important competitive advantage of the medical organization fighting for the lives of the patients and definitely patients selecting the organization which is a minimum safe, that is also has particular modern and national international quality standards and definitely and also meets the needs, meets the needs uh, of the patients. Uh, So wrapping up my presentation, I would like to sum up. To deal with the issues of quality and safety should be done not when you are already in the take not situation, but daily, routinely. And finally, your current activities in the quality management, quality assurance, the safety of the medical activity should become your routine, should become your routine practice. And in that case, medical organization can definitely be switched from the risky management, which in fact are the majority of the medical organization into the manageable risk area, where the most optimal low level of risk is obtained when you provide high risky medical care. So distinguished colleagues with that, I would like to thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Igor, for a wonderful presentation. Yes, the issues of the quality and organization, quality and quality assurance are very important. And we do proceed our session with the presentation of Anatoly Zavrajnov, who is Doctor of Medical Science, um, Chief Surgeon of SOGAS Medicine, and this is kidney transplantation in COVID-19. Anatoly, the floor is yours. Good afternoon, distinguished colleagues. I will switch into the full screen mode now. So, good afternoon once again. My presentation is done from the oldest clinic in St. Petersburg, which is Marinsky Hospital. And this is a team of doctors who is ready to share their experience in the management of the patients with transplanted kidneys under the COVID-19 period. Unfortunately, 
pandemia influenced dramatically the organization of um, donorship in St. Petersburg. So we have 12 centers of donorship, um, but currently only four of them are working. So in five, six that are adapted to that, transplantations can be done. So how pandemia influenced the number of effective multi organ collections, they dropped down almost three times versus previous year. So that influenced also the number of transplantations as well, both cadaveric and relative in the hospitals of St. Petersburg. The biggest challenge of kidney transplantation under pandemia is properly studied. And uh, first of all, they are related to the issues of transmission of virus with the donor's organ, the probability of transplantation to recipients in the incubation period has not yet been seen. We didn't have such cases. Then the need to organize a 24 hour express testing of donors and potential recipients for the presence of COVID-19. Then again, balance risk benefit. Risk benefit continues balancing in every step and also protection, protection of patients and the employees and also express testing of the latter, uh, changing of the outpatient management of the patients. So that means reduced number of visits of transplantation centers and also implementation of telemedical consultations. Then temporary ban of um, elective hospitalizations and psychological problems that we are facing in pandemic period, both in patients and also in the doctors who are dealing with transplantations. So pandemia influenced the program of transplantation, not only in our country, not only in our city, but also all over the world. And this is the data of the recent publications, elective kidney surgeries, cadaveric transplantations are working with limitations but the alive transplantation programs sometimes stopped in some centers in the United States. You can appreciate they completely stopped. But there, there is another paradigm. If you look at the renal replacement therapy modality during dialysis and during transplantations, so we can see that fatal rates, death rate of the patients who are on chronic dialysis and at the same time are infected with COVID-19 is extremely high. It's much higher versus those who were transplanted. So this is a big choice, big choice for all of us. Either we stop kidney transplantation during pandemia or we perform it. Uh, in order to reduce the death rate for those patients who are getting RRT, renal replacement therapy. According to that, the main objective of our study is to analyze peri and post-transplantation periods in periods and post-transplantation uh, periods um, of grafts infected by COVID-19. So we selected retrospective analysis of nine cases of patients who were treated in Marinsky Hospital for these nine months of 2020. So let's look at the clinical characteristics. They are shown here on the slide. So the average age was 49, six male, three female. The main disease that leads to CKD is chronic glomerulonephritis and diabetes type 2. So all the patients had comorbidities, ischemic heart disease, the post-op deadlines in terms of kidney transplantation was from three days up to 13 years. All patients upon admission had uh, pneumonias and that was moderate severity. Duration of the disease after hospitalization was seven days. In the clinical picture, in 100%, we had fever, asthenia, also cough, then uh, chest tightness and reduced saturation. In the multispiral CT, we identified features of CT1 and CT2 lung involvement. So a few patients were admitted with CT4 and uh, CT3 as well. The dynamics of creatinine, hemoglobin and C-reactive protein completely correlated with the severity of COVID-19. And um, here you can appreciate that all these patients um, were administered with the dysfunction of uh, kidney transplants that was identified uh, already starting from day one after the hospitalization. Treatment choice and methods of treatment 
were guided by the pathophysiological justification, we a priori thought that all our patients had immunodeficiencies related to the immunosuppressive treatment and also comorbid condition, which also led to metabolic disorders plus chemotherapy, AB treatment in the medical history, uh, previous viral infection, autoimmune diseases and mutations. And at the same time, we were based upon our knowledge about the cytokine storm that is observed very frequently in such patients who have comorbidities, multiple comorbidities. According to that, when we selected methods of treatment, specifically conservative treatment, we uh, stopped uh, MMF completely. We reduced the doses of um, calcinivrin inhibitors and uh, mTOR inhibitors like tacrolimus, and also we increased uh, doses of steroids during first three, four days from the moment of administration. The prevention of complications um, uh, in COVID infections, according to the guidelines, we used anticoagulant treatment, AB prevention with further AB treatment according to the culturing, then uh, prevention of pneumocyte pneumonia and fungal infection. We used um, replace, uh, renal replacement therapy uh, with the correction of um, salt water balance. This is uh, the calcineurin inhibitor concentration change. This is what we saw in our patients. So you can appreciate here that we reduced the concentration of tacrolimus in blood by day 22 of follow-up then concentration of cyclosporin up to minimal by day 18 of follow-up that completely correlated with the dynamics of ferritin level D-dimer, which proved the efficacy of our treatment. Unfortunately, not everything was perfect and uh, we faced complications, we faced uh, death rates at the final stage. You can see that um, infectious complications were developed in every second patient. Some graft dysfunction was seen in 100% of cases, but with adequate treatment, we got uh, uh, recovery of the function. Unfortunately, two patients died. This is one fifth of all those who we followed. The reasons of death, uh, secondary bacterial infection that led to the severe sepsis. If we look at the surgical aspects of complications, so here we are completely supporting the position of um, Georgi um, Rotenberg, who spoke um, about the surgical care. These are spontaneous uh, retroperitoneal hematomas. They were happening not only in the uh, surgical field. We need to learn that, we need to study that, but we also saw that such complications do develop. Now we know. The analysis of the results of treatment of new coronavirus infection in the acute patients showed that all patients that are hospitalized do have uh, graft dysfunction which is um, increasing um, uh, creatine urea and uh, erythropoietin uh, reduction. Hemoglobin, this is activation of macrophages and it is not correlating with the function of the graft. Secondary acute kidney injury seen and normally correlates with severe sepsis. In acute patients, we do not have features of cytokine storm, so most probably it is a result of immunosuppressive treatment and um, uh, due to the high doses of corticosteroids that were used obligatory in these patients. Two patients who died had severe lung injuries upon administration, normally CT3, CT4, more than 90%, and from day one, they were on mechanical ventilation. So the duration of a severe form of infection meets general populational data. Based upon these results, based upon the study we carried out, we concluded that upon the administration of the patients with transplanted kidney with acquired COVID infection, we should always expect the reduction of the graft function and the severity of the disease does not depend on the periods of post-transplantation period. So this is critical due to aggressive immunosuppressive treatment.
So it is the secondary bacterial sepsis is the main reason of unfavorable outcome. Kidney transplantation under COVID is possible with very strict um, anti-epidemiological regimen after the balance of risk and benefit about the needs of the surgery itself. But we do believe that relative kidney transplantation during pandemia is contraindicated and we have refrained from that. Currently, Marinsky Hospital is infectious hospital where we have 11 infectious departments daily. We have more than 70 patients. They are referred from other hospitals and 20 of them are after surgeries. So currently we are accumulating huge experience of providing surgical care to the patients with surgical complications if they are infected by COVID-19. So I hope that in the near future we will analyze our huge experience and we'll be able to share. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Anatoly, for brilliant presentation. So please stay with us because our audience is having several questions. So we would be very grateful if you take these questions now. First question from Sergei, colleagues. What is your vision of um, the rehabilitation of surgical oncological patients after COVID who were discharged because uh, these patients are far from being satisfactory? So what do you do in your regions? And there are more and more patients like this. We don't have specialized rehab department currently because we are infectious hospital. But for the first stage rehab, which is done in ICU unit, we created multi-profile rehab teams that daily, daily with particular periodicity and uh, uh, examining the patients and provide rehab on the bed. This is bedridden rehab. Well, these methods are very well known. They are properly described. And further, such surgical patients should be transferred to the second level rehab centers where they have full-fledged rehab departments. Currently, some of these departments that are uh, working in the resort houses uh, in St. Petersburg and in the Ingradska region. Thank you very much, Anatoly. We have another question from Yuri. Is it possible that the PCR and immunoassay is pos positive, but no p pneumonia on CT? Well, well, this question should be referred probably to the infectionists or virologists. Yes, we saw such cases and normally these patients have mild infections. They don't have CT changes. So normally these are very young people without uh, comorbidities or premorbidities. And normally that could be children. Yes, uh, in CT and pediatric CT, we normally don't see anything. Thank you very much, Anatoly. Another question from Yelena. She's asking, uh, what should be the intervention in CT2, CT3, laparoscopic or open? Well, if we talk about acute surgery, I totally support the uh, position of uh, previous speaker who showed the efficacy of mini-invasive surgery. Specifically, this is um, inhalation tracheostomy in case of um, mechanical ventilation, and then uh, percutaneous uh, cholecystectomy in acute uh, cholecystitis, and if needed, laparoscopy in other acute surgical pathologies like perforative ulcers, acute appendicitis, well, all that should be carried out according to all the principles of utilization of gas, medical gas, then reduced use electroinstrumentarium in the OR, and we should have also minimal headcount in the surgical room. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for a comprehensive answer. And this is a final question. Another question, 
how frequently with anticoagulant treatments and COVID-19 you could see uh, large hematomas, specifically retroorbital bleeds and resorption of the bones of the face skull. Well, we will draw attention to this fact when we analyze the results of treatment of our patients. I have to say from the very beginning that in our hospital, this is one of the few in the city, we have an um, ophthalmological department which is functioning that is accepting all the patients according to emergency indications and these are also elective surgeries. Such uh, complications are seen. Well, specific figure cannot be found. Um, so this is um, about 0.5, 1.5%. The reason is yet not clear. Most probably this is the effect of the viruses to the hemostatic treatment and the using of, uh, use of anticoagulants. Well, thank you very much for brilliant demonstration. Thank you very much for taking the questions from the audience. And for those who just joined us, um, we would like to mention that our event would never happen without the support of our sponsors. So many thanks to Hex, Johnson Johnson, Merivara and Air Farm for that valuable support in the organization of this conference. Gexa, a Russian production company. More than 20 years producing disposable brands, Hexa Medicals, and has its own production cycle, full production cycle. And this is assortment of the medical products that includes more than 3,000 items. Everything is properly checked um, in the independent lab. Hexa products are properly registered, commercially available, meet standards. Leading hospitals of Russia do appreciate quality and convenience of HEXA. HEXA medical devices are distributed uh, through their own distribution network. The company is located in Moscow region.
Distinguished colleagues, dear friends, we do proceed with our agenda. And next session would be endoscopy in COVID-19 pandemia. And we are very grateful to our experts in endoscopic methods of diagnosis and treatment for their participation and for the interest of our conference. And the first presentation would be made by Amit Madeo, who is the endoscopy lead in a global hospital Mumbai with the presentation of endoscopy in COVID pandemic era new protocols of safety. Amit, the floor is yours. You're welcome. First of all, I would like to thank the organizers for giving me this opportunity to talk to you today on the role of GI endoscopy in the COVID pandemic. As all of us know, this whole world over the past nine months to one year, nine months to one year has been enveloped by this unprecedented Corona pandemic. And it has socially and financially made a major impact on our lives. In the initial stages, when the pandemic began, we in India never felt that the pandemic was going to affect our population with such a vast ethnic diversity. However, as we slowly realized, our numbers of corona cases started increasing in this race, which, to tell you the truth, finally we reached number two, but a race which we definitely did not want to win. Today, in the first week of December 2020, in India, we have already got 9.6 million patients who were affected by the coronavirus. But fortunately, 94.3 of them were, were finally recovered of the problem with a mortality of only 1.54%. The state of Maharashtra, which is on the western side of India, and the city of Mumbai, which is the largest populated city in the country of India, was unfortunately the epicenter of the COVID pandemic in our country. And the total number of corona cases in our state was 1.8 million. But again, as I mentioned before, we had a good recovery rate of 92.8% with a total mortality rate of 2.58. To tell you the truth, all healthcare organizations and especially endoscopy centers, in the beginning, this was the scenario. There was a continued atmosphere of fear and anxiety amongst the healthcare workers, as well as the entire general population. As the corona cases started coming in to the hospitals with varying degrees of intensity, we found that the healthcare system was not only burdened, but the healthcare workers were completely confused and to tell you the truth in the initial phases we were completely lost as to what is going to happen in addition to that because of a complete reduction in the non-corona workload of all the hospitals there was a tremendous financial impact on most of the healthcare institutions because of the unclear future we did not know there was no treatment and we did not know when this pandemic is going to end there was a general feeling of despair as well as depression. During the entire pandemic, as we progressed ahead, we found that this pandemic had an unprecedented impact on the personal and professional life of doctors, of other paramedics, and all the people who were affected by it. In most of those, the impact was negative. However, in quite some of the people, the impact was positive, where they enhance their professional, they enhance their personal lives by personal bonding and by giving more attention to personal uh, fitness. The problem was that during the pandemic, all throughout we felt that this COVID-19 pandemic, this COVID-19 virus had not only an unknown virulence, but the complications were unpredictable. Every time we used to come up with some new complications. Uh, initially, we thought that it was only related to the lungs but then we realized that it could also affect the heart, it could cause even myocarditis. And then later on, we realized that even those people or even those patients who recovered from the corona and corona, they finally developed what we found was as stiffness of the lung. The treatment was unknown and there was a continued fear of death. To add to the confusion, because everything was unclear, the policies by the state, the district, the hospital authorities were continuously changing and that created even more confusion. Overall, it finally caused a huge financial impact on not only the hospitals, 
but predominantly the endoscopy centers with less than 25 percent of the normal what is the reality today after nine months of the pandemic the reality is that majority of the infected people we find are either exhibit mild or no symptoms in general all over the world not only in india but the recovery rate is extremely high around 94 percent with a mortality somewhere between two to three percent fortunately the anti-corona vaccine is just on the verge of launch and in some countries probably already launched in general the good part is the fear and the taboo of acquiring corona or getting corona in the society is definitely on the decline and more and more patients are now accessing or coming to the hospitals for the non-corona problems like they have on gi diseases increased clinical experience of doctors hospitals and paramedics so whatever be it but the doctors have now come to some conclusions some protocols which they find if they use these patients recover faster in general if you go to see after nine months of an unprecedented pandemic which had completely disturbed the lives of people now it seems that the life has returned back to normal with the virus continuing the lessons which we learned as well as the practical approach to the practice of gi endoscopy are regarding patient selection and preparation for gi endoscopy we feel that as we go ahead it is very important that we take a proper clinical history of all patients coming to us in the gi department whether they have a sars covid infection in the past and whether they have already tested positive for antibodies in case you do feel that the patient is suffering from corona or for covid symptoms then we do a rt pcr testing only for those patients who require admission or where you need to do a long endoscopic procedure of more than one hour all major endoscopic procedures are ideally should be performed in negative pressure rooms in case your endoscopy department does not have a negative pressure room then you should keep a separate room a dedicated room only for the covid positive patients where you can perform the endoscopies today we have now reached a conclusion that with all the precautions that we take of the healthcare staff and covering the patient a simple diagnostic upper gi and lower gi colonoscopic examination a covid testing is not necessary all the patients the relatives when they come to the endoscopy suite when they come to the gi department they are they are made to wear surgical masks and gloves on arrival before the procedure of course it is now mandatory that as we go ahead in the future all healthcare personnel have to use full pp kits with either n95 or ffp3 compatible mask along with a face shield or even a positive respirator cyclical covid testing now is recommended for all healthcare workers after every few weeks just to make sure that they have not corona preparation of the endoscopy suite at the peak of the pandemic we used to do alternate day schedules because we did not want our staff to get exposed to any patient who could be positive with covid but now as we have gone ahead as the pandemic is now in the decline the schedules have now become normal with a five day week one or two negative pressure endoscopy rooms for covid positive patients are ideal but if you don't have dedicate one room after the endoscopic procedure it is it is now recommended that you should do deep cleaning of the endoscopy room at the end of the procedure with a minimum gap of 20 minutes all accessories obviously have to be disposable and you should follow normal disinfection protocols for your endoscopes you don't have to do anything special if the patient is covid positive and if you are performing a major procedure like a major ampullectomy or a major cholangoscopy with laser or even major interventional procedures like esd or peroral endoscopic myotomy you have to explain the patient of increased risk of mortality and needless to say we have to take informed consent from all the patients well hand hygiene and pp donning before the procedure and the and the and whatever procedure you do is quite easy as all of us know this is done typically like a surgical hand hygiene you have to scrub your hands properly using all types of disinfectant solutions and then a proper donning of the personal protective equipment has to be done by which you cover especially your body your feet and your nose your face and your mouth it is also important to cover your eyes so if you don't have spectacles you have to wear special eye glasses or you should use a face shield precautions during the endoscopic procedure it is now i think uh, quite accepted 
that we should consider all patients to be corona positive unless proved otherwise and take universal precaution to make sure that the healthcare personnel are not exposed. All the healthcare workers should be in full PP with proper mask, face shield and double gloves. All the table surfaces, the sea arm, the trolleys have to be covered in disposable sheets either of paper or of plastic which can be disposed of. Then we have to use aerosol preventing face covers and mask for patient during intubation which I will show as a very simple technique which we can use routinely for all upper GI as well as colonoscopy patients. As far as possible try to limit the procedure time, try to do the optimum what you can do in the minimum amount of time. It's very important that after the procedure is done when we start writing the report on the computer we should not touch the computer before removing the outer set of gloves and as I mentioned before we should keep at least a gap of 20 minutes in between the two procedures to do deep clean precautions during the endoscopic procedure. that I already told you. This is what we do. This is a separate recovery ward where the patients are kept inside and you see here that this is how the patients are prepared and then the patients are wheeled inside the endoscopy room for the procedure. Well, this is what I mentioned about a very, very simple trick, a simple disposable plastic in which there is a small slit through which the endoscope goes and then this is covered over the patient's face during the upper GI endoscopy as well as when you do a colonoscopy, this is covered over the buttocks. In patients where we perform major procedures like per oral endoscopic myotomy lasting for more than an hour, we use the PAPR apparatus which has got a HEPA filter and which gives a proper filtered air throughout this helmet and we can continue to the procedure without uh, the fear of having a, a clouding of the screen what you're going to wear or the face shield. The precautions what we take during the endoscopic procedure the healthcare workers in the recovery area should be in full PP. The separate recovery should be done for COVID positive patients, though it is not mandatory. Endoscope disinfection is the normal way. They don't have to do anything special. Gap of at least 20 minutes, disposable surface sheets for trolleys, tables, sea arms. And then after the procedures are done, at least one person should follow up these patients for at least 14 days to see if they have developed symptoms of COVID. If they have, then we have to make sure that all the healthcare personnel are also tested healthcare workers to report as soon as possible if they develop any So what is the conclusion ladies and gentlemen? The conclusion is that as we have come to the end of the COVID pandemic and now our workload in GI department and in GI endoscopy is slowly returning back to normal. We have to remember that the COVID has been an unprecedented pandemic with numerous still unanswered questions. Though the cure and the vaccine is now on the horizon, I'm quite sure that there is a ray of hope in the future where we will be able to protect ourselves from getting infected with COVID. Of course, needless to say, we have to adapt ourselves to the change and proceed because the virus is here to stay. If you ask me personally, prevention and precaution are the secrets which, we are, which, is, which are going to lead us through this journey. And finally, positivity and hope in our mind are the only solutions in this tremendously changing era in the year 2020.
Amit, thank you very much for wonderful presentation. We do proceed um, and the next presentation would be made by Mikhail Korolev, who is the Chair of General Surgery of Endoscopy, St. Petersburg Medical Pediatric Academy. He will make the presentation endoscopy in the pandemic of new coronavirus infection. So very, very happy to see you. So you're welcome. Good afternoon, distinguished colleagues. Please confirm you can hear me. Yes, yes, we can hear you, positive. Good afternoon, distinguished colleagues. And uh, let me share our experience uh, uh, of endoscopy in pandemia. The point is that we faced uh, pandemia could you please share your screen? Yes, please. Could you please make it full screen? Can you see my slides now? Please confirm. Yes. And please start from the first slide. Can you see my slides? Yes, we can confirm. The point is that our endoscopic community of Russia, we have um, always analyzing uh, challenges that we face. And uh, as soon as this pandemia started, pandemia of new coronavirus infection, first of all, we always traditionally carry out big conference in March. So this year, this conference was carried out in September. And by September, we already had some results working with new coronavirus infection. So this is what I'm going to talk about today. So these are moments that we already analyzed almost until September. Although in our conference, we already saying that this is just the first wave and we knew that there would be second wave and then there would be third wave, which is also very serious because in fact, at that time, we didn't have drugs and the vaccine was just about to come. So first of all, I would like to thank um, all uh, staff of endoscopy. These are endoscopists, doctors, nurses, etc. Those who and taking into account the situation in Russia, the Russian Endoscopic Society together with the Gabrichevsky Institute developed the temporary recommendations for working in the COVID conditions. We had uh, three updates of the guidelines. They were displayed on our websites. They were also published in the clinical endoscopy journal here is the fourth version of our temporary guidelines published at websites and in journals that's uh, the organization of the work of the endoscopic uh, unit uh, providing safety in the conditions of the new coronavirus infection all these recommendations were sent out to all endoscopy departments in Russia. Naturally, we analyzed uh, the results obtained, especially during the first months of the epidemic. We also came up uh, with the questionnaire sent out to all endoscopy departments in the Russian Federation. I'd like to say that, uh, of course, uh, we got the answers to questions in this uh, questionnaire and in most endoscopy departments, uh, there were people working in absolutely new conditions. That's the first thing. Second, how did people protect themselves? And I should say that according to the answers to this questionnaire, from two to 50% of the staff unfortunately got sick with the new coronavirus infection. We sent out uh, this uh, questionnaire twice, uh, first time on August 10th, the second time on September 2nd. And of course, uh, the goal of this questionnaire is to come up with recommendations 
on the part of the Ministry of Health on how to improve the work of endoscopy departments in the conditions of the epidemic. Moreover, we broadened uh, the scope of our study. Today we have uh, COVID-19. Next time there might be another infection, so we wanted to come up with the major principles of work for endoscopy departments in the conditions of an epidemic. An epidemic can be different. Uh, well, for example, it can be a viral infection or it can be an enteric infection. That is why it was important to get some feedback uh, from different endoscopy departments in different Russian regions. So this feedback uh, helped us come up with those uh, temporary recommendations. Let me just uh, say a few words uh, about uh, these recommendations. Well, I should say that uh, the chief uh, senior fellow, Tatiana Grenkova, made uh, a keynote presentation on the development of these recommendations, and uh, we are very helpful to her. Well, of course, it was difficult to come up uh, with uh, such uh, recommendations without uh, Tatiana's work. She has been working with us for quite a number of years, and of course, all our leading experts also made a contribution. I'd like also to thank our leading specialist, Sergei Karshnikov, who uh, actually uh, uh, translated uh, foreign deadlines into Russian, and uh, we also borrowed uh, foreign experience. Uh, and uh, here are the main provisions of the recommendations. Today we have a second wave of the pandemic. These are data for September, but uh, I'd like uh, you to draw your attention to uh, this uh, slide, the share of uh, doctors who died from all total deaths from the infection, 3.9%. Uh, and of course, uh, this is the source of our concern. And as we analyzed uh, the questionnaires filled in, we realized uh, that at the initial stage, doctors uh, did not uh, behave themselves uh, properly at the initial stage of the infection. So that is why we reminded uh, the physicians uh, on how to work in specific uh, inpatient hospitals of the non-infection profile. First, uh, the main goals of the prevention is to prevent uh, the infection in the healthcare facility, also to detect uh, such patients uh, with COVID-19 on a regular basis and uh, timely. And uh, if there are cases like this, uh, to take damage control measures. I'm not going to talk about how this should be done. You can see it here, but the most important thing is that patients who are hospitalized for emergency care, they should be considered as high-risk patients, as patients infected with COVID-19, although the case is not yet confirmed. Well, not paying attention to this aspect led to the situation when quite a lot of people uh, among doctors got sick. Also the use of uh, PPEs, different uh, levels of PPEs, first, second, third. I would not like to go into detail, but uh, I should say that uh, we should uh, take into account all these uh, levels uh, as uh, soon as we deal with such patients. Uh, level number three, you can see, well, respirators, uh, class N95, uh, PP3 masks, uh, also face uh, shields, uh, well, and two pairs of gloves. These are a must. As for, well, uh, how many PPEs we need, uh, you can see the order of the Ministry of Health of March 19th how to calculate uh, the number of uh, specific uh, supplies and PPEs for the surgical department staff. And later I'll be talking about uh, two specific uh, healthcare facilities in St. Petersburg working in such conditions as well as uh, the Moscow hospitals. Well, protection of the respiratory tract. Well, here you can see that the surgical mask FFP1 is sufficient only for two hours. Uh, respirator N95, FFP2, well, they protect you better than 
well, half masks uh, and uh, full face masks and uh, respirators with a filter. Well, unfortunately, not all endoscopy departments had this kind of equipment, uh, such as uh, masks and uh, the high protection class masks uh, in the necessary amount. Uh, mostly these were just uh, usual masks. Well, stage number one, screening of patients uh, before treatment. Well, here you can see for patients who did not uh, have any disease well the presence of symptoms symptoms should be identified if there are and those who already had had COVID-19 that's a different approach the previous speaker actually spoke about the preparation of patients for the examination and the patient must give his informed consent well the Taking the patient out of sedation should be in a special room. Well, the room should be isolated. So these are quite simple things, and we do not uh, doubt them. We observe all these rules. Here is the algorithm we developed uh, together with the Gabrichevsky Institute, which stipulates uh, different actions that we should take before the patient is sent for endoscopy. You can see the algorithm and the risk of the contraction of the disease by the patient when the elective examination is done. But usually such elective examinations should be reduced to minimum during the pandemic. Here you can see where you can read all these recommendations and it's endoscopia.com are you and under expert.iu so this uh, has been approved uh, by the chief surgeon of the russian federation mr revishvili these recommendations helped us uh, in dealing with the current situation let me just uh, share some of the experience of the general hospital that's uh, the St. Petersburg Marine Hospital number two, and also in the bronchoscopy centers in Moscow. Here is the endoscopy department uh, in the general hospital and how it should work in the conditions of the pandemic. You can see different authors who came up with these recommendations. I should say that doctors worked uh, selflessly, often even breaking some of the rules uh, that uh, had existed before, but protection of staff is one of the main objectives. Well, here is uh, the Marian City, num City Hospital number two. First of all, well, a uh, restructuring of the whole system, preparation and training of medical staff, also the preparation of endoscopic equipment and its installment it's very expensive and uh, well when the equipment is in the containment zone in the red zone there should be the proper system of treatment of such equipment also all the rooms should be hermetic except uh, all ours, uh, there should be a separate room with necessary instruments and uh, supplies. Well, the work schedule of the unit should be totally changed. Here you can see the prevention methods. Well, first of all, there should be no ventilation used uh, in specific uh, rooms. Only disposable instruments uh, should be done. And uh, of course, uh, the medical staff uh, should be working in shifts. In the past, they did it by 12 hours, and uh, right now everything has changed. Also, they should wear PPEs, and of course, a PCR should be done on a regular basis. Here you can see the amount uh, of uh, different uh, studies. Bronchoscopy is marked in red. It was uh, quite uh, significant. You can see 48% and 51%. 
and you can see with experience we realized that uh, something should be changed and in speaking of gi gastrointestinal tract well you can see one of the most important aspects uh, we encountered was bleedings bleedings hemorrhages occur on a regular basis usually uh, due to ulcers or ulcerations especially when there is uh, an acute ulcer resulting in hemorrhages you can see 81 percent uh, of patients were discharged and uh, unfortunately 19 percent of such patients died out of this 19 percent uh, no one died of bleeding all patients died of COVID-19 so that what the situation was here are some lab data and in conclusion i should say that endoscopic procedures should be done according to indications in patients with high risk also everything should be done to prevent the risk of infection transmission the organization of endoscopy department should be organized in such a way so that the medical staff could be protected from the COVID-19 infection. In general, technical manipulations uh, except uh, anti-epidemic measures should be the same as in routine practice. Currently, on the basis of the existing data, there is no correlation between complications uh, and uh, uh, GI complications and COVID-19 course, as I said before, at Marine St. Petersburg Hospital and uh, in hospital number two, we took all the necessary measures, uh, the use of different uh, applicators, etc., to reduce the risk of transmission and to stop uh, bleeding, despite the fact that the number of bleedings was quite significant. Well, I'd like also to draw your attention to bronchoscopy in conditions of COVID-19. I'd like to thank Dr. Karpenkov, Savonov, and Sivel Kozov. These are people who shared uh, their experience with us. So they work in Moscow, and uh, they contributed to the development of these guidelines, and uh, they showed us uh, using their own example, how to work in the conditions of the severe pandemic, bronchoscopy in COVID pandemic, elective emergency, well, bronchoscopy to confirm COVID-19 and bronchoscopy in COVID positive patients. These are the questions that arose at the very start. The goal is to do the endoscopic manipulation or bronchoscopy with the minimal risk of contraction of COVID-19 for medical staff. Elective bronchoscopy should be postponed. Emergency bronchoscopy should be done complying with all recommendations. So with the use of PPEs, with the complying with specific uh, conditions. And as I said before, our recommendations stipulate how bronchoscopy should be done. I'd like uh, to thank uh, Tatiana once again, as well as uh, the authors who prepared uh, those guidelines uh, because they came up uh, with recommendations uh, which everyone should observe in such a situation. Bronchoscopy to confirm COVID, in case of PCR positive test in order to confirm the COVID infection, bronchoscopy is usually not needed. Usually we have a clinical science, we have a high resolution CT for that. Uh, there are specific uh, signs of COVID uh, such as uh, ground uh, glass opacity and others. Then we have uh, a meeting of interdisciplinary team and we can do bell bronco alveol elevation just to confirm some particular pathology or maybe covid but uh, as i have already said uh, well bronchoscopy is very limited uh, for diagnosis of 
COVID-19, but at the initial stages in many departments in Russia, bronchoscopy was uh, number one to confirm COVID-19. But with experience, we came to the conclusion that uh, bronchoscopy is very limited in terms of COVID-19 diagnostics. That's a very important thing. Well, bronchoscopy uh, can lead to a high risk of infection. And uh, of course, uh, bronchoscopy should be done only as indicated. There should be the special staff uh, trained. Uh, and uh, obviously, there is a need to use uh, video and uh, scopes because when you use just the ordinary bronchoscope, doctors who do the bronchoscopy are wearing protective, personal protective equipment, goggles, uh, well, and of course, uh, the quality of bronchoscopy leaves much to be desired in such a situation. So there should be the high-tech bronchoscopy equipment used. Also, there should be the necessary protective equipment, as well as valves, as well as specific ventilation. So these are aspects that should be taken into consideration. The organization of a workplace, as I have already said, uh, there should be good imaging, there should be broadband channel, there should be video bronchoscopes uh, and uh, cameras. Well, how to treat uh, endoscopes? Uh, well, of course, they should not be taken out of uh, ICU. There should be the specific uh, washing machines, uh, like a dishwasher. Just hand washing is not efficient, and uh, there should uh, be also disposable instruments. And here are the results of the work of two leading clinics in Moscow. That's uh, the Bernazan Medical, Medical Biophysical Center and uh, the Federal, Federal Moscow Center of the Ministry of Health of the Russian Federation. Well, here you can see the main indicators. Number of people treated, 402 and uh, 1,685 patients. Well, discharged, uh, 366, uh, 1,545 died, uh, 8.9 and 8.3 percent. Treated in ICU, 24 percent and 13 uh, percent. Well, died in ICU was quite high, unfortunately. You can see 30.6% and 49% in the second hospital. Hospital number of endoscopies done is also shown here. And here you can see some main indicators as far as bronchoscopy is concerned. The total number of bronchoscopies. You can see 146, 373. Well, and uh, that's uh, the number of all bronchoscopies. Also, bronchoscopy in ICU, 38.6% and 70% in the hospital number two. Well, tracheostomy. 22, 122, debridement, uh, you can see 100 and 208, BAL, Bell was done not so often, 24 and 40, diagnostics plus biopsy was practically not done in case of bronchoscopy, minus and uh, three, number of bronchoscopies per patient, 4.6, uh, it's uh, because uh, debridement was done in 1.85. Mikhail, I'm sorry, but uh, your time is almost up. Okay, this is uh, one of my last uh, slides. Well, you can see the number of patients who had COVID in the red zone. Well, you can see zero and uh, one medical nurse out of 12 people working in the red zone contracted COVID-19. So, of course, uh, they followed our guidelines and uh, whenever they were observed, uh, the number of medical staff uh, contracting COVID-19 was very low, but the quality of bronchoscopy was very high. And uh, for the first time, 
well, we encountered the COVID-19. COVID-19 will be gone, but other infections uh, will stay with us, such as tuberculosis and others, and we need to protect ourselves uh, thoroughly. Thank you so much uh, for your attention, and thanks for those who contributed to my presentation, especially the Moscow Gabrichevsky Institute. Thank you so much uh, for this uh, discussion of the problem. We have two questions from our listeners. Arslan Borisevich uh, wonders whether bronchoscopy can be done when there is uh, the trachea, uh, tracheal uh, fistula well uh, shown on in patients on mechanical ventilation. I think uh, that's uh, quite uh, simple. If uh, there is a need, we can place a stent uh, and uh, it depends uh, on uh, where the fistula is, it depends on the localization. Well, the stand can be placed in the esophagus or in the trachea, but uh, well, we should use a nitinol self expanding stand, and that's it. It's uh, not a big deal. Thank you so much. Another listener wonders could you share your experience uh, in such conditions when technical capabilities are quite uh, limited when you have for example just one endoscopist uh, an older endoscope uh, and uh, we do not have a lot of supplies well you know what uh, as for those guidelines that we have uh, published are for doctors and also for chief physicians uh, for healthcare managers if there is a covid patient in such a facility well the manager of this facility must organize everything in such a way as to protect uh, the medical staff uh, other patients and to preserve the equipment so it's not a problem of an endoscopist, but it's a problem of a healthcare manager, how uh, the system should function in the conditions of an epidemic. In the past, when everything was not quite uh, properly organized, uh, there was a high incidence rate uh, with COVID-19 among medical staff. Now it's uh, basically zero because uh, they preserve all, uh, they obey all the necessary rules uh, and uh, there should be a specific imaging done. The staff uh, should be protected. It should be level three protection. That means uh, special respirators, et cetera. Only in such cases uh, we can achieve a high level of protection. I realize that our doctors are heroes. Uh, they can treat the patient in any condition, but uh, helping a person, helping a patient does not mean uh, to contract the COVID-19 uh, at the same time. Otherwise, it will be a situation when you can help uh, one patient, uh, but a thousand patients uh, will be helpless because you as a doctor gets a virus. Mikhail, thank you so much for this wonderful presentation. Thanks for answering our questions. I'd like to thank also our audience for the questions. Let's move on. The next presenter is Denis Kubarev, who is an endoscopist at the Department of Endoscopy at the Circle of Federal Medical Center of Russia. The theme of the presentation is the features of endoscopic department working in the COVID-19 pandemic. Please, Dennis, the floor is yours. Well, good afternoon, distinguished colleagues. I'd like to thank the organizers for the invitation to participate in the conference. I'll be talking about the work of the endoscopic department in the conditions of COVID-19 in a general hospital. During the first wave of the pandemic, our uh, hospital, has been refurbished and uh, now we are a COVID hospital. So what should be done to prepare for COVID-19? First, to identify those medical staff working in the red zone. I should say that in our department, all our medical staff who worked in the containment area, except those who are in the risk group, these are people over 65, they were sent on temporary vacation. Second, uh, staff uh, training. All our staff uh, uh, got a certificate on how to work with patients uh, who have uh, COVID-19. Also, we organized uh, special trainings on how to put on personal protective equipment, uh, how to take it off. 
so that not to contract uh, any virus also next to the ICU and OR was uh, retooled uh, fully for us and uh, we put all our equipment in this OR to do all the necessary manipulations like diagnostics and treatment also the uh, ICU department uh, was uh, within just a 10 or 15 minutes uh, and uh, it was uh, very easy to just move our video stand with the equipment uh, if uh, needed because uh, in the ICU there were patients who required uh, specific endoscopic interventions. As for our department, I should say that uh, it was uh, fully conserved. We uh, just uh, did uh, the fumigation and disinfection of the entire room so we worked uh, in shifts uh, 24 hours and then two days of rest uh, and uh, then uh, you can see we had uh, medical brigade medical teams uh, one doctor one medical nurse as for the levels of protection just like surgeons and resuscitation specialists uh, we belong to the high risk group of contracting the coronavirus. So the maximum level of protection is level number three. Well, you can see all these levels of protection here. I would like to go into detail. I'd like to thank our managers. Uh, they provided everything in the necessary amount, uh, like uh, disposable masks and uh, personal protective equipment, etc. As for the algorithm of work and the safety measures, when our hospital was changed for COVID-19 hospital. First, we must uh, know exactly what the indications uh, for the uh, study, what uh, should be the volume of the tests. Uh, well, we got an application from a hematologist, uh, for example, and uh, we talked uh, to these doctors, to hematologists and others, uh, what the particular tests should be done for what and what should be the volume of uh, tests. Uh, and of course, as soon as we got uh, an application from a hematologist or any other specialist, uh, we, uh, within a 20 or 30 minute period, to put all the necessary personal protective equipment and went to the red zone and went and wore at the patient's bedside. Well, here you can see indications for endoscopic uh, tests. All our endoscopic tests uh, were considered uh, to be emergency tests. Uh, well, no matter whether it was uh, just a difficult intubation or emergency bronchoscopy within a 20 to 30 minute period, uh, we put on our PPEs and were at patients' bedside and did endoscopic tests. What uh, preventive measures did we use? First of all, we switched off the ventilation, the use of only disposable instruments, uh, also the use of uh, disposable PPEs, uh, if uh, needed, uh, gloves uh, were used and uh, face uh, shields. Uh, also, bronchoscopy was uh, done uh, with uh, the um, switching off of apnoia, and uh, the team uh, was uh, stationed in the green zone before going to the red zone. And every week uh, we had uh, PCR done. Well, all told, we had the 78 uh, tests uh, during uh, uh, two months. Uh, bronchoscopy ranks first, uh, then uh, the uh, tests of uh, the upper parts of the GI and the colonoscopy. Well, as for diagnostic manipulations, again, gastroscopy ranks uh, first. Uh, these are patients uh, who have uh, GI bleedings or who have suspected ulcer patients uh, with uh, some masses in the upper parts of the gastrointestinal tract. Uh, number two, bronchoscopy. Well, here I should say that we had uh, two patients uh, who uh, needed to have a uh, tumor confirmed and also colonoscopy. Uh, three colonoscopies were done. There were some suspicions of GI bleeding. 
well as for manipulations uh, well again you can see the bridgement uh, also tracheostomy ranks uh, second in terms of the number of manipulations also we had a uh, relatively severe patients who spent a lot of time on mechanical ventilation so uh, nasogastral feeding nasogastral tubes was used uh, in this case and also complex intubations uh, when we were called because hematologists could not do that themselves just uh, a few words about uh, tracheostomy well, I should say that there is a difference here between uh, tracheostomy in COVID-19 situation and uh, general practice. So first of all, preliminary intubation of the patient, the pressure should be negative. So uh, the ventilator should be switched off for temporarily. Also, there should be Chromatic uh, space created to, to prevent uh, the outflow of aerosolized uh, substances. Also, we should uh, re quickly remove uh, mucus uh, from the tracheobronchial tree, and the operator should be quite experienced in this case. Well, as for the algorithm of action of an endoscopist uh, who assists uh, the doctor, well, I'm not going to talk about the operator who does all these manipulations and uses all these mechanisms. You all know what should be done in this case, uh, but as for the endoscopist uh, assisting the uh, doctor, to hear the station is different. Uh, well, this endoscopist must uh, make sure that apnoe regimen is uh, preserved. Uh, also, the bronchoscope uh, should be treated with the lubricant and uh, there should be uh, no uh, gap between the um, seal and uh, the uh, endoscope uh, well the patient uh, then should be in a condition of apnoe once again to do the debridement of tracheobronchial tree and the most important thing is that all the stages of the uh, tracheostoma it should be done in the apnoe regimen apnoe condition if uh, for example there is a desaturation tracheostomy should be stopped uh, and in this case uh, the uh, the orifice uh, should uh, uh, be sealed. You should restore the ventilation, saturation, and uh, only in this case uh, should uh, continue. So the main difference uh, here is uh, you should follow all the stages and uh, only uh, in the apnea, apnea mode. Uh, this is the difference as compared to the manipulations in routine practice. Well, and in conclusion, I would like to say that uh, endoscopic tests are high-risk tests. Uh, they should be done only as indicated that the organization of work of the endoscopic department in the conditions of a pandemic uh, well uh, should be done on the basis of the epidemiological situation and uh, by using all the necessary PPEs. And the technical manipulations are basically the same as those done in routine practice. Thank you so much. I wish you good health and I'd like to see you again soon and maybe not just in an online mode. Thank you so much, Dennis, for this uh, wonderful presentation. I'd like to thank our listeners for their participation in the conference. We'll have a short uh, one minute break and then we'll open the new breakout session stay with us we'll resume our work in one minute
Let's move on with our conference. Uh, well, surgical complications associated with the COVID-19. Vivek Bindal, the pioneer of bariatric surgery, universal COVID precautions. What are the new rules of the game? Vivek, the floor Hello, is yours, everyone. please. At the outset, I would like to thank the organizing team of the Russian Society as well as the AWR Surgical Association for giving me this opportunity to present on universal COVID precautions. What are the new rules of the game? I, Vivek Bindal, bring greetings from Sir Gangaram Hospital, New Delhi, and Clinical Robotic Surgery Association, India. So this is the situation of COVID-19 pandemic as of today uh, from WHO. And you can see India as well as Russia, they are severely affected and there have been hundreds of millions of cases worldwide. If we see the numbers, India is second in the world in terms of total cases and touching almost 10 million, while Russia is fourth and almost 2.5 million cases. So whenever we look at a pandemic pattern of outbreak of respiratory illness, there are various phases. There is a phase of pre-pandemic interval, then there is initiation, acceleration, a peak is reached, then the deceleration comes in. So we are at different uh, areas in this graph, depending on the region we live in, the country we live in, the state we live in, the city we live in. Everyone has a different situation. And accordingly, the practices have been modified. So we'll talk about the glimpse into Indian scenario. What are the recommendations for PPE? How to work up patients and protocols for surgery and robotic surgery or elective surgery and the vaccine. So, you know, giving a glimpse into what we have right now at our hospital in New Delhi, the entry to the hospital is also segregated. So you see on the road, which is leading to access to Gangaram hospital, there is, uh, there is a banner which states gate number one for COVID patients and gate number two for non-COVID patients. And here you can see, this is gate number one, which is for COVID services. And this is gate number two for non-COVID services. So right from entry to the hospital in a car, the areas have been separated. Then these structures have been created <clears throat> outside for screening of patients at entry. So there is dedicated staff who is screening all the patients who are coming in for outpatient care. They are taking their temperature. They are looking at their applications. The Arugya Setu app, which Indian government has given for uh, listing the risk status of an individual, as well as their history is taken and their appointments are checked. These also act as control points to prevent any kind of increase of rush inside the hospital. Then there are these green corridors, which uh, shows non-COVID emergency and OPD services and the sanitization tunnels used to be used in past outside the hospital as well, which now is no longer used. There are separate lifts for COVID as well as non-COVID hospital. You can see this is green lift, non-COVID, this is COVID lift. So a lot of changes there. Segregated seating in OPD, so people would sit with social distancing. And a lot of work is being done by reach out uh, branch, the home care. So a lot of services are being provided at home to the patients so that they don't have to come to hospital for each and everything. So uh, in this pandemic, we have to divide our patients uh, as well as the surgical procedures. So we know emergency surgery is there, then semi-elective and elective surgeries. So we need to prioritize the surgical uh, priority of a patient depending on what kind of disease is he suffering from. And we also need to classify the patient into cohort A, B, C. So cohort A are suspected or confirmed COVID-19 patients. Cohort B are those who are in close contact with COVID-19 are into quarantine and cohort C are which are proven without COVID-19. So patients who have emergency conditions. So patient cohort C, COVID-19 negative, you continue surgery as you do any which ways. 
patients who are under quarantine, if the surgery is emergency, then any which way it has to be done with all PPE precautions. But if it is semi-elective, you do further COVID testing, give some time, and if there is no infection, then continue surgery. And if there is confirmed infection, then postpone surgery for at least two weeks. And in patients in cohort A who are COVID positive, you only do emergency surgeries which are life-threatening. Elective or semi-elective will be postponed. And when you do surgeries on cohort C or non-COVID patients, you are wearing level 1 PPE. And when you are doing emergency life-saving procedures on cohort A or COVID positive patients, you are wearing level 2 or 3 PPE. This is what level of PPE would mean. Level 1 would include scrubs, uh, surgical cap, disposable gloves, and surgical gown, as well as mask. Level 2, apart from this, also has a shoe cover and N95 mask. Level 3 has a respirator. So we see here, this is, uh, this is a picture from Dr. Ashwin Bawa, a dear friend, who, who is showing what is a level 1 PPE for uh, you know, OPD. It has a surgical cap, a face shield, a mask, uh, scrubs, gloves, and a waterproof case for your cell phone. This is level 3 PPE inside the OT. This is uh, my picture in this uh, level 3 PPE as well as a half face respirator with a face shield on and goggles on. So the goals of protection are uh, you know, we need to protect everyone while we are transferring these patients to OR, in the OR as well, after operation, during recovery and going home. So this is for protecting the patient. Also, we need to protect ourselves, we need to protect our co-workers and also the families and the relatives. Uh, there is this concept of regional cooperation. As, as I said that, you know, every region has a different pandemic um, phase. So we need to address the capacity of hospitals and the pandemic situation in every specific region separately. We need to maintain the supply chain of essential medical equipment to all the hospitals. Training and availability of healthcare workers is very important, which becomes a problem uh, in, these, in this era. And COVID-19 tests should be made available in as much numbers as possible. So this uh, regional approach is something which all of us need to look into and we need to do it. Inside the operating room, we should have minimum number of personnel in the OR. Level two or three protection is required. Intubation risk, uh, intubation is a very high risk procedure for aerosol generation. So surgeons and personnel which, who are not needed for intubation should remain outside the OR when the intubation is being done. Smoke evacuation in laparoscopy and robotic surgery should be something which we should look at. We should not allow the smoke to uh, escape into the theater. We should uh, have either smoke evacuators or pass it through sodium hypochlorite solution into the suction machine. Minimize the use of electrocautery and ultrasonic devices. While now a lot of evidence has come up that surgical smoke is not causing COVID, so we are not a lot concerned about it and minimizing the use of drainage tubes. So in minimally invasive surgery, laparoscopic suction is recommended to remove surgical pume and to deflate the abdominal cavity so that the gas does not leak out into the room. Uh, we use lower abdominal pressure if possible. And you know, specimen attraction extraction is performed with minimal CO2 escape and minimize the blood and fluid droplet spread. So we tend to minimize the body fluid as well as the gas spread inside the operating room. This is uh, our team doing minimally invasive surgery. You can see everyone is wearing PPE with face masks or respirators. And uh, right from anesthetists to technicians, everyone has been taking all the precautions. So when we do a robotic procedure in this pandemic, you can see here, the less number of bedside assistants are required. So here we are doing a hernia robotically. There is no bedside assistant because the surgery is going on well and the assistants can stand uh, away. Surgeon is also himself sitting at a distance. So you can see uh, I am sitting here operating while uh, at least you know two meters distance from the patient. And any which way it is a minimally invasive environment as well. So it gives us benefit of uh, less number of personnel required as compared to even laparoscopy.
So uh, here we are doing laparoscopic surgery and you see we are on the side of the patient while in robotic you sit on the console without uh, being very close to the patient. So again coming back to uh, elective surgery in these various cohort of patients, elective or semi-elective for cohort C who are negative, you continue with surgery. For cohort A you postpone the surgery and for cohort V you wait for two weeks and then re-screen. Again, level one PPE for cohort A. So for all our patients, we uh, do a travel history, symptom check. Arugya Setu app is the app in India, uh, which is tracking the patient movement. CBC and CRP. COVID RT-PCR is mandatory within last uh, three days, which is what is our policy in our hospital. And HRCT chest if there is a suspected infection and COVID RT-PCR is negative. So uh, this is a video of the surgery being done in, you know, COVID era. We are closing the port. And now you can see everyone is in full PPE while they're operating. So um, the surgeon, the anesthetist, the assistant, the technicians, and minimum number of personnel are there in the theater. Now the vaccine is coming in. The Sputnik V from Russia was the first one to be launched. And Covaxin or Zydus are the candidates in India. Pfizer and Moderna from US and Oxford from UK. So this is bringing us new promise. And um, you know we hope that it will be available and effective and safe enough for us to avoid any kind of problems later. So the take home message is uh, adequate precautions are must in COVID pandemic. Uh, PPE, testing preoperatively, smoke evacuators, masks and respirators are the new norms. Elective procedures may not be postponed because of the pandemic unless in a particular region the pandemic situation actually requires so. Hospital has to gear up from entry to exit to prevent cross infection. And with the vaccine, we hope to return to pre pandemic era by the end of 2021. Thank you so much for your kind attention. Thank you, Dr. Vivek, for your presentation. The next presenter is by Stanislav Panin. PhD in medicine from Volgograd, uh, and he will be talking about the mediastinal emphysema in patients with COVID-19. Please, well, good uh, afternoon, distinguished colleagues. I hope uh, you can hear me very well. As for my presentation, I'd like to draw attention to one of the surgical complications caused by COVID-19. We did this research at uh, Volgograd Medical University and uh, Volgograd uh, Clinical Hospital Number One. The goal of the study is to analyze uh, clinical observations and to identify the possible treatment of mediastinal emphysema in patients with COVID-19. We used uh, the statistical data and uh, according to the evidences. Well, it's evidence number four. These were just uh, observations. We also uh, analyzed the uh, world data on mediastinal emphysema and uh, the key words were uh, emphysema and coronavirus infection. There were uh, 14 observations uh, of studies, patients with uh, COVID-19, patients uh, who are at uh, hospital number one in Volgograd, as well as patients uh, in other hospitals. Well, you can see trachea intubation was not done. And I should say that the number of patients uh, with non-traumatic uh, mediastinal emphysema did not exceed the one or two cases per year. But uh, with COVID-19, the number of such cases increased uh, in December this year. It was 2.4% of all patients uh, with uh, thoracic diseases. The average age is 53 years, 64% uh, men, 36% uh, women. Well, uh, 
pneumomediastinum occurred on day 14 uh, uh, and uh, uh, but the range was from 2 to 18 days. Uh, the main complaint was emphysema of the neck. Uh, patients were hospitalized uh, for this uh, particular reason. 12 uh, patients were also treated in infectious hospitals. Uh, six uh, were transferred to our hospital, but there were no negative dynamics. Well, you can see our own observations. We did uh, this uh, using our own methodological guidelines. Well, pneumonia occurred uh, in 7% uh, of cases. Well, one patient uh, had acute respiratory failure after mediastinal emphysema. Another patient had uh, uh, upper respiratory tract uh, failure. Well, uh, mild COVID, uh, one patient uh, severe, three uh, patients, uh, and uh, intermediate uh, severe, 10 patients, 72%. Uh, well, as for uh, treatment, well, in eight cases, uh, there were invasive interventions. In six cases, uh, conservative therapy. In one patient, uh, plural uh, drainage uh, was done, and in seven cases, uh, uh, bronchotracheal anesthesia was done in one patient uh, had uh, a relapse uh, air in the mediastinum. The median uh, treatment uh, was five days, but the range was from three to 28 days. There were no deaths. Uh, that's our own clinical observation. Well, as for this case, uh, the patient, uh, 63 years old, the diagnosis is uh, COVID-19. Well, uh, bilateral polysegmental pneumonia, you can see CT4. ARDS, uh, before that the patient had been treatment in the infectious uh, hospital after clinical symptoms uh, appeared. There was air in the mediastinum during the dynamic observation. Emphysema was uh, detected, uh, mediastinum was uh, drain subjected to drainage, uh, and uh, then uh, the patient uh, was uh, treated and uh, discharged from uh, the hospital, you can see emphysema, mediastinal emphysema marked in red, here it is, and you can see the soft tissues uh, of the chest uh, were involved. Uh, well, so I should say that unfortunately, observational studies uh, have a poor statistical power. We also um, analyzed uh, the global publications from PubMed, uh, and there are several dozen such publications. One of the major questions uh, is uh, to determine the pattern of mediastinal emphysema and uh, there are uh, two classifications well uh, well it can be spontaneous uh, or it can be secondary emphysema and uh, you can see the number of such cases were about 50-50 uh, well spontaneous uh, pneumon media Steinem, in case of COVID-19, well, there is a, the special Hammond concept uh, used here. According to the Hammond concept, uh, there may be spontaneous and uh, traumatic uh, emphysema. Well, as for spontaneous pneumon mediastinum, we should take into account any traumatic uh, causes uh, such as COVID-19. And uh, as for cough, uh, sneezing, well, uh, these are other factors indicating to emphysema. Well, you can see another publication, pneumon mediastinum in COVID-19 patients, uh, mediastinum emphysema can be spontaneous and secondary. And uh, you can see uh, that non-traumatic uh, uh, emphysema, well, uh, and the case of COVID-19, there might be non-traumatic uh, emphysema, but uh, however, all scientists uh, say that if there is air in the mediastinum, here we uh, should uh, pay attention to Macklin mechanism because there might be diffused uh, injuries. 
And you can see uh, here the diffused alveolar damage uh, and uh, the air starts uh, spreading and uh, uh, toward uh, the lungs and mediastinum, thus uh, transmitting SARS-CoV-2. That's uh, the Maclean effect as we call it. And uh, here you can see the bronchus, uh, the lumen of the arteries is uh, expanded there is air which is spreading all over. Well, as for uh, the uh, mediastinum incidence rate with COVID-19, it's uh, hard to say. We can only uh, give you our own data. Well, like patients of the thoracic department, uh, well, you can see uh, zero, uh, Point zero zero four percent in uh, patients from five to thirty four years of age, which uh, is uh, a little bit uh, less than uh, according to world data. Also, there might be spontaneous pneumomediastinum in patients with severe acute respiratory syndrome, as you can see here. There was also MERS COV and SARS COV1, uh, and also pneumomediastinum in patients with SARS CoV in this. Uh, case, uh, the instance rate was 19.5 for the entire population, 19.6. And as for the coronavirus infection with the severe respiratory syndrome, LDH is usually elevated in this case. It was also proven that the viral load did not impact on the pneumomedia Steinem in case of SARS-CoV-2, and uh, it can be a prognostic factor of putting the patient on mechanical ventilator, and uh, the mortality rate is 30% in this case. Most uh, publications describe uh, just the specific cases of pneumomediastinum in patients with COVID-19, and uh, you can see uh, some of the clinical observations. In our case, uh, there were a lesser combination of pneumomediastinum and pneumothorax. More, there were uh, other cases, uh, other combinations requiring aggressive treatment. As we analyzed uh, this information of treating mediastinal emphysema, we can say that uh, in 85% of cases, uh, it is non-traumatic. Uh, it requires a dynamic uh, observation and uh, as for intervention, uh, they should be used when there is pneumothorax and neck emphysema. In conclusion, I'd like to say that pneumomediastinum develops uh, in any uh, conditions caused by coronavirus infection, including patients uh, on mechanical intervention and uh, it can be uh, detected uh, when uh, CT is done and the most possible prognostic factor of mediastinum is uh, on day 10 or 14. And uh, maybe uh, this is uh, due uh, to the fact that uh, COVID uh, has already reached uh, its uh, peak. Well, as for the tactic of uh, treatment, uh, the approaches are more or less uh, the same. And uh, you can see emphysema can uh, be on the neck. Uh, this is an indicator to use uh, the Rosimovsky procedure. Uh, Stanislav Igorich. Thank you very much. So the headsets, microphone, <laughs> happened to be quite uh, handy for all of us. Pavel Budakov is just asking. So what about, uh, uh, let's say, <clears throat> uh, scrubbing before operation for the team, surgical team? And usually uh, when it comes to hand washing, so we do it just the usual way. Uh, plus a special protection due to COVID. And the second question, in case there is a big difference in the duration of apnoia, dear,
So it was not uh, just a component of our study, so I can't answer your question. <clears throat> Maybe this question should be addressed to endoscopists. Thank you very much, Stanislav, for, for a very interesting presentation. And we continue uh, the next uh, presentation to Dr. Sharma, head of the Minimal Invasive Surgery Department. So he will, whether we see more complications in, in case of gallbladder disease. Good evening, friends. Mm. Uh, on behalf of AWR Surgeons Community, it is indeed a pleasure to be speaking on this forum and I thank you all for the opportunity. So let me share the screen and uh, start elaborating on the topic which I have been given. So my topic for today is, are we seeing more complications of gallstone disease? And what is the Indian experience about that? So basically, just to introduce myself, I am Dr. Minakshi Sharma. I'm a surgeon in Paris Hospital Gurgaon in India. And my main interest is in hernia and abdominal wall reconstruction. So speaking about my experience and the Indian experience in general, I would just like to share a picture of the hospital where I work. It is a 250 bedded tertiary care private hospital. It's a corporate hospital. And we do have a large uh, COVID ward along with the ICU. We also have a separate designated OT to operate in case a COVID positive patient requires a surgery. In my normal practice, before COVID began, 25 to 30% of the laparoscopic cholecystectomies done were elective. So these included patients with past history of either biliary colic or pancreatitis, or sometimes incidental detection during ultrasound done for some other disorder or health checkups, patients referred by colleagues. But everything changed with the COVID pandemic. So it caused all elective surgeries to stop, our OTs to crash. So all we were doing were emergency surgeries in extremely complicated patients. There were hardly any patients in whom the gallbladders or the appendix or anything else was not an emergent situation. And now with the situation coming back to normal, uh, in case of the surgical OTs, Patients with malignancy and other semi-emergencies have to be prioritized and therefore elective surgeries are still suffering in many centers. And when I say normal, I mean now that we have dealt with the uh, situation of COVID and we have learned how to work in these situations. So we have learned to work with smoke evacuators, we have learned to work with different OR setups and how to take care of our equipment as well. So are we seeing more complications of gallbladder disease? There is absolutely no doubt that we are. It's definitely a yes. And why is that? Because just sharing these two pictures with you. So on the left side is the India Gate, which is in the center of New Delhi, the capital of India. And normally it is crowded, there are so many traffic jams. In fact, kind of all roads lead to India Gate. But on 24th March, when the lockdown was announced in India due to pandemic, you can see the picture on the right. This entire road was empty, it was barricaded, there was nobody on the roads. So if people were not going out on the roads, you can imagine there were hardly any coming to the hospital, especially with the prime minister instructing them that please don't crowd the hospitals. So we had empty hospitals and the bustling OPDs kind of completely became vacant. And for us, complicated surgeries is the norm now. Are these scenarios difficult to handle? Of course. We have a set of patients who have avoided coming to the hospital till it has become imperative till, till they are bent with pain. There is no other way. So 
some of them are COVID positive. So what do you do in these situations? As I asked my colleagues from around the country, everybody was of the same opinion that there are no elective surgeries for gallbladders and only the very complicated ones are coming to the hospital. Some of them are COVID positive. And so what to do in this situation? Either they are being treated with conservative medication or percutaneous cystostomy is being done and definitive surgery is being planned for later. Unless, of course, there is hemodynamic instability or uncontrolled sepsis when it becomes imperative and that is when the PPE kits and the ORs are coming into picture where everything is a change picture and we, will, we have had several talks about that also. Also, another important thing here to consider is that are the tertiary care hospitals seeing more patients being referred due to injuries in difficult cholecystectomy? Because you see in India, we have a lot of small hospitals in peripheral places. And so these peripheral hospitals do carry a lot of burden of these sick people. And if at all, a difficult cholecystectomy was done there and uh, maybe the surgeon did not have the required experience and the cholecystectomy was just too difficult to handle. So this is another aspect we need to work on and it still needs evaluation because right now we are just kind of uh, dealing with COVID, with the third wave of COVID in Delhi and Gurgaon where I currently live, live where there is a giant third wave of COVID which is now started subsiding and we are learning more and more every day how to deal with it. So another question is, are the complications aggravated by COVID? Looks like COVID can actually mimic acute cholecystitis and is associated with the presence of viral RNA in the gallbladder wall. So this study from the Journal of Hepatology, uh, it has been published online on September 2nd in 2020. And this actually talks about two cases who presented with acute cholecystitis and which actually the digestive symptoms preceded the classic respiratory manifestations of COVID-19. So as we all know, COVID-19 has other manifestations, extra respiratory manifestations, mm -hmm. digestive, which include loss of appetite, nausea, and diarrhea. And so these are a few conditions which can be part of COVID or which can be part of just plain, simple, acute cholecystitis. So why is it different with a COVID patient? Why don't we operate? Of course, there is always the risk of uh, the patient infecting all the other people in the OR, the OT staff, and the infection can go out from the body fluids as well. COVID makes the patient sicker. There is delay in coming to the hospital in the first place. Then there is respiratory compromise. There is deranged LFT or biliary stasis Due to COVID itself, such patients usually have a lot of comorbidities. There is also the process of thrombosis going on. There are neurological manifestations. And most of all, the mystery of COVID still continues. So you can imagine that in such a scenario, uh, you know, not knowing everything is a problem. And we need to know more and more and work on whatever we still know. So just sharing this picture with, with you as to what happened in the first wave when, you know, when the first lockdown was announced, everybody started running away. Second wave, everybody kind of took hold of the situation and the third wave, everybody seems to be riding the wave. So why? Because I am coming to my own experience. Now you see in April, in the month of April, the number of my cholecystectomy patients, these are the number of patients operated by me. So uh, in the month of April, they went down drastically. May showed a slight rise because there were patients whose biliary colic was not responding to medication. And you can see during the second wave in June in my city, there was hardly any patient. But after that, the number of patients has been increasing. And towards the end of October, when the third wave started, and in November, when the peak was there, you can see they were the highest number of patients. So that's why I'm saying patients are riding the wave right now, as far as I can see. 
I had total of 20, 76 patients in this time, which were post pancreatitis, cholangitis, 26 number, just empyma 14, persistent biliary colic 18, seal perforation with abscess 2, and mucosil 16. None of the patients operated were COVID positive. There was no mortality at all. And one patient required conversion to open because of CBD injury. Now I'm talking about this study, which was done by the AWR Surgical Collaborative Group. Study is under publication right now. So this talks about laparoscopic cholecystectomy in COVID era. Total number of patients uh, found in the study were 401. 165 males, 236 females. There were 43.9% patients with acute cholecystitis, 176. Jaundice and CBD calculi, 14.2%. With cholangitis, 4.5%. With pancreatitis, 5.7%. So you can see the total number of patients with Colstone related complications was 257 or 64.1%. Other observations from this study were that bile duct injury observed in this study versus literature was insignificant, 0.7 versus 0.5%. SSI was 19 versus 10. This was the significant part. Total post-operative complication excluding SSI observed in this study versus literature was 2.2 versus 3.35%, again insignificant. And including SSI, the total post-operative complication rate observed in this study was again insignificant, 9.48 versus 3.25%. But the highly significant part, the comparison of acute cholecystitis in gallbladder disease observed versus literature, 43.9 versus 20, which is highly significant. And comparison of CBD stones, cholangitis, pancreatitis in gallbladder disease literature versus observation was again insignificant. So I'm very grateful to Dr. Harsh Shet who provided me with all these uh, important data. And what's the plan now? Idea is to make sure that the required expertise is available. No doubt uh, with uh, the kind of experience people have in bigger centers and uh, a bigger team. Uh, a better care can be taken and uh, biliary injuries can be avoided. And of course, there has to be no compromise with anatomy. Thank you so much for the opportunity. And uh, uh, it, it has been a joy speaking on this forum. Thank you very much, Minaksha, for this wonderful presentation and for uh, sharing your experience. Nana, Dr. Shathir Jodhari, expert in the bariatric surgery with the presentation COVID-19 in post-op patient. Uh, what can be done? So the floor is yours. Uh, Hello Shri. and greetings from Malana Zar Medical College. Uh... Hello, friends, and namaste. I am Dr. Sadashu Chaudhary laparoscopic and bariatric surgeon and, and hello friends and namaste i am dr sadashu chaudhary laparoscopic and bariatric surgeon and faculty at km hospital mumbai today i am going to talk about covid 19 in post op patients what to do first case of covid 19 was detected in december 2019 and since then world is taken over by a storm called COVID-19. It has impacted uh, many aspects of all our life and many industries. It has had a major impact on the delivery of elective as well as emergency surgeries worldwide. Elective surgeries has gone down drastically. Slowly, the world is recovering. But still, managing the post-operative COVID patients is still remains a challenge. Morbidity and mortality is very high in COVID-19 patients who are undergoing surgeries. It has been proven beyond point. Why it is so? Why it is so challenging to manage the post-operative COVID patients? 
the basic pathophysiology of covid 19 plays around with the major three factors a distinct thrombosis which affects a micro thrombi or as well as cause a major uh, vessel thrombosis lung related complications a disease like ARDS and unpredictable cytokine storm the clinical manifestations may have similarities to other septic thoracic or gastrointestinal complications which are similar in a post operative or in a post surgical patients the time at which this storm occurs it is the exactly same time of increased risk for severe manifestation of covid 19 in post operative period we generally face two different type of scenarios a post op patients who are known to have covid 19 infection means they have been diagnosed a covid 19 infection prior to the surgery and patients who are diagnosed in a post operative period means the patient have undergone a surgery and for some reason if he is not settling or not uh, showing the improvement a covid 19 has been sent and the report in the post operative period has come and that shows the patient is having a covid 19 infection so these are the two different scenarios to treat and to manage in both the scenarios our strategies and aims should be at preventing the complications in that covid patient preventing the transmission of infection to the staff healthcare workers healthcare providers surgeons nurses and as well as other surgical patients who are getting treated in that same building and we should focus on actual management of a covid related treatment also along with the post operative care the post operative care starts from the operation theater itself the while the patient is immediately shifted the theater should be cleaned immediately so that there is no cross contamination to the next patient as well as to the healthcare providers so that visible contamination must be completely removed and before disinfection so one should wipe all the blood visible contaminations from the theater apart from that the floor and walls should be disinfected with a disinfectant containing containing not less than 1000 mg per liter chlorine so it can be sprayed or wiped out also apart from that air disinfection can be used so for air disinfection plasma air sterilizers or uv lights can be used apart from that the theater should have a negative pressure system protocols in or and the post operative period so to prevent the cross contamination minimum of one hour is required between two cases that is the minimum period taken to disinfect that <coughs> surfaces and the air products which are not used in the surgery should be considered infected and should be discarded or sent for re-sterilization staff leaving the or should be careful while disposing their own gowns and the other gloves like material and also maintain the hand hygiene all staff are also required to shower before continuing their duties so coming to the management in a known covid patient so obviously this patient should not be kept along with the other non covid patients so avoid transferring to the normal post op icus so we have to create another isolation icu for this post operative patients if we have a pref preferably if we have a surgical icu then it is always better because made in medical icus or in the covid icus people are not trained su sufficiently to take care of the surgical patients because management of a surgical patients in terms of the fluids or other parameters or the wound and drain care differs from that of a medical patients wherever we are shifting these patients that room needs to have a negative pressure system to prevent the cross contamination 
or nosocomial infections to the other patients. It should have a good oxygen supply which can maintain the high pressure or high flow O2s. Apart from that, that rooms, isolation rooms or ICUs should have a intubation cards and ventilators. Whenever a surgeon, a surgical resident or staff nurse is taking care of a post-operative COVID patient or giving medications or taking wound care, it has to be performed wearing the full PPE. Once the patient is shifted to a ward, the patients who are awake and stable, one should give masks to all the stable and awake patients. Distance between the two patients should be maintained to minimum of one meter. And then the daily assessment of temperature and respiratory symptoms should be done. Then how you are going to monitor these patients? First and the foremost and the important factor of monitoring is SpO2, that is oxygen saturation. Anywhere you feel the oxygen saturation is going below 95%, then it comes in the moderately affected cases. So the treatment protocols immediately shifts for whatever has been done, whatever has been needs to be done for a moderate cases. So again, another thing before uh, to early recognition of the pneumonia changes, one should go for alternate day chest radiographs. For slightest doubt in drop or slightest drop in the oxygen saturation, one for one should go for a CT scan chest. HRCT chest is very well known to pick up the early COVID related changes or the changes uh, in the lung parameters. One of the most important factor that is the blood sugar levels. COVID-19 is known to cause the fluctuation in the blood sugar levels and many non-diabetic patients also exhibit hyperglycemia during the post-operative period or in a post-COVID patients. So, if the blood sugar levels are high, there are higher chances of the infection or a septicemia. So, we should monitor closely regarding the blood sugar levels. Apart from that, one should keep a close watch on the associated comorbid conditions like hypertension or any other renal parameters. The actual treatment for COVID-19. So, still date, there is no consensus on what treatment should be given. While it is still fighting between Ramdesivir, Toxlizumab, Ivermectin and many drugs. Still, treatment should be obtained from the patient before starting the treatment so that litigations can be minimized. The treatment depends on the mild, moderate, severe or critical cases. By mild asymptomatic cases, there can be no treatment and just observation. While the moderate cases or the severe cases where there are lung changes and the saturations are dropping below 95% or 93%, then some sort of anti-inflammatory drugs. Apart from that, uh, immunomodulators like toslizumab can be added. So, these are the different kind of drugs as of now being used in India like SCQ, Avermectin, Ramdesivir, Toslizumab and plasma therapies. So can we use these modalities in our post-operative surgical patient? Yes. Along with our post-operative care, we can definitely use this, any of these drugs safely. But corticosteroids which is being used very frequently in the treatment of the COVID-19 patients with the good results or the high doses of corticosteroids, these therapies should be definitely avoided in post-surgical patients. As we all know, corticosteroids can produce a immunocompromised kind of a state and can increase the infections and septic related complications. Another most important aspect of a managing a post-COVID patient is thromboprophylaxis. As we know, ki, there is a distinct coagulopathy which is associated with the COVID-19 infection which can cause the microthrombi as well as thrombus in the major vessels. As apart from that, 
our routine surgical patients even though they are not covid they are prone for uh, developing a dvt if the surgery is prolonged and not mobilized we give low molecular weight heparin in such cases but low molecular weight heparin or a fraction uh, non fractionated heparin forms a one of the treatment protocols or one of the mo major modality of treatment in the covid 19 so low molecular weight heparin subcutaneous in twice daily is one of the recommendations for managing the post operative covid 19 patients if patient or is there is a contraindication for uh, giving the low molecular weight heparin or there is a increased risk of bleeding then such patients can be advised pneumatic compression devices in general care should be taken to avoid or to avoid other sources of infection and make the things worse so avoid catheter related blood stain infections reduce the pressure related ulcers stress ulcers and the gi bleeds can be avoided by proton pump inhibitors early mobilization is the key then coming to the prone position maintenance or ventilation or early self pumping so if there is a drop in saturation or is there are the lung related changes in the post operative covid patient and patient is awake not intubated and can be managed on that scar if the scar is not coming in your way early self proning is advisable early self proning for at least 12 to 16 hours can improve saturation or oxygenation drastically any deviation from normal recovery so pulse there is a tachycardia tachypnea respiratory rate is going high patient is having continuous fever or any other problems which is not apart from the normal recovery so thoroughly investigate these patients before blaming covid 19 remember that these patients are post surgical and even post surgical complications can occur in this patient so before blaming the covid 19 thoroughly investigate to relay, to rule out post surgical complications then the question comes once this patient recovers when to discharge or transfer this patients to the normal wards or send them home for that we have to consider many parameters like have patient completed their isolation period so by going home or by going into the normal wards are they going to infect others is isolation possible at home and care can be given at home and if anybody is going to give the care at home whether adequate facility for isolation of that caregiver is available but at the same time we cannot keep occupying the hospital or icu beds for these reasons so we have to consider the available resources and we have to judicially use it slowly world is recovering from the trauma of covid 19 and so that our post surgical patients will also recover we will see the light at the end of the tunnel thank you Thank you very much for your wonderful presentation. So we have a te technical uh, opportunity to ask you at least one question. Uh, how often uh, do you observe pneumonia uh, in post-op patients who have had COVID in history? and how do you uh, uh, can you tell the difference between uh, uh, common pneumonia and hypostatic pneumonia uh, can you please repeat the question uh, uh, so the question is uh, let's say the patient have had covid-19 some time ago and he undergoes elective uh, surgery how often pneumonia would develop in such case okay and how do you can you how can you tell the difference between hypostatic pneumonia and uh, regular pneumonia or common pneumonia okay. 
So the, here, if the patient has already had a COVID-19, so before taking up the surgery, we generally do a HRCT scan or the HRCT chest prior to the surgery. So we know the baseline of what is there in the chest before operating. And we observe this patient's after the surgery, if he is developing a pneumonia or this thing, then only we will, or there is a drop in saturation, then only we will go for a CAT scan. Apart from that, there are few radiological features which can differentiate between uh, your apostatic pneumonia and the COVID and between the changes between the, the your regular pneumonia or uh, pneumonia and COVID-19 related ARDS changes. <laughs> Uh, so you believe that CT uh, findings uh, would be sufficient in order to make the final diagnosis, whether it was a regular or common pneumonia or pneumonia associated co with COVID infection? Yes. So because as we are dealing with the situation who is already have a COVID-19, okay, so any kind of pneumonia, we have to be treat it accordingly. But yes, if it is, we already have a report of COVID-19 positive. So we have to be the extra cautious. And yes, HRCT can differentiate between the regular pneumonia and uh, COVID-19 related pneumonia. Thanks very much for your answer. So colleague, colleagues, let's uh, thank our presenters uh, for this demonstration and uh, many thanks to our sponsors who have uh, extended uh, a helping hand uh, to us all in conducting this uh, conference. Thank you time and again. So, distinguished colleagues, we continue our conference and now we shall have a final session devoted to the uh, safety issues. So, the uh, issue, uh, this topical issue, Dr. Arfendel, minimally invasive therapy and lessons learned. So, Hello, uh, uh, from all ears. Medical College, uh, which is the largest a government-run COVID facility in the whole country with over 2,000 beds. I would like to thank the organizers at the outset for uh, uh, bringing me in this very special meeting. And the task that has been assigned to me today is to speak on minimal active surgery and the COVID-19 outbreak. What are the lessons that we have learned? Uh, so first I will talk about the areas of concern with minimal active surgery in COVID times. Then let us see uh, what are the early recommendations that most of the minimal access surgery societies came out with. How has our understanding evolved uh, as the pandemic uh, has now become almost a year old? What were the revised recommendations that these uh, societies came up with? And what are the lessons that we have learned with this? So as the pandemic began, um, it was understandable that uh, everybody became very, very concerned with the potential of the virus transmission via the surgical smoke and the laparoscopy gas. And especially with the high number of healthcare professionals getting infected early on in the pandemic, uh, everybody thought that it was better to err on the side of safety and therefore uh, most of the uh, societies labeled MS procedures as high-risk procedures. 
the surgeons, the laparoscopic surgeons were also concerned because there was not much information available in, in literature regarding the safety of MAS when using, uh, when using the usual protective measures in COVID positive patients, uh, the effect and the safety of pneumoperitoneum in these patients, whether these patients would require any special post-operative care and what will be the effects of conversion from minimal access to open procedures in the COVID positive patients. <laughs> Therefore, uh, the early recommendations basically uh, advocated avoiding laparoscopy in all COVID-19 positive patients or the patients where the, the results were unknown and the safety of MAS was questioned. But most of these directives are based on uh, almost no background evidence. And the best evidence which was available early on in the pandemic was a level five evidence. But as our understanding of this disease has evolved and more and more literature has accrued, we now know that uh, MAS is indicated when there, is, there are clear benefits to the patients and the benefits outweigh the risk of viral transmission to the patients. But uh, MAS is to be used only when there is appropriate equipment and full PPE covering ad uh, with adequate mouth, face and eye protection available in the OT. And there is no definitive evidence in literature that PAPR reduces the likelihood of viral transmission. We all know that there is a risk of uh, aerosolization of blood-bound viruses. It has been documented in literature, specifically with HIV and hepatitis viruses. And therefore, it was logical to think that this potential risk is also there for COVID virus, although the level of risk is not known. But we must know that the main determinant of aerosolization is the instrument used and not the type of surgery. So therefore, there is no evidence to state whether laparoscopy is more or less risky compared to open surgery as far as the risk of aerosol generation or the viral transmission where the smoke is concerned. There is no current demonstration in the literature that the COVID virus RNA is present in the surgical smoke, or even if it is present, there is no proof that this RNA can replicate and cause disease in a person inhaling the smoke. And the point of concern that arises and emerges from the literature is that the aerosol produced by the low temperature devices like the ultrasonic shears may not deactivate the virus, and we all know that laparoscopy uses a lot of these um, ultrasonic devices. So therefore, the societies came out with recommendations that the use of energy devices should be limited as far as possible. And if at all they are used, they should be used at the lowest possible setting. Prolonged dissection in the same spot should be avoided to prevent aerosolization of the contents. Uh, we all know that the biggest risk of uh, laparoscopic surgery is leakage of gas through the port incisions or by the side of the ports. So therefore, it, was, it is advocated that the incisions through which the ports are to be placed are made small so that there is a snug fit of the port with the skin. Uh, it is better to use either optical port insertion technique or a closed pneumoperitoneum technique using the various needle because open technique insert of port insertion causes a large facial defect with the potential of carbon dioxide leakage by the side of the ports. Self-sealing self trocars or balloon trocars are advocated and valveless trocars are not to be used because they cause a lot of gas leakage when the instruments are passed through. It is always advisable to close the tap of the ports before inserting them. As far as possible, use disposable uh, trocars and avoid any lateral movements when you're inserting the trocar to create, uh, to avoid creating space between the trocar and the subcutaneous space, which may affect the tightness of the seal between the trocar and the tissues. In case there is any leakage from the port side, you have to remove the port, but before removing the port, ensure that you desufflate the abdomen and close the port with the finger over the opening and then do a watertight closure of the port site and then side the port to a different site with using a new functional port. It is advocated to uh, keep the pneumoperitoneum at the lowest possible pressure level that will permit the completion of surgery with, you, uh, with low flow rates between five to 10 liters per minute and low pressures between eight to 10 millimeters of mercury. Two-way insufflators are to be avoided and while desufflating, it is imperative that you close the valve in the inflation trocar Otherwise, it will cause a reversal of uh, flow of carbon dioxide from the abdomen, which is containing the contaminated carbon, carbon dioxide, back into the insufflator, thereby contaminating the insufflator as well. For the instruments, uh, it, is, uh, it, it has been advocated to minimize uh, the introduction of the instruments and frequent changes of the instruments as far as possible, because this is the time where ma maximum gas leakage takes place. Use of disposable instruments is preferred. Small instruments, which are three millimeter instruments, and uh, suture ligatures which compromise the seal and allow leakage of gas through the ports is to be discouraged.
Uh, we all know that COVID uh, virus is found in the stools of about 50% of the COVID positive patients. So in case there is an accidental opening of the GI tract during a mineral access surgery procedure, abundant lavage should be done with close evacuation of the lavage fluid. In case an, an anastomosis is to be done, intracorporeal anastomosis is preferred over extracorporeal anastomosis for the obvious reason that it will decrease the risk of fecal aerosol dissemination and sudden depressurization. An intraperitoneal gauze is best avoided. If at all it is used, it should be removed only after the pneumoperitoneum has been decompressed at the end of the procedure to avoid aerosolization of the content into the OR. Filters and smoke evacuators are highly recommended because they cause, uh, they, they allow uh, filtration of the aerosolized particles from the gas. It is recommended to use a closed circuit smoke evacuation system with either a, a ultra low particulate air filter system or at least a high efficiency particulate air system. Eva uh, evacuation of pneumoperitoneum should always be done in a closed circuit and uh, premature reversal of the patient should be avoided at all the costs because it causes contraction of the abdominal muscles and increase in the intra-abdominal pressure, which may cause um, aerosolization of the, the contaminated gas into the OR and jeopardize the safety of the personnel inside the OR. The trocars should be removed only after the complete emptying of the pneumoperitoneum and therefore it is very, very imperative to prevent port side bleeding because the visualization of port side bleeding will not be possible because all the gas has been taken out of the abdomen. The uh, specimen extraction should take place only after the pneumoperitoneum has been decompressed because the incision that is made for removal of the specimen should not cause a release, sudden release and uncontrolled release of the gas of the abdomen. Trenlinum position is to be avoided because it causes effect on the lung circulation and function and tilt should not be more than 10 to 15 degrees. Drain should be avoided, but if, if it is very, very important to put the drain, it should be inserted through a separate stab incision and not through the ports to avoid uh, the gas leak into the external environment in an uncontrolled manner. Hybrid procedures are not recommended due to the lack of control of the gas, uh, gas release. When we compare the evidence between minimal access and open surgery, which one is better? There is little evidence to say that uh, minimal access surgery is more risky compared to open surgery as far as the COVID-19 virus transmission is concerned. In fact, operative staff is, much, is, is in much closer proximity to the patient during open surgery compared to laparoscopic surgery. And as you can see in the diagram, there are more uh, barriers between the virus and the surgeon and the OR personnel in laparoscopic surgery compared to open surgery. There are specific advantages, therefore, in minimal access, of minimal access surgery in the COVID situation, which are not there in op open surgery, like the potential for ultrafiltration of the gas. Uh, the operative field is self-contained with less risk of fluid spillage and the advantage of more regulated inflow and outflow of air, which can be filtered in minimal access surgery, which is not possible in open surgery. The surgery should be done as far as possible by senior and trained surgeons to minimize operating time and potential of aerosolization. Long surgeries and operating after hours should be avoided. Trainee participation is best avoided at this point in time to avoid prolonging the surgery and potential complications. Case selection is very, very important. You should start with younger patient group with, low co with less comorbidities and as far as possible under a day case or reduced hospital protocols. Elective surgery should be deferred when you know that the patient is COVID positive and uh, the patient should be allowed to recover from COVID. The risks and consequences of COVID should form a part of the informed consent process. So therefore, with all this uh, evidence in literature coming up, the societies came up with the revised recommendations and recommended MAS under, strict, under restrictions and strict precautions. And now MAS has been argued to be more favorable in COVID-19 patients because the potential benefits might exceed the risks. Therefore, it has been recommended that the preference for minimal access surgery should not change unless otherwise contraindicated if adequate equipment and expertise are available. So there's a rider to this and no pre-existing contraindication to MAS is present in patients with normal, mild or moderately compromised respiratory functions. The risk of infection should be controlled by reducing gas leaks. So following protocols, MAS surgery should be safe. So the lessons that we have learned is uh, we need to mitigate the risks, potential risks that are associated with laparoscopic surgery by minimizing aerosolization, by containing the aerosol which is generated during minimal access surgery, and by filtering all the gases associated with minimal access surgery, donning P adequate PPE, restricting personnel inside the OR, uh, preparing smoke evacuators with filters, uh, 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 ensuring that the evacuation of the pneumoperitoneum is done properly, and slow removal of trocars, 
Similarly, SAGES and EAES have also come out with recommendations which are similar to what we have talked about regarding personal protection, service rationalization, uh, the procedure itself, and the practical measures. So in conclusion, ladies and gentlemen, strict local protocols aligned to evidence-based protective measures make it possible to offer MAS to those who benefit the most. And till now, there have been no reports of COVID-19 related fatality of healthcare workers directly attributed to minimal access surgery. But we must exercise caution because absence of evidence is not necessarily evidence of absence. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, Dr. Hanahan, for a very good presentation. Well, the uh, topicality of this uh, presentation uh, so it is there. Initially, we uh, gave preference to open surgeries, presuming they are more safe. But now, due to COVID infection, so laparoscopic and robotic <coughs> interventions are even are most are much safer than open surgeries. Uh, so next presentation, Dr. Pravin Shimba. And so hospital care, the risk of uh, realization in uh, the epoch uh, of uh, COVID-19. So Dr. Pravin, so the floor is yours. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, My no, name is Dr. Pravin Shinde. I'm an assistant uh, professor in the Department of General Surgery, KM Hospital, Mumbai. Today, we are going to discuss a very important topic in present times, which is aerosolization risk in the era of COVID-19, the mitigation strategies and evidence. So why this topic is important to us? Till now, the COVID-19 pandemic has affected more than 218 countries across the globe. Close to 70 million cases have been reported till date across the world. We also have seen the disease has been more brutal to healthcare workers. As far as healthcare workers or India is concerned, we have seen more than 1 lakh healthcare workers are already infected with the disease and more than 570 deaths have been reported till now. The death rate in healthcare workers is 15 times higher. So why is this so? The number of factors are responsible for this. Few of them are scarcity of PPE, aerosol generating procedures, heavy workload, inadequate hand hygiene, and I have also seen some of us feel nothing will happen to them, so they do not take required protective measures. So with that short introduction to the topic, we will now quickly see what are aerosols, bioaerosols, and how they transmit the COVID-19. Aerosols is basically an abbreviation of two words, that is aero and solution. It is a suspension of fine solid particles or liquid droplets in the air or another gas. They can be natural or man-made. What are bioaerosols? Bioaerosols are small droplets which are responsible for spreading the disease. They have living and non-living components which can contain fungi, bacteria, pollen and viruses. Now we will see what is the difference between droplet transmission and airborne transmission. The droplets are usually more than 5 micrometer in size. They tend to rapidly fall on the ground and settle on surfaces. They can travel only to a short distance of less than 2 meters. They can be inhaled directly into the lungs or they can be transmitted from the surfaces as a fomite transmission. Now we will see what is airborne transmission. These particles are less than 5 micrometer in size. They are also known as droplet nuclei. They can remain suspended in the air for a long period of time. They can travel with air currents to the significant distances. So, is the COVID-19 airborne? The answer is yes, but only in specific circumstances and during aerosol generating procedures. These special circumstances are enclosed spaces within which the infectious person 
either exposed to the susceptible persons at the same time or shortly after the infectious person had left the space. Prolonged exposure to the respiratory particle which are generated with the respiratory exertion like shouting, singing, exercising which increases the concentration of suspended respiratory droplets in the space. And the last is inadequate ventilation or inadequate air handling which allows build up of suspended respiratory droplets. Now we will see what are the mitigation strategies with their evidence. To enumerate, first treat every patient as infected case, second use of personal protective equipment, third importance of washing hands and wearing gloves, fourth use of advanced PPE for aerosol generating procedures, fifth patient to wear mask whenever possible, sixth use of tissue, seventh reduce the dispersion of aerosols, eight social distancing, ninth use of viral filters, tenth is use of high flow nasal cannula and the last but not the least is cover the cannula with a surgical mask. <laughs> the first one is treat every patient as potentially infected case because we have seen even the asymptomatic patient shows a similar shading pattern as that of symptomatic patients. Same can be seen in these two articles which are published and authored by Bowdell and Wilson respectively. Second is use of personal protective equipment. Protect yourself from the aerosols by wearing personal protective equipments like gown, mask, protective eyewear and gloves, which was proven by the systemic review and meta-analysis carried out, carried out by Professor Derek Chu, which was published in Lancet in June 2020. Wash hands and put on fresh gloves prior to filling the nebulization reservoir and administrating treatments. Advanced PPE for aerosol generating procedures. Perform aerosol generating procedures in a negative pressure room or in a rooms with high air exchange rates. Use powered air purifying respirator or PAPR in proven positive cases. Same was also included in interim US guidelines at CDC for coronavirus disease 2019. The next is encourage patients to wear simple masks whenever possible in between the treatments. Next is use of tissues. Have the tissues available. Encourage the use of tissues during coughing and sneezing and discard them immediately after the use in cover dustbin. Reduce the release of medical aerosols into the environment. For example, use of intubation box while endotracheal intubation can reduce release of aerosols into the environment. Social distancing. Try to stay at least 30 cm away from patient's airway. Try to remain at the distance when actively not administering any treatment. Use of vir viral filters. Place the filters on exhalation ports of nebulizers. NIV circuits and ventilators. Next is high flow nasal cannula. Use of high flow nasal cannula instead of oxygen mask can reduce aerosol formation. Same was also seen in a paper published in European Respiratory Journal 2020 authored by Professor James Finks. A simple mask placed over oxygen cannulas, nose and mouth acts as a barrier to contain bioaerosols and also reduce the dispersion distance. So the take home message is, save yourself first to save the world. If you are able to save yourself, then only you will be able to save the world. The same can be appreciated in this drawing, which was drawn by my daughter who is in third standard. Thank you very much. Thanks for your time. Thanks very much, Dr. Pravid, for a terrific uh, presentation on a very uh, burning issue. Uh, so there is a positive trend regarding the personal protection equipment use, because initially it was mentioned that uh, with uh, COVID uh, positive patients uh, could be operated on with only face masks on, <clears throat> but uh, this is not enough. 
And now we can see when these standards and transits are being revised and uh, uh, just a facial mask are not uh, sufficient anymore. <coughs> Respirators should be used as a better protection. Okay, we can keep an eye on the trends and now we turn to another presentation. Dr. Arshesh Pashika, uh, uh, so the Max Healthcare post-op workup of patients were suspected for coronavirus infection. So Dr. Mashish, so the floor, uh, the floor is yours. A very good evening and a warm welcome from India. And thanks to the Russian Society of Surgeons in AWRC for this opportunity to be part of this mega event. Today, I'll be talking about pre-operative workup in suspected COVID patients. I'm Dr. Vasis, laparoscopic bariatric robotic surgeon in hernia from Max Hospital, New Delhi, keenly interested in hernia surgery. When we talk about uh, corona, it has been there. It's in humans and animal pathogen. And w, uh, the World Health Organization on March 11 has declared the novel coronavirus COVID-19 uh, outbreak a global pandemic. It looks beautiful, but it's quite dangerous as it comes to people. And a lot of people have suffered accordingly. So whenever we treat these patients, we treat a normal person. Asymptomatic has become a big chance. There are 40% chance of person being asymptomatic and being COVID positive. So whenever the patient with, with asymptom comes with us, but if we get any of the tests, uh, like a uh, chest X-ray, we find some changes like ground glass appearance or a patchy shadowing. And few of them have history of low grade fever. This has become a very rampant kind of a thing. So we have to be very cautious when you are evaluating this patient because we can have an incubation period which can vary from four to five days to 14 days. So that's very important. And the median incubation period is 5.1 days. The initial presentation presents like a pneumonia. It's nothing like anything specific of the COVID. It's a fever, cough, dyspnea, bilateral infiltration in the chest. Sometimes there's a smell and taste sensation which may differ. There is no specific symptoms which can be updated to this because all these symptoms what you are seeing like the fever, the cough, the respiratory distress, upper the GI disorders, the myalgia, the conjunctivitis and many more things which are very common in any of the viral kind of infection. Certain things which have been seen in the children's and adolescents like fever is quite persistent. It's almost 100% of the cases being found and it might take three to four days of the fever but GI symptoms have also been quite coming up in the recent times with the COVID being there. And we have operated on gangrene appendix, gangrene bowel during this COVID time. So it's very important. We have to see the other characteristic also like rashes, like uh, conjunctivitis and other symptoms. So throat is not that common a symptom as what we always think. So we have to be very concerned about that also. It can present in a very harsh manner. Like it can present in the form of a shock or a myocardial issues, arrhythmias, acute respiratory distress kind of a syndrome and many other manifestations which might be there, which is very, uh, very um, life-threatening and it can cause real huge problem. Whenever we get a laboratory test, whenever we get an investigation or a blood test, we see that lymphopenia is one of the most common findings apart from elevated aminotransferase level, elevated LDH, elevated inflammatory markers like ferritin C-reactive protein and erythrocyte ESR and abnormality in the coagulation test. But lymphopenia is one of the most common thing. And whether you have a lymphocytosis or a lymphopenia, but uh, uh, leukopenia, but lymphopenia is the most common thing which is being considered here. Apart from all these things, when you have a person who is severe COVID-19, we need to get other tests done like D-dimer, CRP, LDH, ferritin, CPK, prop, uh, proponin, because all these things are going to give us the severity of the disease. So in case we have to operate a patient who is COVID positive, we have to consider what is going to be the mortality and the morbidity of the patient so we can talk to the attendant. The other thing which has given a lot of clue to us is the chest X-ray, but it doesn't present in the initial period and it takes some time. It is only present in 20% of the initial phases. Later on, it can present with consolidation in the glass appearance and the bilateral peripheral and the lower lobes, which is the most common in these things. If you see this chest X-ray, you can find this chronic kind of a thing here. Peripheral, this is their ground glass opacification. And here also you can see this opacification. But if you see this, it is not there in this 
uh, chest x-ray done and the same patient then was get a CT scan done, it emulated in a better way. So CT is definitely a better proposition as compared to a chest x-ray, but definitely many of the institutions and the American College of Radiology doesn't recommend for screening and diagnosis of COVID-19. They only recommend it when their patient is hospitalized for the management. But definitely it is a very good tool when you're taking up a case which have to take it early. These kind of findings which we normally find in a CT scan is the ground glass appearance is there in 83%, ground glass opification with mixed consolidation in 58%, adjacent pleural thickening in 52, intraocular septal thickening in 48, and so on. So these are the things which suggest a COVID thing. You can, you can see your ground glass COVID opacities here, peripheral ground opacities here which suggest COVID disease. The later on, you can see the crazy paving which is there at the peripheral side of it. It's more of a peripheral presentation. And later on, you can have subcrural bands and architecture things kind of a thing which is coming up when the patient goes into the severe phase of the COVID manifestation of the respiratory symptoms. So proposed uh, reporting language, what they have been used in CT is typical appearance which suggests peripheral bilateral ground glass opacities which suggests quite significantly with multifocal, all these kind of opacity might be resolving with a patch of pneumonia, which is quite significant of typical appearance. Then they are indeterminate and atypical. It doesn't present, gives us a confusion whether it's COVID or not, because it is normally a peripheral, but if you are finding nodular kind of a thing, where you are finding a very, uh, not multiple, not typical ground glass appearance, then it is an atypical presentation of the COVID and not a typical of the COVID. According to the CT finding, we grade it into Conrad 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, say, where 5 and 6 suggest 100% COVID because when it is uh, uh, complemented by RT-PCR test also. So the diagnostic report, whether you are dealing with an asymptomatic or a symptomatic patient, nowadays with the community spread we are having, we have to take the clinical parameters, which are very important in terms of fever, respiratory tract, myalgia, whatever GI symptoms. Don't ignore GI symptoms because GI symptoms may be a part of the COVID and we have already seen in the coming few months. Smell and taste is also quite unique to COVID, which has not been seen in any kind of the viral illnesses. So whenever we evaluate any of the asymptomatic or symptoms, we are doing it now for surgical procedure which is a normally an aerosol generating procedure, whether you are doing it open or doing laparoscopic or robotic. Now we have smoke evacuation devices. We are using it, but we actually don't know how well it works and what we have to go because they unprecedented totally different times and all. RT-PCR is a diagnostic test and is a direct detection, very specific and sensitive. It has to be done for every patient undergoing surgical thing because RT-PCR is very important to be done. In case you have, it is an IgM, RNA, viral test, if it is very specific and sensitive, but most important of this is accuracy. Accuracy means how is it take, when it is done. If it, it can be false negative rates are there, and false negative rate of five, 50, five to 40 percent has been noted. And why this false negative rate? Because the technique of doing was not proper, and other thing is was not done at the right time. If you do it within a day or two, the patient incubation period will not come positive. It will come at four days, five days, or 10 days down the line. So too early doing it is also not an answer. And repeating is also not an answer, but the right technique and the right are important. So this test takes about six to eight hours in our institution. It's a highly sensitive and a specific test. Antigen test in case of an emergency, in case of life-threatening emergency, you have to do a surgery for a gangrene bowel or um, a gangrene appendix or any other severe cases which is life threatening, then you have to get an antigen. Antigen is not that specific, but definitely we routinely have to do such kind of an emergency. Then we combine it with the CT scan chest, which become as specific as RT-PCR, but definitely we send the RT-PCR at the same time because this antigen can, can be had in about an hour. Serology has come a big way in a late infection. Recently, we saw one of the cases where we had COVID positive patient, we had to operate for a hiatus hernia, and the patient were two tests negative for RT-PCR. Third test just done before the surgery got it positive. We repeated the antibodies, the antibody was much higher, more than 100. Then these patients, 
are there to take up for surgery because their positive antibody test means that they are on the uninfective stage. So if it is not an emergency, you can further postpone. But if an emergency, you can just take it, thinking it that it is safe to do it in such kind of patient. Antibody test also uh, uh, really helps in such kind of cases because initially we were not having COVID patient coming re-COVID. But now re-COVID with antibiotic titer of more than 100 or such large numbers is a safe patient to do according to what we have seen in our times. ICMR has concluded us in that safe that ICMR is an end organization which says if you have a patient, if you have to operate, get an antigen done. And if it is a severe emergency, you can continue with the surgery, but send RT-PCR. But if it is not an emergency, it's selective case, if you send RT-PCR, confirm it, but in all symptomatic patient, RT-PCR has to be done before any surgery. We routinely, in some cases, which has to last for a few hours, and in emergencies, we get a CT scan done also of the chest to further evaluate COVID because sometimes uh, RT-PCR is negative, but chances, uh, chest changes suggest that patient might be COVID. So this is what we have in situation of emergency and even swings of elective surgery. In elective surgery, we definitely send RT-PCR for all of our patients before taking them to surgery and do it. Thank you so much for this opportunity and keep safe. Any question, I'm open for the discussion. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Rashish, for this uh, wonderful presentation. Especially it was interesting to see the algorithm developed in your clinic uh, to uh, examine elective uh, patients, uh, for uh, elective surgery patients. Uh, we usually do uh, COVID-19 uh, uh, smear, PCR smear, and uh, CT chest. Uh, well, and uh, usually we take uh, the uh, PCR in this case, uh, and uh, when we have uh, elective surgeries from March to now, while there have been some changes in the past, uh, we recommended patients have uh, the uh, throat uh, swab, uh, which was done one month, uh, CT, which was done two weeks ago. But we started with 28 days. So let's move on to the next uh, presenter, Dr. Ihamarura, an expert in the field of bariatric surgery, JJ Hospital, Mumbai, COVID-19 impact on surgical residency training program. Dr. Iham Arora, the floor is yours, please. Hello, everyone. I am Iham Arora, and I come to you from Grand Medical College and Sir JJ Group of Hospitals, Mumbai. I hope this talk finds you well. As an assistant professor of general surgery at a large teaching hospital, I've been invited to discuss the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic on residency training programs. I have the following disclosures. I have been tested for COVID-19 several times in this pandemic and so far, my tests have been negative, emphasis on so far. Our team has operated life-saving emergencies during this lockdown. Elective surgeries though have only gradually restarted uh, in October. I personally hope I don't have to be operated in the near future given all the hiccups that we see right now. So let's state the obvious, right? India was hit badly this COVID pandemic. We had a disastrous initial curve that wasn't blunted well enough with our initial lockdowns. But however, there is a silver lining. Our recent curve is a little encouraging. We are bracing for the second wave soon. And in fact, some parts of the country are already in a limited lockdown because there has been a surge in cases during India's holiday period in October. While my facility is a dedicated COVID negative zone, the other hospitals in our group where faculty and residents rotate every few months are dedicated COVID centers. However, over time, harsh reality has hit us smack in the face. There is no such thing as COVID negative anymore. Scores of patients being admitted with surgical problems are incidentally testing positive for COVID, stretching resources thin, and we are now upgrading our centers to cope with cases higher than our usual load. Residents of all specialties are the true heroes. They are putting in the hours, they, are insurance, uh, they are ensure patients receive care, and uh, often that actually involves expertise that is out of their specialty. 
when we talk about doctors in specialty training, we can broadly divide them into two categories. Those whose specialty involves an area of expertise that can directly help uh, patients with COVID. So this is internal medicine, pulmonology, anesthesia, and intensive care. And then those specialties which are working on COVID cases, but they don't necessarily have training specific to the situation. Uh, most surgical specialties will fall into this category. Not only are surgeons not accustomed to working on these cases, but due to a shortage of doctors during the pandemic, more and more residents from these specialties are being called upon to work in COVID centers. Beyond the apprehension of catching infection from a patient, early career uh, surgeons are losing precious time to hone their skills. The length of a general surgical residency in India is three years. The first of the three years is spent doing minor procedures, learning bedside manner, improving diagnostic skills. The second year residents, they dive deep into improving their surgical skills. And we support them by providing them a string of relatively straightforward surgeries to do so. The third year residents, they progress to independently operating emergency cases, and they also start performing parts of major gastrointestinal and oncological procedures. Now, I don't have to explain to you how the pandemic and this never ending cycle of COVID duties have dented the training of our second and third year residents. Just take a look at these curves. The curve on top reflects monthly cases uh, in our department in an elective setting in 2019, respectable cases in uh, the early hundreds. The yellow curve much, much lower down is the elective surgical load in 2020, which was often in single digits. Postgraduate dissertations and research have also suffered with most projects largely on hold. Our university has delayed the final dates of submission for thesis, but I'm not exactly sure how many students will reach the numbers required for their projects. At the height of the pandemic, the previous batch of residents was scheduled for exams. Now, these were thankfully delayed for about four months. This batch in question was pulled out from the library and thrust into COVID duties as all of our hospitals were short of hands. Tremendous uncertainty surrounded their exams. Eventually held four months later, uh, a little funny because we landed up using mock cases as patient contact was to be minimized. Now, when this batch passed out, we suddenly had a large class of qualified surgeons with a degree, but no elective OR to practice their skills in. When ORs eventually did resume, our turnover times were longer, uh, and there was this threat of airborne contagion lurking. Consultants were at times less patient with the younger surgeons as they tried their hand at operating. Now, since elective cases were postponed for long, some have come back in emergency, some have grown more complex over time. So residents are finding these cases more challenging to operate independently. And really often teaching faculty has to step in. Uh, PG training sessions and industry driven workshops have been canceled. On the top left, you will see our seminar hall where the residents routinely had lectures and workshops empty. And on the bottom right is one of our uh, postgraduate workshops at an off-site center, which uh, several of these have been canceled over the past year. Um, several faculty members are now taken to Zoom and Microsoft Teams to hold interesting academic sessions. Now, this has also spurred some of us to record meetings and share them online for viewing at a later date by residents. Uh, another silver lining has been that the pandemic has been a catalyst for teaching faculty from different parts of the nation to engage and educate residents from all over the country. And I honestly see these activities taking a really firm foothold going ahead. Uh, we can all agree that training in surgery or learning can never really be complete and it's a continuous process. But we owe it to our younger colleagues to ensure standards of teaching do not dip in these troubled times. We are definitely going to have to try harder to ensure that when this young crop of surgeons passes out, they don't find themselves lacking or at a disadvantage. So here's what we need to be doing. Be patient. Give residents time to operate cases and wash up more often with them. You either stick to the left side of the table or you hold the camera. This is going to give them immense confidence to progress further in the case, knowing that there is someone who can immediately step in to correct course if needed. Uh, say there is a problem in the case, well, handle the issue and then step back. This may seem counterintuitive, but remember residents need the opportunity to 
complete their cases from beginning to end that means mentors will have to step in only when required but quickly move back i have recently uh, witnessed the restarting of pg training activities uh, in several parts of the country and i have to suggest this continues over the next few months we have to restart resident training sessions and hands on workshops uh, involve social distancing use small batches but ensure that the residents have a chance to sharpen their skills even outside the or with the increasing use of online platforms to disseminate information uh, this can be an opportunity to increase collaboration between faculty uh, departments and even several institutes all over the country and in fact maybe across the world to expose their residents to a wide spectrum of clinical scenarios embrace the opportunity i i know uh, covid is not something we were geared up for or something that we are particularly enjoying but look past it covid duties may be impeding surgical training but they are not counterproductive to the growth of a clinician working in covid centers and intensive care with other specialties offers a unique opportunity to improve our skills in icu management and acute care and it's not an opportunity that uh, should be taken lightly I, i like this quote a lot life is like being at the dentist you always think the worst is still to come and yet it is over already so i sincerely hope that the covid situation in your part of the world is gradually improving and there are signs of a vaccine just around the corner uh, i i hope like this quote the worst is behind us and we can get back to routine activities as quickly as possible thank you thank you doctor for this interesting presentation well actually uh, this uh, topic uh, is uh, very important uh, starting from the covid-19 pandemic uh, right now residents cannot be trained uh, on site uh, but uh, hopefully some clinics uh, actually put uh, residents on the staff uh, they just uh, do tests for covid-19 every week and they have a chance uh, to be trained uh, right in the hospital that's uh, very important to, to continue training the next uh, speaker is uh, dr sandeep kuduro for this hospital covid-19 and the financial health of indian hospitals dr kuduro the floor is yours hello uh, i'm sandeep kuduro I'm the facility director of uh, Fortis Hiranandani Hospital in uh, Mumbai, in India, uh, and I'm really glad to be here. So um, today I'll be sharing a few of my thoughts on the financial health of uh, hospitals during the COVID pandemic and the healthcare industry in general. So uh, the pandemic pretty much hit us uh, early March, and as you all know, we went into one of the strictest lockdowns anywhere. uh for the and that lasted for uh, the first 3 months which is april may june which is also what we call the first quarter for us uh india follows an april to march financial year so the first quarter was really really tough uh brought out a lot of challenges that we had to overcome and taught us a new way of working um uh, particularly when it came to running the hospitals and the hospital business in general uh, april may june like i said were the toughest uh, we saw a lot of changes um, while uh, there was a lot of fear in the community we saw a lot of our elective surgeries drop uh, we had to restrict a lot of the services in the hospital uh, due to the covid protocols our uh, physical opds were pretty much shut Uh, at the same time when we were losing occupancy which dropped to a historical low of close to 25% uh we also had uh, a lot of uh, spending to prepare for the pandemic we had to build new infrastructure uh, create new isolation wards uh, quarantine centers for our staff uh, a lot of infection control practices uh, sanitization um a lot of a lot of new things that we had to set up in preparation for uh 
you know the uh, the worst of the covid waves to come so this led to significant cash flow challenges uh, initially so while there was no income we had a lot of new expenses so uh, all of us in general had to take a few uh, cost cutting measures to tide through that those tough times uh, majority of the cost cutting measures came from the support of our clinical community and the management team where there were voluntary uh, pay cuts taken uh, we also had to cut down on a lot of our discretionary expenses uh, like sales and marketing for example uh, so all of that uh, led to significant savings for us in terms of our costs but at the same time uh, wasn't enough to uh, say mitigate the entire loss of uh, footfall to the hospital itself so the first 3 months were a tough time for us to tide through uh, we saw that a lot of uh, the smaller players in the private healthcare system uh, like people who run nursing homes they i think had the toughest of all so india has a, a dual uh, setup where uh, we th- there are significant public uh, healthcare systems as well as private uh, although a lot of the healthcare delivery is done through the private system but the public systems do provide access to the underprivileged and people who cannot afford the private system so we really had to kind of uh, partner with the public system to get uh the protocols and uh, everything in order uh the government also i would say uh, did a commendable job by stepping in at the right time and kind of uh, passing some mitigating measures uh at the same time in preparation for the pandemic there was a lot of other challenges which came forth uh like uh, you know there was we went through a phase where there was a short- shortage of uh, ppes there were shortage of uh, uh the prescribed medication for the covid uh, so all of this when shortages happen all of this also leads to uh, a spike in uh, costs so we had to procure uh, certain uh, essentials at a significantly higher cost uh, but again uh, through uh, the through leveraging the uh, network that we have we were able to place in bulk orders which gave us a little bit of a price advantage uh but overall since the occupancy crashed and uh, uh, like i said there were significant cash flow issues the first 3 months were something that we were uh, looking to tide over uh, so most of the larger healthcare chains were able to do that with some support from uh, certain institutions uh, but yes uh, the smaller players did struggle uh, but at the same time the cost cutting measures we put in place uh, did help us uh, significantly uh, and then the second quarter which was uh, july august and september that is when india saw its peak for the covid uh, cases uh, and it was and that came with its own challenges uh, at one point of time the hospitals from having a very low occupancy in the quarter 1 were uh, overrun with covid cases Uh, more than 90% of our occupancy was from covid so the non covid work was significantly lesser uh, at the same time the government had to step in uh, and rightly so also put certain price restrictions on uh, uh, the treatment costs involved in covid to make it more accessible to everyone so that also kind of put a pressure on the private healthcare system because our costs were uh, so the treatment cost was significant in place but we were not uh, you know getting paid as much so uh, that was a challenge and as the covid pandemic hit the resourcing also became a challenge because uh, you know whenever your staff gets sick the people who are working they have to stretch themselves more and during the covid pandemic the way of working completely changed the the shift timings of the staff changed working from an 8 hour shift to a 6 hour shift uh everybody working on the covid duty had to get a week uh, we we instituted something called a weekly off so they would work for a week and then take a week off just to ensure that they were not uh, infected so all of the all of this literally doubled the amount of resources involved in uh, treating uh but at the same time it was important that we follow these practices because we wanted to ensure that our staff is safe 
uh, but yes this led to significant spike in the uh, requirement of resources both manpower and also the protective equipment the medication everything which was in short supply when the pandemic peaked uh, there were significant shortages in the market uh, so we had to institute a few systems and practices and policies to overcome all of this uh, like i said uh, bulk procurement was one such thing we we had pre ordered a lot of our uh, uh, protective equipment the medication needed so while that put a significant strain on the uh, financial situation like uh, the cash flows at that point of time but it did pay dividends through the long run because uh, when uh, there was a shortage of supply we were able to manage during those times because we had pre ordered in bulk uh, but overall uh, the second quarter i think financially the healthcare industry uh, kind of bounced back because primarily because the occupancy in the hospitals rose so we were able to more efficiently deploy our resources and uh, during the covid pandemic uh, the government also uh, ensured that all the insurance players and uh, everybody did cover the costs in whole so that really helped us uh, uh, you know have a, a second quarter which kind of you know mitigated uh, all the costs involved at least so that way we were not losing money during the covid pand pandemic uh, having said that overall the the 6 months uh, the since A april to say september were one of the toughest in terms of managing and each of us had to uh, unlearn a lot what a lot of what we had what we knew and uh, learn new ways of uh, being efficient and at the same time being able to deliver the kind of quality healthcare that is expected from us uh, i think that um, now uh, we are in december uh, so this is quarter 3 for us uh, it's almost the end of quarter 3 for us um, i think we we've, we've kind of uh, come a long way and uh, some of the changes we've implemented in terms of cost cutting or efficiency building uh, are here to stay uh, of course we've rolled uh, a lot of the uh, voluntary cutbacks and salaries etc have been rolled back uh and now we are also seeing a significant increase in the non covid work coming back the elective surgeries which were uh almost uh, ne negligent during the f during the pandemic now they are back a lot of people had to postpone their elective procedures now they are opting to come out of it as people gain more confidence in the healthcare system and the protocols and the covid uh, protocols etc instituted by the government so we are now seeing seeing a significant recovery in the health of each of our institutions and uh, like i said some of the changes are here to stay uh, like telehealth for example is something that uh, existed for a while but we uh, hospitals were reluctant to take it up doctors were reluctant now uh, they are more than eager because now we know it offers a certain convenience and also helps us manage resources very well so something like that is here to stay Uh, we are going to continue to uh, be a little more frugal and judicious in our discretionary expenses like marketing costs uh, digital is something where we will invest more where we can get a little more value for our money uh, but i think overall um, we've managed to tide through uh, in one piece and but it's showed a significant uh, gaps that are there in the healthcare industry but nonetheless we are better for it and now i think we are much better prepared and in a much better position than we were at the start of the pandemic so uh, it's it's been a very interesting and challenging time so yeah those are my thoughts thank you thank you so much uh, dr standip for this uh, very interesting presentation i think uh, this is very important uh, for chief of physicians for heads of hospitals let's continue dr ashwin tanganvelo use of technology to maintain the surgical education during covid-19 pandemic dr ashwin the floor is yours good evening friends So the topic assigned to me is use of technology for surgical education in COVID-19 pandemic. Technology, 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 techn
хирургического образования в эпоху COVID-19. Что касается технологии, технология растет очень быстрыми темпами. Мы используем постоянно на технологии и повседневной деятельности, но использование технологии в медицинской практике, особенно касается хирургического образования, здесь еще очень много ограничений по сравнению с другими областями образования. Хотя мы используем многие из этих платформ, в том числе вот для коммуникации в социальных сетях, сейчас мы используем эти платформы и в медицинском образовании для того, чтобы общаться со своими коллегами, для того, чтобы многие хирурги могли бы читать лекции. У нас есть определенные преимущества использования этих технологий для тренинга. Мы знаем, что касается Facebook, то на Facebook есть различные группы специалистов, которые обсуждают, какие материалы, какие расходные материалы и необходимые в той иной ситуации для того иного пациента. Мы можем это делать, обсуждая конкретные случаи на Фейсбуке. В прошлом это было невозможно сделать. И что касается COVID-19, то он вызвал... Многие изменения в процессе того, как врачи и медицинские используют технологии, особенно в области медицинского образования. Когда-то вот, технология использовалась keep ourselves occupied, educated, and keep good training programs accessible to surgeons from all across the country. So this way, we brought about a lot of sea change in the way the thought process was going for the surgeons. Webinars and virtual conferences were starting to rise in number and we were having webinars every other day in a week with different specialities contributing in these programs. To such an extent that we were probably too exhausted with the number of webinars which were happening. So to send the webinars across to various uh, doctors, we used the platforms which were commercially used by people in the IT sector and other businesses to have meetings all across the world. The same platforms were used for medical practice as well. And then later we modified the uh, changes and we brought about a little bit of specific changes which were required for us and we even had a few virtual conferences happening similar to the one which is happening right now. So the major advantage of having these webinars and virtual conferences using technology is that we can view and participate in these programs from the comfort of our homes or offices. If you take the Indo-Russian program which is happening right now, if it was a physical event, very few handful of the doctors or surgeons would have had the opportunity to travel all the way to Russia and participate in a high quality program like this. But as now, the program is easily accessible to thousands of surgeons all across the world. And this has been possible only because of the technology which is available. The other major advantage is a lot of time which is lost in traveling and uh, going and staying in a particular place if it's a two-day program can easily be cut down with the use of technology. Here we just have to take time off only during the time of the program. The rest of the time our OPDs and surgical practice can continue as normal. This is a huge advantage to many surgeons. These programs give a lot of flexibility. Uh, even though you might not be free at one particular point of time or there might be certain topics which are, might be of interest for you. So you can make a note of these and attend only those topics in between. You do not have to take time off the entire day and travel to a physical event and choose to attend only a couple of sessions. The rest of the time is pretty much practically wasted. Whereas here you do not have that problem at all. You can do this based on your comfort. The other major advantage with these programs is that here you have a lot of time which is available and a lot of these programs are recorded and available for viewing at a later time. So this gives the advantage to the surgeons if at all they are busy during the program or there was an emergency during the program, they can just you view the program at a later date and time. If a particular topic or a technique was particularly useful for them, before they go in and attempt a surgery, they can again review these uh, recorded sessions and uh, brush up their knowledge and then go into the practice or deliver the care to the patient in a very comprehensive manner. 
So here I'm just going to show you some examples how the technology can be used. So here you can see this is a video which we are going to use to teach young residents and postgraduates on the way the anatomy of a inguinal region would look like in laparoscopic approach. So when it is a video, the candidates have a very good uh, involvement in the video. They understand the anatomy much better. They get the three dimensional orientation of this anatomy also very well. So here you can see we are superimposing and showing the structures where they are. We are showing the direct defect between the lateral and the medial umbilical ligament rather than theoretical here they have a practical view on how it would look in the patient. So this immediately is a picture shown post dissection the same direct hernia and the structures which are binding it. When there are a special hernia like a suprapubic again you can show them a real time video on how the defect would be and what are the structures which are present to identify. We can also use this technology to show important structures. Here we are showing the fascia transversalis which has to go to the anterior abdominal wall. Here we are showing a small pad of fat which has to be retained in the anterior abdominal wall and we have to do the dissection below that. So in this case we are showing the potential site of a femoral hernia. The iliopubic tract, the coopers are shown and here you can see the lacunar and the area where the femoral hernia would occur. So this is the space of Ritzius which is shown real time to the patient, the pubic bone, the coopers on the left and the coopers on the right side. You have a lot of these small vessels which are running. So we immediately show them that these vessels are the vessels of the corona mortis and we have to be very wary and careful about them whenever we do a mesh fixation. So this is a post dissected area. We are showing the testicular vessels. We are showing the vast difference now. You could see the triangle clearly and this is the obliterated umbilical artery where the vas is crossing and turning medial which is going to be the medial inferior limit for us. This is the triangle of doom and the structures external iliac artery and the vein. These are the operator nerve and the vessels. So all these can be easily shown to the patient or the surgeons in a real time basis so that it makes their life much more easier. Here the AWR group in India also came up with a very interesting session called the troubleshooting session with titans where young surgeons were encouraged to send their videos and these videos were sent to two expert surgeons prior. We had asked them to review the videos and a couple of weeks later we had a live program where the young surgeon presents the video and the experts would critique the video and tell them on various tips and tricks on how to uh, overcome a certain difficulty which the surgeon might have faced or if they are doing some uh, steps which are more cumbersome the expert panel kind of simplified it. So this was a very productive session which gives them a positive feedback and encourages the young surgeon to refine their skills and get better in their surgeries. So even though this is not hernia we thought this is very apt to show you the small video. So here one surgeon had operated on this patient and a CBD injury had occurred. So laparoscopic cholecystectomy is a very simple procedure which a lot of people are expected to perform once they finish their residency. So here this is an experienced surgeon who is capable enough to do a intraoperative cholangiogram and a laparoscopic CBD exploration. But in laparoscopy sometimes the telescopic vision can be a big hindrance and we might overcome stuff. So here you can see the surgeon is operating much much inferior to the area we generally would start. So this is the common hepatic duct seen below the ruvius sulcus and here the surgeon is working just on top of it. So this is not the area where we generally work for a conventional laparoscopic cholecystectomy. For some reason I think the traction probably misguided the surgeon. Here even the portal vein is actually clearly seen in this thin individual. But in spite of that you can see the area of dissected is much inferior compared to the area where originally we should dissect. So that is the safe line of dissection which we generally should aim to do in a cholecystectomy. Here you can see three structures which commonly we won't try to see in a conventional cholecystectomy, the portal vein, hepatic duct. So here the surgeon thinks this is the cystic duct, he clips it, he partially opens it, passes in a catheter and does a intraoperative cholangiogram to make sure that there is no stone in the CBD and now he clips the cystic duct and cuts it. And as soon as he cuts it, you can see the portal vein is staring at us and the right hepatic is to the right. And now the surgeon has a doubt, he further dissects and you can see what has happened. So the cystic duct is actually intact higher up and this is the CBD cystic duct and the common hepatic duct also clearly seen. 
so he's dissected the common hepatic duct also now and this is the, how the injury had occurred so this would prove as a very good teaching material for young surgeons and help them to avoid these mistakes so these are some of the ways in which we could use the technology to our advantage in a covid-19 pandemic once again thank you very much for this opportunity hope this lecture is useful to you all thank you very much Thank you, Dr. Ashwin, for this uh, wonderful presentation. Let's move on to Dr. Pava Nidra Lal, MAMC, from New Delhi. He's a professor of surgery, laparoscopic surgery, leadership uh, proficiency in surgery, lessons from the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, Dr. Lal, the floor is yours. во время непосредственно хирургической процедуры тем, чтобы опытные хирурги, когда они работают, будь то это в ангиографическом кабинете или в операционной, могли бы передавать свой опыт по подобным плановым хирургиям, ординаторам и, безусловно, очень важный аспект аудита. Это один из главных аспектов, который связан с оценкой тех действий, которые были проведены хирургом. К сожалению, в ситуации с COVID-19 много проблем. Не все из этого мы можем сделать. Conventional teaching in skills training used to be done in this kind of a situation, which was now not thinkable. And uh, even in this year, up to March 2020, conventional teaching continued with uh, uh, seminars, uh, journal clubs, hands-on skills courses, but this had to be stopped. And for the nine months, we have now come on to a completely online mode. Uh, during this time, several international guidelines have emerged from various parts of the uh, world, including from the, from the US, from the Europe and our own Indian guidelines, which were published in the Indian Journal of Surgery, uh, telling surgeons, advising surgeons what to do and what not to do. And we have had some very interesting talks even today uh, from various uh, surgeons about the do's and don'ts in laparoscopic or minimal access surgery and about the various issues that arise from uh, the aerosol generating procedures that we commonly encounter. Now, I thought this is a good opportunity to talk about the current surgical training. There are two basic types of trainings done in the country in India. One is the master's training, which happens uh, in the university medical colleges, and this gives the MS degree. And the other is the diplomate in national board uh, general surgery, which is given by the national board of examinations. And this happens in the uh, not, not the medical colleges, but other than the medical college institutions. And both of these are post MBBS uh, entry points, which are, which are three years of training. In contrast to other countries, such as the US, the United Kingdom, Europe and Australia, our training is much shorter than the one which uh, these countries follow, which is five, six or even seven years. And there is currently a lot of debate in about increasing the duration of training uh, 
uh, for the surgical trainees. And why I brought this point is because a lockdown of the current type, which has taken place for about six to nine months and has really halted surgical training, cannot be compensated in any way whatsoever by a training of a six of a of a three year trainee but it is still prop, uh, possible to be overcome in a five year six year or a seven year program uh, as far as the national board of examinations in medical sciences is concerned during this uh, uh, course of pandemic it successfully launched massive webinar based learning program across 80 specialties and going and being broadcast to more than 500 students uh, working through 700 participating hospitals, providing 80 hours of weekly classes and possibly became one of the first of its kind in the field to use this uh, uh, webinar based teaching for our postgraduate trainees. And uh, we have already heard about uh, the webinars, how they have uh, uh, kept the uh, teaching component on, but this uh, uh, was uh, this can only do the theoretical bit of training. It still does not uh, in any way uh, make up for the loss of uh, hands-on training. The other important component is the exit examinations, and that is another issue which came up before uh, the various bodies, including the National Board of Examinations, into how to undertake exit examinations when you do not have patients or you have a, a restriction. And once again, the National Board of Examinations converted this threat, threat and challenge into an opportunity and pioneered a, a program of delivery of objective structured clinical examination uh, with uniform, standardized, unbiased uh, uh, pattern uh, delivery to thousands of candidates uh, so that they can complete their postgraduate training. 50% uh, of this examination was in the OSCE format and the remaining 50% was using virtual scenarios and uh, the skills assessment was done on mannequins or dummies or even uh, healthy human volunteers. And now we are allowing this examination to be done on patients who are proven COVID uh, negative uh, with RT-PCR. Uh, this was rolled out through the command center at the headquarters in New Delhi and uh, simultaneous uh, uh, rollout of this OSCE happened in the entire country. And uh, I'm very pleased that with this, we were able to examine more than 3,500 candidates and give these uh, candidates an opportunity to get a degree and start working as qualified postgraduate teachers in their respective specialties. And the next challenge comes is skills training. Uh, and uh, I'm very pleased that at Molana Azad Medical College, where we have the first of its kind skill center started in 2004. Uh, we were the pioneers in any government medical college. Uh, we have been able to start the restart the skills training, both for surgical uh, trainees, as well as for life support courses by reducing the number of batch of students from usual 16 or 20 students to only eight so that there is only one candidate at one station and there is more than uh, easily two meter distance between each uh, candidate as also between the trainer. And uh, this uh, model can now be, uh, is, has now been standardized so that it can be replicated at other centers in the country. And the newest innovation that the national board uh, uh, and myself are doing is to roll out the online surgical skills courses. As you can see here, we have now started on a project and we are about to uh, roll it out nationally is to do the online surgical skills. Uh, we have developed a model which you can see here, which is uh, given to the trainee, sent to the trainee at a very, very small nominal cost and it stays with the trainee and then the training can be conducted uh, through the uh, virtual format by, uh, you know, by the trainer. And this is a short video uh, to show how. Pull the thread out through the loop and see how beautifully the reef knot is ready. You can see that this mimics 
the reflows that I have shown here. So all the definitions of the reflows have been accounted. So to summary, uh, to summarize, uh, ladies and gentlemen, chairpersons, uh, we need to debate about the three-year versus a six-year training in general surgery. Uh, COVID period training needs to be addressed by adequate skills and non-skills modules, both in online and in real-time modules. And assessment of the trainees also needs to be standardized and, uni and made uniform across all the examining bodies. Thank you very much once again for this opportunity and very patient hearing. Thank you, Dr. Lal Bhavanidra Lal. That was a very important presentation, training in the COVID-19 conditions. The next uh, presenter is Ankit Mishra Hyderabad, virtual webinar in the era of COVID-19, a primer for young surgeon. Please, the floor is yours. Our home. Thousands of species live together in this ever-evolving ecosystem. It is constantly giving us cues to evolve. Humans are the smartest of the lot. They have the greater responsibility to adapt for the betterment of not just of its own kind, but every species that inhabit on this planet. But look at the irony. A teaspoonful of virus has changed the world. It has changed its priorities. It has changed me. It probably has changed you also. Our roads are empty and so are our thoughts. So this probably is a good time to revisit and revamp our strategies. And I think the training of young surgeons is that what needs the most attention of all. That brings me to a very important thought. What does a young surgeon want? To understand this and answer this reliably, I spoke to quite a few young surgeons across the country and you wouldn't be surprised to know that these are the following things that a young surgeon wants. Mentor. A young surgeon wants a mentor that understand their needs, that let them sail through the challenges, that recognizes their strength and weakness equally. But those mentors are not available everywhere, are they? We worked hard than our peers to get into the best of the best medical colleges to get best of the best training. But then again, is the training format universal? Is it alike in every other medical college? It's not. Exposure. We know that to be a surgeon in today's world is not just about surgical skill. Of course, it's a prime importance to gain surgical knowledge, but then there are other things that makes you a complete surgeon in today's world. So that exposure is very, very important. But there's some things. Types, uh, the facial protection uh, can be because of, uh, can be surgical masks, can be respirators, can be elastomeric respirators and can be powered air purifying respirators. We'll talk in brief about all of them. As surgeons, we've been wearing surgical masks all our lives. Uh, you should always remember that the life of a, a span of a, a three-ply mask is not more than six hours. Uh, it is made of multiple layers, uh, three layers in particular, and we should not reuse a three-ply mask. Uh, as surgeons, we wear these three-ply three masks uh, so that our droplets do not fall into the patient while operating them. Uh, since these masks fit us loosely, they offer little protection for surgeons and doctors uh, in hospital environments where there may be COVID-19 patients. The second most important thing is uh, respirators. Uh, these are the N95 masks that we commonly use. They are usually single use, mostly used in uh, industrial areas. Uh, they have multiple layers. Uh, please remember 
that the most important thing about an N95 mask is the fit. It should fit your face very tightly and there should be no gaps and you should have no facial hair. N95, the N stands for non-oil resistant and 95% stands for uh, filtration of particles. 95 stands for that it filters about 95% uh, of particles up to 0.3 microns in size. Uh, it has multiple layers. The middle layer has melt blown filters which help in filtering particles uh, with the help of electrostatic charges. Uh, you can see these various brands of N95s in this slide from 3M, uh, Venus, uh, Magnum, and even Kimberly-Clark. Uh, always, once you, uh, to ensure proper seal in your hospital, a fit testing should be performed for wearing these N95 masks. You should learn proper donning and doffing methods of these N95 masks. A seal check, you know, you should always blow in air and see that it fits you well and there should be no leakage from the sides of an N95 mask. Uh, if, if it doesn't fit your, fit your face well, uh, uh, it can be because of that your face is smaller than the mask. Uh, there can be structural degradation of the fibers, uh, of the straps of the mask or the nose piece uh, and the air might leak. If you have facial air, you know, you can have inadequate seal and air can leak from the sides of an N95 mask. Please ensure that uh, your residents and your colleagues wear their N95 mask pro uh, properly. You can see the guy on the left, uh, his mask is folded inside and he has facial hair. Uh, the guy on the right has crisscross uh, fibers, uh, straps of the N95 mask and the air can seep in uh, from the middle of the mask and it might not be safe for him. Please correct all your colleagues. This guy is wearing uh, the N95 over a three ply mask. This is not the right way to wear the mask and the air, uh, the N95 mask should seal your face properly uh, and a three ply mask should be worn on top of an N95, not beneath it. Please uh, warn your colleagues and be careful of how they are wearing their N95 masks. Absolute no. Please combine an N95 mask with a three ply and a face shield. In uh, areas where there's active spread of COVID-19, CDC recommends that a face shield uh, should be worn on top of an N95 mask so that your eyes are protected against the COVID-19. Do not use valve masks as they allow unfiltered air to be excreted out and uh, this can uh, lead to spread of uh, Coronavirus, uh, if your patients or your colleagues are wearing uh, these masks in hospital environments. Uh, you can use, uh, reuse your masks. Uh, you can use five masks over five days and uh, keep them in brown packets. And uh, uh, the first mask can be used on the sixth day again. You can use these masks for up to five days, uh, you should properly inspect um, these N95 masks that are supposed to be reused uh, so that uh, the straps are not broken and you should always wear gloves while using, uh, uh, using these uh, masks uh, again. You can use methods like, uh, like UV or ETO or dry heat for reuse and sterilization of these masks. Uh, a quick word about these uh, full face and half face respirator masks. These, uh, these offer industrial grade protection and seal your face really properly. Uh, the pink filters that you see are P100 filters uh, that give almost 100% filtration against particles of about 0.3 microns. I personally like these masks as they seal your face very well. But there is a way to, you know, you have to still perform the fit test for these masks. They should fit your face very well. You should clean the external and internal surfaces of these masks with alcohol and immerse them in a detergent to clean them and store them in a dry place. The powered air purifying respirators push in a HEPA filtered air into this uh, helmet chamber and uh, you know, uh, this HEPA filtered air is uh, goes into the chamber and uh, there's a vent on the outside uh, which uh, throws out this HEPA filtered air outside after you breathe in. Uh, these offer very good uh, protection for laparoscopic surgeons and give us good 
vision and uh, do not cause any fogging and they are industrial grade and they're very good to be used in isolation areas for people like me who have a long and broad nose uh, the fit is not a problem for these masks uh, the one on the left is by pure flow uk and the one on the right is by 3m uh, this is all about uh, the new armamentarium please remember these most of these things might be expensive but safety isn't expensive. It is priceless right now. Please take care of yourself and your loved ones. Uh, my greetings uh, to the organizers of this Indo-Russian meet. It's wonderful presenting my report here. Thank you very much. For any queries, you can contact me on my email, drbhava.gmail.com. That's my WhatsApp number. Have a nice day, everyone. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Bauer, for a wonderful presentation for this re review of uh, uh, up-to-date uh, cutting-edge uh, protective devices. And so wonderful presentation. Thanks. Uh, thank you very much indeed. N uh, now I give the floor to Dr. Jeta Trevala, uh, uh, General Surgery, uh, to publish uh, or perish. Uh, so um, we are all ears and would be happy to listen to what you're going to say. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Dr. Jayati Churiwala, Assistant Professor of General Surgery at Grant Medical College and Sir JJ Group of Hospitals, Mumbai. And I'm here today to talk to you about the popular adage, publish or perish. So this aphorism originated somewhere in the early 1930s when it was used to describe the pressure to publish academic work in order to proceed and succeed in your academic career. Sounds vague, doesn't it? But I'm here today to show you the brighter side of it. Take a minute to rewind March 2020, when COVID-19 was declared a global pandemic. Elective work had ceased almost in all parts of the world. Makes you cringe, doesn't it? I almost felt like being grounded. Before I knew it, I was donning the PPE instead of surgical gown, trying to memorize doses of antiviral drugs that I only vaguely remembered from undergrad days, and awaiting guidelines for safe surgical practice in times of COVID-19. I kept scrubbing for very different reasons. Did you also, like me, Find your inboxes full of emails, of notifications, of cancellation, of conferences, meetings and presentations. All libraries were shut. All departmental group activities were called off. The only one platform that remained for sharing proliferated. Yes, the web platform. A staggering 450,000 articles were published in a span of nine months of COVID-19 in health science journals on PubMed Central alone. That's an average of over 50,000 articles a month. So obviously gives rise to the basic question. Why do we publish? Here are a few responses that I received when I posed this question to my seniors and colleagues. Firstly, textbooks don't teach you everything. A large part of our surgical practice is guided by evidence-based medicine and publishing brings new evidence to light. Sometimes this evidence simply supports or refutes the existing one. Imagine the kind of world we would be living in if Darwin had not published on the origin of species or Whipple just one day decided to not publish his technique of pancreatic or duodenectomy. Through publishing, people share novel experiences and new techniques to do things. Sometimes they are simply modifications of older techniques that work better. For example, a simple use of attaching a suction catheter next to the tip of monopolar electrocautery for smoke evacuation during open surgery in COVID times works wonders, doesn't it? Also, what has been emphasized is the timely sharing of research results for maintaining the applicability in these ever-changing times. Opinions and reviews about the work that we publish allow us to widen our perspectives about our field of interest. Also, 
it encourages more research and avoids duplication of work how does that work suppose you do not have the resources to carry out research on a very large scale suppose somebody else does they go through your work have an idea and maybe they want to collaborate with you so it also provides opportunities for collaboration at the institutional regional national and international level for instance in the case of the covid vaccine and obviously it provides you recognition it sort of puts you on the map not just you also your institution and your country last but not the least unfortunately publications are still a requirement for promotions in some universities but that's maybe for some other time did i miss this opportunity in covid-19 lockdown absolutely not thanks to support and encouragement provided by my seniors these are only a handful of articles that we have published during the covid-19 times both covid related and unrelated but why is publishing so important how does it allow you to grow personally i'll tell you what i learned in the process before i start writing a manuscript i want to have a thorough background about the topic at hand so i land up reading as many articles as possible from as many sources that i can gather so that i am up to date on that topic so first read then comes the tough part how to write a manuscript medical writing is an art you need to have a clear understanding of the concepts and ideas pertaining to your research paper to be able to present your data and its interpretation in a manner that your target audience can understand an otherwise meticulously done research can appear absolutely flawed if it is poorly presented for those of you who are interested i strongly recommend an article that goes by the title writing for impact by andrew ibrahim next comes how to interpret results you have to learn biostatistics there is absolutely no way around it if you want to keep writing and publishing and not just that also be able to interpret results in other published papers to decide whether or not you want to adopt that practice you need to understand the play of numbers once you know how to interpret results the most important question arises how do you publish once you have written down a manuscript the toughest task is done what is remaining then is to identify a journal of good repute which publishes articles of a subject that matches your field of interest find and go through their author guidelines format your manuscript as per their requirements and submit your work now publishing has been a part of our profession for decades so why the emphasis now why do we have a separate topic on this in this covid-19 surgical care talk because now there is time there is time in hand to learn medical writing to interact with your guides and peers while you cannot wield the scalpel you can still wield the pen it is time to share your work opinion and ideas with the world covid-19 has changed surgical practice in more ways than we had ever imagined and the world the world is reading and who knows once you start writing you might want to take up medical writing as a career what's more publishing houses are now providing accelerated publishing and article transfer facilities what's that so the time between the submission of your manuscript to their first response has come down from weeks to days for covid-19 related articles also they are providing a facility to transfer your article to a more suitable journal in case they do not find the space for your article to be published in their current issue according to a nature article this pandemic publishing is posing a whole new covid-19 challenge they are calling it an emergency of sorts and most reviewers who are online with us today will agree with me when i say that we are reviewing 
more number of articles and much faster than the pre-COVID era. There has also been a boom in the use of data repositories to deposit preliminary results of research by researchers around the world to make sure that data and results are available in a timely fashion. But every coin has a flip side. This frantic publishing of data can and has given rise to problems like duplication of work and unethical and dubious research practices like plagiarism and falsification of data to fit the narrative. Trivial observ observations are serving as fodder for multiple papers. But what I want you to take home as a message today from this topic are the essentials of a publication and they are non-negotiable. An innovative idea, integrity of data, good quality of content, clarity of thought and a clear and accurate representation of results. So to conclude, operate or not in these COVID times, but if you innovate, you should definitely publish. Thank you for your time. Uh, thanks very much, Dr. Shayeti and your assistant for this uh, interesting presentation. Now the floor is given to the Director General of, uh, of the Northwestern District Research Center named after Sokolov, Doctor of Medicine, Professor, so um, Head of the Chair of Study, uh, Viktor Anatolyevich Kashchenko, implementation of the safety concept in surgery in the pandemic era. So Igor Anatolyevich, the floor is yours. Uh, so, <clears throat> good afternoon, dear colleagues. I, can you read me? Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you five by five. And so I represent Northwestern uh, District uh, Scientific and Clinical Center named after Sokolov. And uh, I'm one of the organizers of this conference. I'm uh, very extremely grateful to you all that you responded to our call. Actually, we are witnessing one of the major conferences in the world devoted to COVID-19. Please accept my congratulations with this impressive success. So first and foremost, uh, when we're talking about the safety concept, uh, we mean <clears throat> that uh, this is a multi-faceted uh, notion. Speaking about the clinical hospital 122, we have actually reshaped uh, uh, our uh, hospital, but unlike the first wave, so we have uh, deve the developed a few zones. It's a red zone, six infection diseases departments, and we also have this green zone for treating socially significant diseases. And we also have an intermediate zone, uh, observation department, and we uh, part of uh, some uh, part of the territory uh, of a clinical open. There is a uh, repose uh, uh, area in order to provide for a comfortable uh, uh, well stay of our staff members and the tasks of the red zone this is the treatment of patients with COVID-19 we provided treatment for more than 2,000 patients despite the fact that in St. Pete there is a high case fatality rate during first wave it was 3.6 percent now we have more serious cases but we have uh, this 4.3% uh, case fatality rate. The tasks of the green zone is provision of high-tech health care and provision of uh, care for patients of socially significant diseases and surgical support in the red zone. So it's a 24-hour uh, uh, duty uh, of the <clears throat> high-tech team and uh, diagnostic support for serious cases. Speaking about surgical SATA, we should also underpin that before COVID, medical errors and surgical complications presented a, a, a really a gigantic problem. And, uh, you know, the medical errors, and so they are more frequent and higher than uh, road traffic accidents. But now uh, we have uh, the COVID uh, problem, uh, and it is amplified 
by many times. That's why prevention uh, of infection during surgeries and providing for the safe surgery, it's uh, the task of utmost importance, as was uh, uh, noted by many presenters today. It's a multifaceted notion that includes organization of the surgical safety system, the process of preparation for uh, operations, uh, introduction of checklists, uh, safety uh, in the postal period. You know, the checklists, they were uh, developed at the international level. It makes it possible to minimize random errors and uh, mitigate the risks. Uh, uh, at the same time, I would like to speak about the provision of safety in the uh, pre-op period, about the surgical component related to surgical safety. And there are three topics for discussion today. This is pre-op modeling, intra-op uh, uh, checkpoints and navigation system of uh, auxiliary imaging. Now, laparoscopic cholecystectomy, this is one of the frequently performed operations. It was uh, uh, termed as the second French Revolution with regard to those uh, quality changes and that took place in the surgery domain. And But one of the challenges that popped up as a result of introduction of laparoscopic te techniques is the injury of the extra hepatic uh, uh, bile ducts. How to prevent these complications? One of the lines of activity, this is a pre-op modeling. Uh, I mean, use of MR cholangiography. It makes it possible to uh, visualize those anatomical structures like posterior sectoral duct uh, that uh, might uh, inevitably uh, lead to uh, the injury during laparoscopic intervention and modeling and uh, so we can visualize each and every patient i mean uh, so we can mod uh, uh, model uh, uh, or simulate uh, uh, individual techniques and the next point uh, is the subdivision of intra-op checkpoints into individual stages uh, and like cholecystectomy uh, associated with the name of steven strasberg uh, he happened to be one of the founding fathers of the introduction of this notion, critical viewpoint of safety. So he pinpointed one of the problem, I mean mistakes regarding the uh, location of bile ducts. In this uh, picture, it's not clear what kind of uh, structure here. Is it a common duct or something else? Uh, since uh, since uh, Steven Trasberg, he will, used to be a hunter and he just uh, noted that provision of safety of the hunters uh, has certain function and uh, before pulling the trigger. Uh, so uh, a, a hunter should base uh, his uh, uh, conclusion on the sounds, on the body of the animal because otherwise he could make a fatal mistake if otherwise we can make a mistake. Uh, and when he would fire from the hunting rifle and uh, the study of the anatomical structure. So these are pretty similar uh, uh, phen uh, phenomena before pulling the trigger or uh, just operate on the tubular structure. We should have a clear cut uh, imaging. Steven Strasberg noted three criteria. Uh, this is uh, extended dissection of this triangular uh, visualization of two tubular structures leading to the uh, well uh, <coughs> gallbladder uh, and uh, all these three actions could be uh, uh, rated uh, according to the uh, score uh, uh, and uh, related to safety issues so today uh, so in the hands of the surgeon so we have a, a pretty simple and reproducible system uh, of assessing the quality of uh, surgical interventions and we can have a scoring uh, system we can undertake imaging and this makes it possible to optimize the training of young surgeons in, from the viewpoint of critical uh, uh, perception of safety similar trends today are uh, being observed in other uh, uh, areas in, uh, uh, let's say, uh, uh, it's uh, the critical view of myopectinal orifice, 
and then 10 golden rules for minimally invasive plasty and in gynecology or biliary surgery and we can see that there are clear cut anatomical criteria of a safe surgical dissection and we can objectivize the quality of the surgery as such and on the other hand we can develop step-by-step -step instruction to prevent any complications and potential mistakes a similar system adopted by our partners like the japanese society uh, uh, they use uh, uh, video trailers and images and detailed debriefing after operation in order to certify a young scientist a surgeon uh, to perform such operations and such technologies should be uh, used by us during COVID-19 area because uh, we have this kind of online interaction. Can we improve the surgical reliability using different uh, technologies like navigation therapy? Using the navigators makes it possible to optimize our path, our route, and we can also move around uh, the city without any navigator, but they help a lot uh, to find bottlenecks and uh, uh, traffic jams or whatnot and any operation happens to be the uh, movement in in the new space uh, and the use of the navigation surgery makes it possible for us to prevent different complications uh, let's say icg technologies uh, and navigation <clears throat> happens to be a mandatory it's not a mandatory component of the surgery but it makes it possible to improve the quality uh, we can introduce icg intravenous uh, and uh, provide for halangiography this is uh, cystectomy we start the dissection we only have uh, let's say indirect uh, landmarks uh, anatomical landmarks but having the fluorescent regime even before the dissection the surgeon can clearly see the uh, uh, bile, common bile duct and uh, the juncture of the internal duct together with the common duct, and it can provide the dissection at a more safer distance. You can see different stages of this operation. ICG makes it possible to prevent the uh, uh, re re release of bile. Um, so if we introduce ICG uh, in the, uh, when performing oncological interventions, so we can optimize lymphoid dissection. Of course, we conduct it along the standard uh, sections. It is all well elaborated and developed, but additional staining of the lymph nodes uh, reassures the surgeons uh, uh, to find himself in the operating field and minimize uh, potential mistakes and decrease the risks of complication. The same is true for colorectal surgery. You can see the enlarged nodes. And in this video, you can see it's a left-sided uh, colectomy uh, using fluorescent navigation makes it possible for the surgeon to obtain additional information regarding the location of the lymph uh, system we can see a, a, a well differentiation of the compartment we perform the dissection in the established planes but uh, additional fluorescence makes it possible to optimize this plane and to ascertain ascertain the location of a compartment uh, and provide the dissection properly so the management uh, introduction of fluorescent into the vascular bed uh, so the main thing uh, makes it possible to obtain information about the tissue blood supply and we can prevent ischemic uh, uh, complications in, uh, in case of incorrect uh, dissections or inconsistency of uh, anastomosis. We can make the prognosis of angiographic uh, picture and obtain additional information about the organ blood supply. Uh, so the same thing about the position of the ureter and obtain information about the monitoring of autonom uh, autonomous nerves and prevent injury of the nervous structures by, and, in conducting laparoscopic interventions. So today the concept of uh, personalized safe surgery 
uh, implies pre-op modeling and uh, information and uh, subdivision of the operation uh, on different steps, uh, intra-op uh, checkpoints, uh, so uh, navigation systems, uh, video fixation, uh, and uh, uh, actually uh, we can improve the quality of surgical intervention. We can minimize complications. I, uh, I mean, auxiliary imaging. Uh, so it's the whole arsenal or method or uh, to improve the safety of uh, operations like angiography, lymphography, holangiography, urography, and neuromonitoring. So the whole complex of steps aimed at providing safety and their personalized surgical intervention. Drawing the line, I would like to thank the staff members of the surgical department of the center so a very uh, for a very uh, strenuous uh, uh, and the uh, job they have performed and uh, they made a serious contribution into this so victor anatolievich thank you very much for a brilliant presentation uh, uh, so yelena chernikova uh, asks a question uh, what about the laminar flow in the uh, operating theater uh, how do they influence uh, the movement of aerosol? Well, first and foremost, this issue requires further scrutiny, but uh, laminar flows uh, would minimize uh, uh, potential spread of the infection, uh, COVID in particular, and uh, we should also analyze the relationship between inflow and outflow. If there is an enlarged uh, inflow by presuming uh, that it should be pulled away, and, and but when performing uh, COVID, uh, we should create a reverse situation. There must be predominant outflow as compared to inflow, and then the laminar flows would be aimed at decreasing the probability of contracting the infection by the operating surgeons. So thank you very much for this uh, very detailed answer. Now we turn to the next presentation. So, uh, the theme of the presentation is bin it or keep it, which professional ethical guidelines on managing COVID-19 should one follow? Dr. Harsh, Seth, the floor is yours pandemic has wreaked havoc across the globe with no country being spared. There's been a steady rise in cases over the past eight to nine months, with some countries only recently showing a declining trend, but at the same time, other countries entering the second wave. During this time, there have been a number of professional ethical guidelines that have been published and issued with widely contradictory statements, which has fostered immense confusion amongst practicing clinicians. A very good evening to all. I am Dr. Harsh Sheth, a consultant laparoscopic gastrointestinal AWR and bariatric surgeon in Mumbai, India. And I'm going to speak about which professional ethical guidelines on managing COVID-19 should you bin and which ones should you keep. But let's start with the basics. What are professional ethical guidelines? Let's break it down and take each word individually. These are guidelines which are prepared by organizations of professionals and aimed at those particular professionals. They conform to ethical standards regarding what should be done. And they are created to guide the clinical practice of professionals and allow them to make the safest possible decisions for patient care. As COVID-19 struck in an untimely and unexpected manner and spread rapidly, the evidence base to treat this novel disease was not so rapid and clinicians started relying on best practice professional guidelines to guide their management approach. That is why these professional ethical guidelines are particularly important in the management of COVID-19. Creating evidence takes time and putting it out for publication takes even more time. Even with the fast track publications, evidence at the beginning of the pandemic was very scarce and professional guidelines help clinicians make many treatment decisions. 
Proof of the vast number of guideline documents available across the world is this web page of the European Respiratory Society, which has tried to amalgamate and bring under one roof all guidelines issued across the world onto one platform. These guidelines are open access and free to view for any clinician across the globe. Why is it important to know which guidelines to follow, especially for this pandemic, so that professionals are clear about what they expected to do and how to do it? There's consistency across practices. There's lack of high quality evidence to support treatment algorithms used by clinicians and guidelines can support them and it can make your practice defensible. So the question arises, which professional ethical guidelines must one follow? A very simple answer is to focus on these four domains to critically evaluate published guidelines. One is the source of the guidelines. The next is applicability. Third is methodology adopted. And fourth is temporality. So when we talk about the source of the guidelines, you have to look at the authority of the source. For example, if the, if the source of the guidelines is the law-making body, you cannot ignore them as it will result in loss of income and loss of job. And even if these guidelines are published by the apex bodies such as the ICMR in India and AIMS uh, in New Delhi, these guidelines are difficult to ignore. But what about those guidelines that are not published by any of these apex bodies or lawmaking bodies? That is when you have to look at the influentialness, influentiality of the source. For example, in India, the Indian Association of Respiratory Care or the Indian Chest uh, Society or the IMA has been very proactive in formulating guidelines for this pandemic and putting them across for people to have a look at. The next domain is applicability. So are these guidelines accessible? Accessibility means they must be open access and there must be clear signposting for these guidelines. It is difficult with so many guidelines loaded on the dig digital space to have clear signpostings and uh, to have people being able to uh, figure out which is the best guideline for them. This is where national bodies come into play, where they must take together all these guidelines and uh, signpost them for clinicians to view. Do they apply to you as a professional? For example, guidelines for the public or guidelines for lawyers during the pandemic may not necessarily apply to guidelines for doctors. Are they relevant to the patient population in question? This is a very important question that must be asked when going through any guideline paper. It's, for example, a very simple example is uh, guidelines for adults are not applicable in the pediatric population and vice versa. And these must be noted while reading through any of these guideline papers. Are they relevant in the particular clinical or geographic setting? For example, guidelines will be very different for institutional care versus home care, or even within the institution, there may be different guidelines for intensive care versus ward care. A simple example is these Aspen guidelines for nutrition support of adult patients. They've got multiple published guidelines, but uh, guidelines for parenteral nutrition in adults with EC fistula may not be applicable or even relevant to adults needing parenteral nutrition when suffering from severe pancreatitis, for example. The next domain is to evaluate the methodology of the guidelines. Quality of process will not offer a guarantee of the quality of product, but it will at least point us in that direction. And that is where evaluating methodology is very, very important. And the final domain is temporality. This simple slide will tell you why temporality is so important. Back in March 2020, when the pandemic struck, 
The ICMR issued a guidance to all healthcare workers to take HCQS uh, prophylaxis, which seemed prudent and even scientific at that time. However, with evolution of data and publication of various trials, most specifically the HIP trial, which recorded HCQS related adverse events when used for prophylaxis in HCWs, the earlier guidelines were withdrawn and even amended appropriately. John Hampton, in a landmark lecture in 2002, spoke about guidelines and what it means. He quoted that someone who is not an expert in a particular field does well to follow guidelines when treating patients to avoid adverse events. But someone who knows a subject will know that these guidelines are followable. So it is up to, dis up to us to decide whether we want to be the fools or the zombies who slavishly follow guidelines or wise doctors who know that guidelines are followable. That begs the question, are clinical guidelines enough? So as per John Hampton, no, they are not. A wise man will always depend on assessment of each individual patient and professional judgment and expertise rather than use a slavish application of guidelines. That is why professional judgment is of paramount importance when interpreting clinical guidelines to yield optimal clinical outcomes. In conclusion, I would like to say that the pandemic has laid emphasis on development and deployment of guidelines to guide clinicians. Guidelines and professional judgment need to go hand in hand and are interdependent. Guidelines can be used to make professional choices, but cannot replace them in the entirety. Professional guidelines are important to guide a consistent and defensible practice. A big thank you and congratulations to the AWR Surgeons Community and Russian Surgical Society for organizing this program. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Shas, for this wonderful presentation. Our next to last speaker, Dr. Pramod Shinge, Carl Shalia, light at the end of the tunnel for senior surgeons in COVID pandemic, or is it time to retire? Dr. Shinde, the floor is yours. Friends, I thank the Society of Surgeons of Russia and AWRSC India for having given me this opportunity to share my thoughts in this wonderful conference on COVID-19. And my special thanks are due to Dr. Jignesh Gandhi for having selected this title light at the end of the tunnel for senior surgeons in COVID pandemic, or is it time to retire? Talking about this light at the end of tunnel for senior surgeons in COVID pandemic, or whether a senior surgeon should think of retiring, there are two aspects to this. The first aspect is seniority of a surgeon due to his age, and when does he really retire? Now, this topic has been discussed and debated for centuries and decades so far, but today it is now the in the context of COVID-19 pandemic, whether a senior surgeon because of his age, whether he should retire or whether he should continue his profession as a surgeon. Talking about seniority of a surgeon, his age and when he should retire, well, a surgeon never retires. I would not mind being operated on by a surgeon of 91 years of age. Now, this was said by none other than Dr. Mikhail Debeki, a famous cardiothoracic surgeon at the age of 91 in USA. Not only did he say it, but when he was 88 years old, he still performed an open heart surgery on the Russian president, the famous Boris Yeltsin. This paper on surgeon's age and operative mortality in the United States was showed that some complex procedures, surgeons older than 60 years, particularly those with low volumes, have a higher operative mortality rates than younger surgeons. But for most procedures, surgeon's age is not an important predictor of operative risk. At this paper, 
which studied the relationship between surgeon's age and postoperative outcomes. This was a very large cohort study where thousands of eligible patients were treated by more than 3,000 surgeons ranging from 27 to 81 years. Now, this study showed that increasing surgeon's age was associated with actually decreasing rates of postoperative deaths, readmissions, and complications in a linear fashion. Now, does that mean that age has no effect? When does a surgeon's age become a surgical risk factor? Well, 52% of clinicians reported that there was declining quality of care with increasing age of physicians' years in practice. Now, this paper looked at the cognitive function, retirement status, and age of a surgeon, where majority of practicing senior surgeons actually were found that they performed at or near the level of their younger surgeons on all cognitive tasks. Not only the practicing surgeons, but almost half of the retired surgeons also did as well as younger surgeons on all cognitive tasks. And this suggests that old age does not inevitably preclude cognitive proficiency. Now, coming to COVID-19, whether it is time for a senior surgeon to think of retiring or whether he should continue, why does COVID-19 raise this issue? Now, there are some obvious reasons and there are some not so obvious reasons. This paper, which talked about general surgeon's attitude towards COVID-19, this was a survey, national survey. This showed that 42% were already working in a COVID hospital and 75% of surgeons were afraid of contracting the disease. 42% were afraid of their own life while caring for COVID-19 patients. And 91% were afraid of transmitting the disease to the family members. The obvious reasons for this are risk of contracting COVID, risk to life, suffering if COVID is positive, loss of earnings, livelihood, disability that might come, fear of death, and fear of family's well-being. Talking about not so obvious reasons, there is the forced leave of absence. There is forced look at an area of life never experienced before, no work, empty days, no surgeries. There is a time with family which we might be forced to spend. And there is a time with self which we are forced to spend which we have never before spent because of our busy schedule. Forced leave of absence could have its own psychological issues like loss of control over one's life, low self-esteem, frustration, anger at the situation, loss of motivation and fear. Forced look at an area which we have never experienced before. How does no work and no surgeries feel? Does it feel like a relief or loss of confidence, loss of self-esteem, insecurity, loss of identity, loss of direction and the fear of unknown? Talking about time with family, whether it is a happy time versus a miserable time. Well, we don't know how to deal with our own family. We've never had the time to do so. Sometimes family doesn't want you into the house because you will keep on irritating all the younger members of the family. With a happy time with family, this could be rediscovering a never before experienced joy, a growth in relationship to a much greater depth a rejuvenating of not only of ourselves, but our entire family life. Coming to time with self, it will be a great time for introspection. There are so many regrets that we have of not being able to do so many things in our life. It's a great time to have a relook, have a redirection in our life, choose a new direction, think about which direction we are going. So many things we need to learn and relearn. We could use this time to relearn new aspects and techniques and skills. Rejuvenation could be life-saving at this time. We could repurpose our life. Look at what is the purpose of our life. Is it really the true purpose that we want to serve? There are so many things that we could renounce. COVID-19 has taught us that many things are not necessary for having a good, happy life. Restart but how do we decide? What is it that we want? What is it that will satisfy us? What is it that we really want to do? Well, decisions are based on many things. Human decisions of all human beings are governed by our identity, our values, our beliefs, our mindset, and our needs. 
talking about our identity this is our central driving driving force it's the innermost innermost concept and feeling about who we think we are it drives us to do what we do and it also stops us from doing anything that goes against our identity for most of us it is i am intelligent i am smart dumb clever unlovable for many it is i am a businessman i am a lawyer i am a doctor for the surgeon it is i am a surgeon what's the problem with our identity first of all we are not aware of what it is and when our profession becomes our identity when we lose our profession we become nothing i am a surgeon is a powerful identity a great one to have but we are much more of a person than just being a surgeon coming to our values values are what we live for work for or die for it's our inner guide it's our compass and we all know values of honesty friendship loyalty excellence contribution but we also have a hierarchy of values and order which is our topmost value which is our number one value which is our number two value and that governs our decisions are we aware of what is our hierarchy of values our beliefs are basically an idea premise interpretation that we feel absolutely certain about how do beliefs affect us beliefs shape everything our actions our feelings our life we all have beliefs about ourselves about people about life about the way the world functions all of us have some limiting and some empowering beliefs limiting beliefs like i am bad at something i am weak at something i am less capable people are bad world is harsh life is a struggle life is not easy especially in this covid pandemic and we also have empowering beliefs like i am good at surgery i am intelligent people are good people are honest this world is a friendly place life is great life has unlimited possibilities mindset was first proposed by carol dweck the great psychologist and this is defined as a fixed mental attitude or disposition that predetermines a person's response and interpretation of situations and people have two kinds of mindsets many of them will have a fixed mindset and many of them will have a growth mindset people with fixed mindset believe that they are born with a set of abilities and no more they have difficulty in changing and learning new skills they believe that they have fixed set of abilities and cannot grow beyond them they will not try new things they will avoid difficulties and get crushed with failures but basically they believe that they cannot grow beyond their fixed set of abilities people who have a growth mindset believe that most abilities can be developed through dedication and work and talent is just a starting point they believe that they are inherently capable of learning doing new things and new skills sky is the limit is the attitude they are not afraid of trying new things they can fail but can handle failure and they look for growth and development and they love challenges they basically believe that they are inherently capable of learning and doing new things and new skills well our mindset will determine our reaction to covid 19 and our decisions if we have a fixed mindset we will be unable to give up we will be unable to change and adapt if we have a growth mindset we will take this covid 19 as an opportunity to change to adapt and take a new direction the most important aspect of life is the balance in life the main areas of our life are is our personal life professional life family and social our surgeon's life looks something like this that we have a small person's life we have no time to look at we have our major time is taken up by our profession we have the family life and we have the social life but how do we want it to be wouldn't we want our family life to have a much bigger share of our attention our personal life to grow we we could have much more to contribute to the society and in our personal life we could discover our true identity we could discover our goals or maybe we are okay with this kind of a balance where our family will have a large maybe the largest share of our life our personal life we will be able to give all the time to grow develop think and become a better person maybe a different person contribute to society and maybe leave a legacy and our profession will be there as one of the major areas or maybe we could be okay with not just having a profession as a surgeon well friends during this covid 19 pandemic there is a light at the end of tunnel where we could retire 
do something else that we've always wanted, or we could decide to fight COVID, adapt, grow, and excel. Now, there is a light at the end of the tunnel for senior surgeons. We can always decide whether it's time to retire or continue and grow and excel and be a very, very enlightened, a powerful person, have a very satisfying life, and we can create this life of our dreams by tweaking, changing, transforming, deciding, and taking action on our beliefs, on our values, on our mindset, on our identity, and live the life we love like a carefree child on this field because all of us as surgeons have that child within us. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Pramond Shinde, on this mind-boggling subject. Our breakout session has come to an end, but stay online. We'll have a minute break, and we'll come back for the closing ceremony. Thank you so much. симпатичный. Friend, our webinar has come to an end. Would like uh, to thank our listeners and would like uh, to give the floor to Dr. Ramana, our chairman. Please, Dr. Ramana. And what a fantastic no, day no. of education and sharing. Friends, do you know that as a lover of Western classical music, some of my favorite conductors, composers, instrumentalists have some names you might recognize. Rachmaninoff, Sergei Prokofiev, Rimsky-Korsakov, Tchaikovsky, Matislav Rostropovich, and there must be some more that I can recall later. And it seems that this creativity, this talent probably runs in your blood. It's very unfair to the rest of us. But whatever it is, it is such a delight to have partnered with my Russian friends in the Russian Surgical Society. And I think this is a great way forward where we can share and engage with each other's communities more and benefit those who need exposure most, like our youngsters. Let's take this not as a destination, but as the start of a new journey. And let's go and conquer the rest of the world. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Ramana. We would like uh, to thank our sponsors. Without them, this uh, conference would have been impossible. That's uh, Gexa, 
the largest producer of medical devices, disposable medical devices, which is very important, especially medical supplies in this COVID-19 pandemic. Thanks for helping us organizing this uh, event. Also, F a medical company which uh, develops uh, and uh, produces uh, equipment for minimally invasive uh, surgery, irrigators, aspirators, uh, video cameras, uh, and it has existed for 16 years on the Russian market. Uh, FM Medica has achieved the high quality of the equipment. It has uh, representative offices in many cities of Russia, as well as uh, a partnership network. Thank you so much. Also, Ethicon, which is part of the Johnson and Johnson family of companies, more than 80 years of history and uh, surgeons uh, trust uh, improvement of surgeries in order to improve the quality of life and uh, also the life of patients. Convertec is one of the major companies uh, on the surgical market. It has been on the market for more than 40 years. It has 11 manufacturing sites and uh, more than 8,000 people on the staff. Uh, Convertec products are sold in more than 100 countries where they get uh, positive uh, responses by specialists and users. Our farm is one of the most innovative health uh, technological companies. So they produce uh, drugs, including drugs for treating cancer in the conditions of the pandemic. Carl Storz is uh, the leading and uh, scalp uh, producers uh, for veterinary medicine, for the industry, uh, well, uh, video systems. Carl Storz uh, uh, has uh, been associated for 70 years with high quality and traditions. Mary Vara is uh, the leader in uh, the health uh, technologies and the industrial design. The aim of the company is to improve uh, operative uh, uh, conditions. Uh, they started uh, with uh, hospital beds uh, way back a uh, hundred years ago. Right now, company the company has a lot of uh, projects for OR, support uh, in OR at different uh, stages, uh, including assembly of equipment and high-tech maintenance and repair of such equipment. And uh, MEDI, with the headquarters in Bayreuther, Germany, is one of the leading producers of uh, medical devices uh, which help uh, treat many diseases. We thank our Indian experts uh, for this uh, wonderful meeting, a lot of uh, wonderful presentations, a lot of exchange of opinion, exchange of uh, skills, uh, despite all opticals. And of course, it was impossible to do it without the St. Petersburg Union on do of Doctors. Thank you, colleagues, uh, for your uh, contribution. Demir Glamov, thank you very much. As well, we would like to thank our audience. We hope uh, that this conference is the first uh, step uh, to continue our cooperation of the abdominal wall. Our colleagues uh, invite uh, the Russian community to participate under the auspices of this organization. Thank you so much. Thank you.